Tune in to nostalgia. Tune in to now. Golden Radio Hour. And now, stay tuned for the program that has rated tops in popularity for a longer period of time than any other West Coast program in radio history. The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. Signal, the famous go-farther gasoline, invites you to sit back and enjoy another strange story by The Whistler. I am The Whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now for the Signal Oil Company, the Whistler's strange story. Just like a man. They presented a striking group, the three of them, chatting together in the airport waiting room. Sandra Haynes with her dark hair, her quiet, almost equally dark eyes. Her husband, Gordon Haynes, tall, handsomely groomed. And their friend of many years standing, Peter Lacey. Peter had known Sandra first, and his attention to everything she said revealed an admiration that had grown stronger with the years. Sandra was flying east alone fact which seemed to concern Peter more than it did Gordon, her husband. Flight 24, now boarding at gate 3. Flight 24, now boarding at gate 3. Well, that's your plane. But I still can't understand it, Sandra, why you insist on dashing off alone this way and without your husband. I didn't insist, Peter. Gordon was quite agreeable. The dutiful husband. You reason with her, Peter. See how far you get. Or perhaps, Sandra, you'd prefer the company of a new and exciting escort. I prefer exactly what I'm doing. And Peter scarcely fits the role of a new escort. <laughs> Neither new or exciting, huh? I didn't say that, Peter. <laughs> oh, and by the way, Gordon, you will remember I'm staying at the St. Regis. St. Regis, I'll remember. You see, Peter, she checks everything. The perfect wife. And I've always said oh, that. Now, but... no more arguments. I have my ticket. I'm going alone. Besides, Gordon wants to look after some plans for selling the beach house. He has his week well mapped out. Check. And I'd have little time for either of you in New York. Oh? I have a date with that strange man. Oh, Sandra. Pierre, the beauty king. I'm going to have him do something about my hair. Now, you let him touch it, and I'll personally wring his neck. Oh, hear that, Gordon. Seems not all gentlemen prefer blondes. Sandra, you know perfectly well that I like you just as you are. I know perfectly well that I'm changing from a brunette to a blonde. I'm having my hair bleached. Change is good for the soul. And for husbands. Gordon, I'm ashamed of you. It's her idea, not Passenger mine. Haynes, no, but the... report at gate three. Passenger Hayes, oh, report me. at gate Bye, Gordon. Three. Kiss me. Uh, take good care of my husband for me, Peter. Uh, I will. And you take care of yourself. And stay away from Pierre. Oh, I'll no. I'm certain your bags have been checked aboard, dear. What do you mean they're already Go on ahead, the plane? Peter. They... You check the bags. Check the bags. Oh, of course, and right away. And you can kiss me goodbye again, Gordon. Kiss me. And tell me you're going to miss me very much. Why, sure, Sandra. You, you know I am. I'm going to miss you very much. Just like a husband. Can't say it himself. Has to be reminded. After all, Sandra, the important thing... I know that you said it. Goodbye, dear. Goodbye, Sandra. Happy landings. You're a fortunate man, aren't you, Gordon? Sandra is very much in love with you, isn't she? The attractive and wealthy wife of Gordon Haynes. Yes, the marriage does have its compensations. But somehow they don't always seem quite enough, do they? No. And that's why in driving home with Peter, you suggest a nightcap. Excuse yourself for a moment and slip to the back of the cocktail lounge in the privacy of a telephone booth. Hello? 
Vicki, Gordon. Oh, darling, I've been waiting. It seemed ages. Yeah, for me, too. Look, I can't talk long now, but she's gone. Be out of town for about a week. We'll, uh, we'll be able to get together. Will you call me tomorrow? First thing? No need. We'll make it the usual place uh, around 2 o'clock, all right? Oh, I wish it could be sooner. 2 o'clock, Vicki. I'll see you then. I'll be waiting. Bye. Goodbye, darling. Sorry, Peter. You order for it? Mm-hmm. Double scotch and soda. Thought you might need it when I tell you what's on my mind. Well, you look awfully serious, Pete. I am serious. About Sandra. Oh, not as you might think. I'm just the same old friend. But at least my loyalty hasn't shifted. What are you driving at? How about you, Gordon? Better check your directions, don't you think? I mean, when you're heading for trouble. And Vicki Lydon. Vicki... What do you know about her? Only everything. I know something else, Gordon. You better stay away from her. Now, wait a you minute. You wait a minute and listen. I know you married Sandra for her money. Oh, I don't see where that... It interests me because I don't happen to need her money. You do. So? I also happen to be in love with her. I always have, though I'm sure she doesn't realize it. You don't love her. You're jumping at conclusions. Maybe. But whether you married her for just her money or not, I think enough of her to see that you give her her money's worth or step out of the picture. That all? I mean it, Gordon. Stop seeing Vicky or get out of Sandra's life. From now on, I'm making this my business. During rehearsal this evening, I couldn't help thinking about an old schoolmate of mine. Tom was sort of a sluggish guy, never much pep or ambition, until he started going around with Mary. And then, what a change. Mary seemed to bring out the best in him. Soon, Tom was going around with new spring in his stride, new sparkle in his glance. Incidentally, Tom and Mary have been married for years now, and you've never seen a happier couple. <laughs> You're undoubtedly wondering what made me bring that up on Signal's program. Well, simply this. A wonderful change like that usually comes over the average car after it starts going around with Signal Ethel, the premium quality gasoline engineered to bring out the best in any car. Motors that used to... Wah, 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 before starting, get going like a covey of scared quail with Signal Ethel. Cars that used to be sluggish as molasses display peppy pickup and power with Signal Ethel. And cars that used to ping and balk on hills take them like the man on the flying trapeze with Signal Ethel. But doesn't that sound like the kind of performance you'd enjoy? Then why not go around with Signal Ethel, at least for a few tankfuls? See if the way this super fuel brings out the best in your car doesn't make you want to stay married to Signal Ethel for always. It came as a surprise, didn't it, Gordon? In a few quiet, direct words from Peter Lacey. He knows about Vicki Lydon and is certain to tell your wife, Sandra, everything unless you fall into line. And that's why you're nervous, on edge the next afternoon. Because you have to keep your rendezvous with Vicki and try to explain. You're thankful that you've made a habit of meeting her in an out-of-the-way place. A roadside inn some miles from Malibu Beach in the summer home that you and Sandra recently purchased. But with the knowledge of Peter's watchdog tactics, you're not at all relaxed talking to Vicky. I tell you, Vicky, we can't see one another anymore. It's all off. I, I shouldn't even be here now. Only to tell me to get lost, is that it? You know it isn't that. Look, Vicky, after a while... After a while, or a month, or a year, it'll be the same. Hiding secret meetings. Wondering if every other person we see is watching us. But what can I do about it? You could go to Sandra and tell her about us. Oh, Sure. All right, I know. You're not the guardian of the money bags. That's a crude way of putting it. Why bother putting it any other way? It's true. All right, Gordon. What, what are you going to do? Me? I don't know. I suppose I could run out and jump off a bridge. Instead, I'll just do the usual. I'll wait. You're okay, Vicky. <laughs> you think so? 
Well, I don't. I think I'm all wrong. I think I might be lucky enough to get you out of my system someday. I think you're the heel that you are. But I... I don't think that yet. So I'll wait. Oh, I'll call you, Vicky. Soon. Sure. Right now I'd better get back to town. Can't tell who might walk in here. Yes, I know. Goodbye, Gordon. Wait a minute. What is it? That car outside, just pulling away. Lacey. It's Lacey's car. He, he saw us together. Well, so what? Isn't he the one who knows all about it? You don't understand. He won't wait now. Wait? He'll tell Sandra. He'll, he'll tell her everything. Oh, oh, maybe not. Now, calm down, Gordon. And drive slow on your way back to town. Uh, yeah. Yeah, thanks, Vicki. I'll, I'll take care of myself. Don't worry. <laughs> Driving back to town, you watch the mirror constantly and scan the side roads. No sign of Peter Lacey, is there, Gordon? And yet as the miles hum past, you begin to sense the only answer to the situation. Whether Peter saw you or not, he's a threat, and he will eventually tell Sandra about Vicky. And when he does, Sandra will divorce, divorce you, and you will be penniless unless you stop him. And somehow the car you're driving provides the answer to that, doesn't it? Yes, it's simple, isn't it? You can see it happening very clearly. Peter, a restaurateur, always arrives home late and alone. He always walks from his restaurant to his apartment. All you have to do is wait, your car motor idling, roar forward at the proper time. It'll be over fast, and his threat will be ended forever. You decide to do it soon, tonight. You're glad that it's over, aren't you, Gordon? You tell yourself that Peter probably doesn't know what hit him. And you almost wish he could have gotten a look at your face at the wheel of the car. But there's only time to hurry home now, and one more thing before you put the car away. Yes, you run one fender against the corner of the garage as you swing. The paint from the garage marks the dented area badly, doesn't it? No question how the car was damaged, just in case. Entering the apartment... You're certain that you're completely in the clear. And then... Hello? Hello, Gordon. Peter Lacey. Uh, Peter? I'm calling from the restaurant. Had to stay quite late. Why, yes, it's past two. Gordon, my boy, I'm not going to play ball with you any longer. You see, I went for a drive today down near Malibu. I see. I warned you, old man. You're going to tell Sandra, is that what you're trying to say? That's it, Gordon. She'll be back Friday, won't she? Yes. I thought I'd give you plenty of warning. A real pal, aren't you? You're certainly not thinking of Sandra's feelings in I think I am. Anyway, that's it. Do what you like. Oh, uh, in case you do decide that you can't face her, well, uh, I'll be at the airport to meet her. You don't have to bother. The sound of his voice on the telephone hit you like an electric shock, didn't it, Gordon? And then the realization swept over you. You'd killed the wrong man. Yes, Peter Lacey is still very much alive. And now you're certain he'll tell Sandra the truth about you and Vicky. That will end everything, won't it? Sandra will divorce you. And you can't bear the thought of being penniless again. No, somehow you've got to prevent that divorce. Find a way to hold on to Sandra's wealth. It's on your mind all that evening and the next day. And by nightfall, you've decided what you must do. Yes? May I speak with Mrs. Haynes, please? Oh, I'm sorry, Mrs. Haynes is away. Uh, this is Mr. Haynes. Help you? Oh, yes. This is Ralph Jameson. I have a real estate office in Santa Monica. Uh, your wife spoke to me a couple of weeks ago about the beach house in Malibu. Oh, yes, yes, I remember. She said if I found a buyer and the price was right, you might sell. That's right. Well, I do have a buyer, a man and his wife in the east. I'd like to show them the place if you don't mind. I see. 
Uh, if you're going to be home for a while, I could drive over and pick up the key. No, I was just going out, Mr. Jameson. Uh, but tell you what, uh, I had planned on going down to the cottage next day or so. Suppose I give you a call when I get there. You can bring the people over. Well, that'll be fine, Mr. Haynes. Fine. Thank you. <laughs> The Beach House, Gordon. You hadn't thought of it before. A perfect place, lonely, quiet. Just the thing for what you have in mind. As you think about it, a plan begins to take shape. Step by step, you know exactly what you're going to do. And with Sandra's death, her estate will go to you, won't it, Gordon? You'll never have to worry about money or Peter again. And you'll have Vicky, too. An hour later, you arrive at the Malibu Beach House. Let yourself in. You stand for a moment in the outer hall. Look into the living room, bathed in moonlight. The furniture covered with white sheets, just as you left it when you closed the house. It's a weird, ghostly sight, isn't it, Gordon? Then, as you snap on the hall light... Hello, Gordon. Uh, Sandra. I thought I heard a car pull up outside. Uh, what are you doing here? I wanted to do some thinking, Gordon. Alone, before talking to you. But, Sandra, I wasn't expecting you. How did you get here? Peter met me at the airport. Peter? You let Peter know you were coming back early? Why? You may as well know, Gordon. Peter called me in New York. Told me some things that made me want to cut my trip a little short. He called you? Why? The... He's a good friend, Gordon. He met me at the airport a few hours ago. Told me all about you and Vicki Lydon. Oh, now look, Sandra. Don't deny it, Gordon. I knew, without Peter ever saying a word, I knew I'd lost you to someone. All he supplied was the lady's name. Sandra, you haven't lost me. It's ridiculous. I'm the one who's ridiculous, Gordon. I took this trip because I thought it might help us. Well, Absence, you know. I even got a full new beauty treatment for you. Had my hair bleached blonde, thinking maybe a new Sandra might interest you. Or did you notice? Well, uh, of course I noticed. You You look very nice as a blonde. Thank you. Sandra, has it occurred to you Peter might be lying? He's been in love with you for years, you know. Has he? Well, of course. He'd do anything to break us up so he could marry you. Or, or maybe this is repetitious to you. Maybe Peter told you this himself when he drove you down here. He didn't drive me out here. I borrowed his car, drove out myself, alone. You have his car? That's right. You know, Gordon, what you've said about Peter's love for me interests me. I've always been very fond of him. And perhaps I shall marry him. After our divorce. <laughs> You watch Sandra as she turns away, hurries back up the stairs. And then a moment later, you hear the bedroom door close. Her sudden appearance at the beach house has startled you. And for a moment, her driving out in Peter's car poses a problem. But you quickly see a way to turn that problem to your advantage. Slowly, you move to the hall table, pick up the small antique clock with the marble base, and start slowly up the stairs after her. Sandra is seated at the vanity table, brushing her newly bleached hair. For a moment, your eyes meet in the mirror, then she looks away. Holding the heavy base clock behind your back, you move up behind her. I don't care to discuss this any further, Gordon. I'm turning the matter over to my attorney in the morning. I don't think so, Sandra. What's that? Gordon! I don't think you're going to do anything. Sandra! <laughs> You step back as she slumps over the vanity table. Then slowly she crumbles to the floor, her arms sweeping the tabletop clean. You stare at the lifeless body at your feet, the overturned powder box, the hairpins lying beside her on the floor. You hadn't expected it to happen this quickly, had you, Gordon? But Sandra's early return from the east speeded up your timetable. Now you're thinking clearly again. You'll put Sandra's body in Peter's car drive it down the beach highway, and push it over the cliff. An accident, Gordon, in Peter's car, and you'll be in the clear. 
As you hurry from the house and start toward the garage, you're suddenly aware of footsteps close by. Hello. Hello, that you, Mr. Haynes? Yes. Uh, good evening, Mr. Morton. Oh, I just after a walk, saw the light, but I investigate. Uh, hello there, fella. How are you? Are folks going to move back in, Mr. Haynes? No, no, I just came down to open up the house for a real estate agent. We're thinking of selling. Oh. Um, how's Mrs. Hayes? Fine, just fine. She's in the east. Or rather, I should say, on her way back now, been visiting relatives. Oh, here, here now, that's enough of that. Stop it, Ranger, you hear? Confound it, what's gotten into that dog? Now stop it, Ranger, here. Here, come here, boy, come here. Uh, that's a boy, that's a boy. Come on. Come on, we better be getting back home. Mother will be wondering what's happened to us. Well, good night, Mr. Haynes. Good night. Oh, nice to have seen you again. Yeah. Come on, come on, Ranger, come on. You watch Morton and his dog disappear into the darkness. Wonder whether the howls of his dog made him suspicious that something was wrong whether he saw Sandra when she arrived. Mr. Morton could ruin everything, couldn't he, Gordon? But after a few minutes, you decide you've nothing to fear, that Mr. Morton was quite sincere in his friendly questions. You've no choice anyway. You must carry out your plan for disposing of Sandra's body and making her death seem accidental. Quickly, you enter the house, stop at the hall closet, pick up the vacuum cleaner and some dust rags. You've got to go over the bedroom very carefully, Gordon, inch by inch, Make certain you don't leave any sign that would indicate Sandra was here at the beach house tonight. A half hour later, the bedroom is as neat as a pin. You carry Sandra's body to the garage, place it in Peter's car, then back out and drive down the highway. A few miles from the house, you turn off the road, drive to the edge of the cliff overlooking the sea, ease Sandra behind the wheel. And then, leaving the keys in, the switch on, the car in gear. You get out and release the brake. Standing at the edge of the road, you look down. Watch Peter's car sink slowly in the shallow water at the base of the cliff. Then you return to the beach and try to sleep. You Gordon Haynes? Uh, yes. What is it, officer? Name's Slade, sheriff's office. May I come in? Oh, of course. What? What's wrong? Better have some bad news, Mr. Haynes. It's about your wife. My wife? What? What's happened? There was an accident last night. The car she was driving went off the cliff a few miles down the oh, road. No, no. She's dead, Mr. Haynes. Killed instantly. Sandra? Dead? Yes. When did you see her last, Mr. Haynes? I, I, about a week ago at the airport. She went east for a visit. You mean she wasn't here last night? Oh, no, I didn't even know she was in town. I, I wasn't expecting her plane until this evening. I see. Tell me, Mr. Haynes, how well do you know a man named Peter Lacey? He, oh, fairly well. He, he's really a friend of Sandra's. Known her for years. Why do you ask? She was driving his car when the accident happened. Peter's car? I, I don't know. According to his story, he picked her up at the airport around 7 o'clock last night. They had a drink, and then she asked to borrow his car. Said she wanted to drive down here to the beach house. Well, uh, I wonder why. Lacey didn't seem to know. Well, that's strange. She had no way of knowing I'd be here. You hadn't told anyone? Well, no, I didn't decide to come down here until late last night after I got a phone call from the real estate agent in Santa Monica. Mm -hmm. He wanted to show the house to a client. I see. Mr. Haynes, how long does it generally take to drive out here from town? Oh, uh, an hour, I'd say. Lacey says your wife left him a few minutes before 8. She said she was driving directly out here to the beach house. That means she should have arrived around nine or so. That's right. Yet you say she didn't arrive at all. And the accident occurred sometime after ten. Well, she could have stopped for a bite to eat somewhere along the way, I suppose. See here, what, what, are, you, what are you driving at? Your wife's death, Mr. Haynes. We're calling it accidental for now. I don't understand. I mean the car might have been deliberately pushed off the cliff. Pushed? You, you mean... You said this Peter Lacey was a friend of your wife's. How uh, good a friend... Well, as I told you, they'd known each other for years. 
Matter of fact, at one time, she was thinking of marrying Peter, and, and I came along, and... Well... I see. Oh, good Lord, you... You're not suggesting that Peter had anything I'm to do with... I'm not suggesting anything, Mr. Haynes. But I certainly want to have another talk with Mr. Lacey. A nice, long talk. The cheapest battery you can buy is the battery that costs the least per day. And when it comes to low cost per day, none can beat Signal Deluxe, the extra long life battery, guaranteed for a full 30 months on a service basis. Here's the reason Signal can guarantee these batteries for just such an extraordinarily long time. Microporous all rubber separators, considered the greatest battery improvement in 20 years, hold twice as much acid solution between the plates. As a result, Signal Deluxe batteries deliver up to 35% more power to take care of the many electrical gadgets on today's cars. Also, their new design all-rubber case means that your battery needs water less often. What more could a battery buyer ask? Unless it's a trade-in for your old battery, which Signal dealers give. Or liberal credit terms, which are available. So any way you look at it, if you need a new battery, it'll pay you to play safe. Buy the long, long life battery that guarantees you low, low cost per day. The Signal Deluxe Battery. It's turned out better than you expected, hasn't it, Gordon? Now that the police have turned their attention to Peter Lacey and suspect him of the murder of your wife, Sandra. Even if the police learn about Vicki Lydon, as they will after they talk with Peter, you can deny his accusations. It's your word against his now. And you're sure his accusations will sound like a desperate attempt to cover his own guilt. You return to your apartment, wait in town for some further word. Then finally that evening, you have another visit from Slade of the sheriff's office. Tell me, Slade, have you had your talk with Peter Lacey? Yes. Persistent fellow, that Lacey. He's been saying all along that your wife did show up at the beach house last night. And I tell you she didn't. Surely you can take my word for it. We'll let the test decide, Mr. Haynes. Test? Mm Mm-hmm. We found some interesting things at the beach house, including a picture of your wife. What's that got to do with it? Mr. Lacey says it's quite a recent picture of her. Shows her as a brunette. Well? Mr. Lacey says your wife had her hair bleached blonde before she came back from New York yesterday. Well, I still don't see what that proves. It proves that your wife was at the beach house last night, Mr. Haynes. You see, we found a few strands of hair, bleached blonde hair, and several hairpins. You know, you did a pretty good job of cleaning up that beach house. But you forgot one little thing. Forgot? Uh Uh-huh. You forgot the vacuum cleaner. That's where we found the bleached blonde hair and hairpins. Yeah, just like a man. When you got through using it, you didn't think to empty the dust bag. Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at this same time. This month throughout America, churchmen of all faiths are calling special attention to the part religion plays in building and preserving our American way of life. Religion is one of the freedoms our forefathers fought for, one which today more than ever needs not only our protection, but our active support. Featured in tonight's story were Bill Foreman, George Neese, Virginia Gregg, and John Daner. The Whistler was produced and directed by George W. Allen, with story by Joel Malone, music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. The Whistler is entirely fictional, and all characters portrayed on The Whistler are also fictional. Any similarity of names or resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Remember, at the same time next Sunday... Another Strange Tale by The Whistler. Marvin Miller speaking for the Signal Oil Company. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
And now, stay tuned for the mystery program that is unique among all mystery programs. Because even when you know who is guilty, you always receive a startling surprise at the final curtain. In the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. Signal, the famous go-farther gasoline, invites you to sit back and enjoy another strange story by The Whistler. I am The Whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadow. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now for the Signal Oil Company, the Whistler's strange story, Two Smart People. The story of the two people sitting quietly together over their cocktails in a hotel suite in San Francisco began weeks before on a speeding transcontinental train. The two people were not sitting together. Corinne Sloan, as a matter of fact, was paying very little attention to the uh, man sitting across the car. On the other hand, she was paying a great deal of attention to the things being said to her by one Mr. Kuvar a stoutish gentleman who seemed anxious to impress his beauteous listener. Importing is a highly fascinating business, Miss Sloan. It takes years to know your way around in it. Exporting and importing. Why, the very words conjure excitement, Mr. Kuvar. And you must make a great deal of money. (laughs) Uh, Let me order you another drink, Miss Sloan. Oh, no, no, I still haven't finished this one. Been talking so much here, I've scarcely touched mine. Oh, well, it's also very interesting... Uh, this is a business trip, too? <laughs> yes. Uh, I would say that this, uh, this little scrap of paper, this bill of lading, my dear, is an open sesame, too. Quite a sum. Bill of lading? I don't even know what one is. Oh, I'm sorry. Too much talk about business, anyway. Uh, just a paper covering an import shipment, that's all. Uh, and that's why you're going where? To San Francisco, yes. Oh. Interesting place. Always enjoy visiting it. I remember a time when I arrived there on the trip. You continue to look at him, don't you, Corinne? But you stop listening. Because Mr. Kuvar has said the magic words you've been waiting for since nearly a week ago when you chanced to overhear him in a mysteriously furtive telephone conversation from a Chicago hotel room adjoining your own. Those words come back to you now exactly as they did through the open windows of the hotel room. At that time, while he didn't realize it, Mr. Kuvar was standing only the width of a wall away from you and saying, My uh, shipment is due to arrive in San Francisco Saturday. Huh? Yes, I understand. How will I make delivery? Huh? Uh, the Mid-City Hotel. What uh, name? Uh, you be registered there? Good. I'll have what you want. Uh... And the payment to me, it will be in cash, 50000 and I'll never be mentioned in connection with the transaction. Good. I'm leaving Friday to pick up the goods. I understand. Goodbye. That short conversation you overheard is what brought you on this train, isn't it, Corinne? caused your accidental meeting and conversations with Mr. Kuvar. And now you're well prepared for your next move. A tiny white tablet hidden in your glove. You glance around the car. There's only you, Kuvar, and the man sitting across the way. Your gloved hand darts out swiftly, passing over Kuvar's unfinished cocktail. And then you sit back, wait, and appear interested in his rambling story. The captain himself said he'd never brought his ship through a worse fog. When suddenly we passed through the Golden Gate, and the fog parted, and there in all its splendor was this beautiful city in the hills. 
Magnificent, my dear. I'll never forget it. Never. Now, you tell it so graphically. I can almost see it in your words. Um, Mr. Cooper, you still haven't finished your drink. Huh? Oh, true, I haven't. That's what you need after all that storytelling. Uh, no, I think I've had enough. If you'll excuse me, Miss Sloan, I'm going back and rest a bit before dinner. Oh, but you can't do that. What? Huh? Oh, how dreadful of me after you've entertained me so... Perhaps I'll see you at dinner, Mr. Kuba. Oh, indeed you will. <laughs> My pleasure. And now you will excuse me until, say, uh, seven o'clock. Of course. He walks away without touching his drink. A moment later, the man across from you gets up and leaves the car, too. Sitting there alone, you wonder what your next step will be. Decide that you'll wait until after seven. Search Kuvar's compartment while he's waiting for you in the dining car. The time passes slowly. Then at a quarter past, you try the door, look inside. <gasps> Mr. Kuvar! <laughs> Mr. Kuvar, what's happened? Did you fall? What? You stop, almost ready to step out, call the conductor. When you think of something else, quickly you search the unconscious man for the precious bill of lading. You look in his wallet. Briefcase, search the room and his luggage. But it isn't anywhere to be found. Is it, Corinne? Someone else. Someone else got it. Oh, oh, oh. I better get out of here. Back in the club car, you sit down, dazed, wondering. Excuse me. Then realize that someone is speaking. The man who was sitting across from you and Kuvar earlier. Excuse me, but uh, are you all right, Miss Sloan? Oh, uh, well, certainly. Well, you didn't seem to hear me when I spoke. Well, it, it's nothing. Uh, so you know my name. Oh, I heard the gentleman you were talking with a little while ago call you Miss Sloan. Mm. Uh, did you by any chance lose something? Lose something? Like what? Like uh, this glove. I saw it near the chair when you were sitting with the stout gentleman. Oh, yes, it is mine. Thank you. Oh, not at all, Miss Sloan. Hey, the train's slowing down. I, I didn't think we stopped here. Where are we? I'm sure I don't know. Oh, Porter. Yes, sir? Uh, why are we stopping? They're getting an ambulance, sir. A gentleman in car 79, didn't you? Is it anything serious? Oh, no, ma'am, but we'd never stop here ordinarily. They're going to take him to the nearest hospital. Oh, I see. Oh, the poor chap. Mm. I think I'll go ask the conductor if there's anything I can do, even though I just met him. He's... Met who, Miss Sloan? I don't believe I heard the injured man's name mentioned. Oh, sorry, I'm confused. Excuse me. Certainly. No, I'm going to offer to help, too. It was a terrible slip of the tongue, wasn't it, Corinne? Indicating to the strange young man that you knew who was injured before anyone had even mentioned his name. Oddly, he didn't seem too surprised, but you feel that he believed your quick explanation, that you were confused. You hurry from the lounge car, and then, a moment or two later, you see him again in the small crowd that gathers near the steps as Mr. Kuvar's unconscious form is carried off the train. Is be all right? Yes, yes, yes. Just give us room here, folks. Please, give us room. Let the doctor through. Now, lady, uh, lady. Mother? Would you finish what you were just telling me? I, I don't know if it would be of much help, Conductor, but it does seem as if this might be more than an accident. Well, this, this chap you saw entering Mr. Kuvar's compartment, what part of the train did he come from? The, the forward car from the direction of the club car. Uh -huh. You mean he could have stepped in there, such a gentleman? You look up, Corinne, just in time to catch the expression on the face of the man who sat across from you. Handed your glove back just a little while ago. You see him flinch slightly, and suddenly you're certain about him. So certain that you detach yourself from the crowd on the station platform. And board the train unnoticed. Porter. Yes, ma'am. Uh, that gentleman I was talking to a moment ago, he's in my car, isn't he? Uh, no, ma'am. Uh, he's in car 52, bedroom C. Oh. But, ma'am, I, I think he's out there on the platform with the others. I know, but I have a surprise for him. We're old friends, you see. Oh, yes, ma'am. You hurry through the cars to 52, room C, praying that he won't wander about you and follow. Inside the room, you search swiftly, methodically. 
Find what you're looking for in the simplest of places, his briefcase. Quickly, you'll go back to your own room, call the porter for your luggage, and walk forward to explain to the conductor. Oh, you're getting off here, miss? Yes, I didn't realize who it was that was injured. Mr. Kuba is a friend of yours? Well, we have mutual friends and interests. I'm going to stay here overnight, notify his friends, and visit him at the hospital in the morning. Would you fix up my ticket? Hey, the agent in the station moved you into another train. Well, 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 what's this? You leaving us? Well, the lady is a friend of the injured gentleman. Oh, really? Well, now, I think you're doing a very nice thing. Well, thank you. I'm glad you approve. Oh, I do, really. Such genuine interest on such a short acquaintance. <laughs> Mr. Kuba must have something. <laughs> well, sir, thank you for returning my lost property, Mr. Uh, Burton, uh, Larry Burton. You mean your glove? Yes, my glove. Your baggage is off, ma'am. Oh, thank you, Porter. Well, goodbye, Miss Snow. Goodbye, Mr. Burton. I hope you have a very enjoyable trip. And again, thanks for everything. <laughs> The high-compression motors of many of today's newer cars are designed and built to perform best on a premium quality gasoline, such as Signal Ethel. But if you're driving an older model, maybe you think you wouldn't notice any difference in Signal Ethel. Well, you'd change your mind if you just see some of the vintage models that fill up at the Signal Ethel pump and hear the enthusiasm of their drivers. For instance, a chap who lives up in a hilly section was telling me you should hear some cars clatter and struggle when they try to pull my hill. But with Signal Ethel, my 41 model walks right up in high. Another driver of a 39 model remarked, On cool mornings, I hear some of my friends complaining about hard starting. But with Signal Ethel, my car starts quick as a rabbit. Yes, folks say mighty nice things about Signal Ethel because this premium grade of Signal's famous go-farther gasoline is a real super fuel scientifically engineered to bring out the best in any car of any age. For proof, just treat your car to a tank full of Signal Ethel. Then see if you don't feel a difference, a wonderful difference, in Signal Ethel. It was almost amusing, wasn't it, Corinne? The swift exchange on the train with Kuvar and Larry Burton. First, Kuvar's failure to drink the cocktail into which you had dropped the sedative. Then Larry's bold attack, which may even yet prove fatal to Kuvar. Larry must have been very confident that you didn't suspect him to let you out of his sight without checking the contents of his briefcase. He'll be confused and angry when he discovers that the precious little slip of paper which seems to be worth so much, is missing. It's safe in your purse, isn't it, Corinne, as you board the next airplane west? At San Francisco, you check into a hotel, hurry to the steamer docks and the freight offices of the American-Italian Steamship Company. This shipment will arrive on the SS Allegretti, miss. Dock tomorrow, 4 p.m. Tomorrow, 4 o'clock. Uh, do you know what the delivery charges will be? I mean, from the dock to my hotel. Uh, you're staying in the city? At the Bayview, yes. Mm, let's see. Charge will be much. Uh... Well, I wanted to pay now and have the shipment sent there. All right, ma'am. I'll freak it for you. No trouble at all. <laughs> You take a taxi back to the center of town, spend a couple of hours window shopping, stroll through some of the stores, then return to your hotel suite, confident, pleased with the way things have turned out. But the moment you step inside your bedroom, you know something is wrong, don't you, Corinne? Your suitcase on the floor, open, your things scattered about. As you reach out for the phone on the bedside table, the closet door suddenly swings open. Hello. Well, uh, you... Larry Burton is the name, sweetheart. Remember? How did you... I got off the train to stop after you did. Hop the plane, and here I am. But how did you know where... Well, where's... finding you was easy. Just a couple of phone calls. You shouldn't have registered under your own name. And now you better give me what I came for. What are you talking about? That little item you took from my briefcase on the train. I want it. Oh, I don't know what you mean. Sure you do, honey. Sure you do. Now, look, why don't you be a good girl and hand it over? I told you to leave here. This is my room. Now, look, sweetheart, I don't want any trouble. Well, you'll have more than you can handle if you don't leave. The bellboy's on his way up. I asked him to bring me a paper. Oh, sure, sure. 
Will you leave? After you've given me that bill of lading, yeah. And if I don't? You better play it smart or... Now, will you leave, Mr. Burton? Just a moment, please. Well? Okay. Like I said, I don't want any trouble. But I'll be around, sweetheart. I think I'll just get myself a room right here in your hotel so I can be real close to you. <laughs> See you later. It was a shock, wasn't it, Corinne? Finding Larry Burton in your hotel suite. When all the time you thought he was still on the train. Long after he's gone, you pace the floor, wondering what you must do. How you can outsmart him. Finally, you pick up the phone, call the steamship company, and ask them to have the shipment delivered to another hotel, the Carson House. Late that afternoon, you leave your rooms, and as you step out onto the street... Hello again. Why don't you leave me alone? You mind if I walk with you? I do mind, yes. Well, I don't seem to be doing so well. Where are we heading? The Carson House? What? Oh, I'm sorry. But I just couldn't help overhearing your telephone conversation this afternoon. In fact, I'd been right outside for an hour hoping I would hear it. Open transom, you know. Uh, should watch those things. Thanks for the advice. You're welcome. And I've got lots more advice for you, sweetheart. I'm not interested. Now, look. I've got a proposition for you. Yes? Mm-hmm. You know, Corinne, we'd make a great team, the two of us. Really? Mm-hmm. I knew it from the time I saw you on the train. When you dropped that tablet in Kubar's cocktail. There I said to myself, there was a girl after my own heart. Do go on, Mr. Burton. You know, you could be accused of attempted murder. What I put in Mr. Kubar's drink was not poison, merely a sleeping tablet. But speaking of murder, have you read the afternoon paper? Mm, afraid not. Mr. Kubar is dead. Well, that's too bad, isn't it? I could tell the police what I know. But you won't. What makes you think so? Oh, look, Corinne, you're fumbling around in the dark. You don't know what you're mixed up in. This uh, shipment of Mr. Kuvar's, it's very unusual. And worth a lot of money. True, true, but when you get the stuff, where do you deliver it? Who makes the payoff? How? I'll find out. No, no, never, never. You couldn't, unless you followed Mr. Kuvar around for weeks the way I did. You're suggesting then... That we work together on this. Well? I, I'll have to think it over. Well, all right. And while you're doing that, why don't we have dinner together? All right, Mr. Burton. Why don't we? It's the smart thing to do, isn't it, Corinne? Yes, to play along with Larry Burton. Get the information you need and then arrange to get him out of the way and collect the payoff money alone. Dinner with Larry at one of the big hotels is a most enjoyable affair, isn't it? He's properly amusing, very attentive, and finally, you have to admit to yourself, quite handsome. And then later, as the two of you are dancing... Having fun, Corinne? <laughs> of course I am. Dinner was superb. The music's just the way I like it. And you're an awfully good dancer. Ooh. <laughs> uh, thanks. You've been rather quiet all evening. I was just wondering if... I'm uh... sorry. Just that I have something on my mind. Remember? You reached a decision yet? Yes. Well? All right, Larry. We're a team. You sure? Of course. You wouldn't be figuring on uh, a double cost? No, Larry. The way I feel, I couldn't double-cross you. Oh, that's what I've been waiting to hear, sweetheart. Come here. Larry, please, not here on the dance floor. Oh, who cares, honey, who cares? All right. Who cares? The soft light. The music. Larry holding you close in his arms and then kissing you, Corinne. For a moment, you almost forgot all the plans you'd made, didn't you? Yes, but only for a moment. 
When you return to your hotel, you drop into Larry's room for a nightcap. Now, just make yourself comfortable, sweetheart. Mm -hmm, Thanks. Now, what'll it be? Scotch or bourbon? Scotch, darling. All right, check. One thing. Huh? Who are we dealing with, anyway? You mean on the payoff? That's all right. As your partner, shouldn't I know? Well, I guess you should, sweetheart. (laughs) Okay, it's a fellow named Arlington. J. Arlington. Staying at the Mid-City Hotel, isn't he? (laughs) Yeah. Right again. Well, here's your drink. To Mr. J. Arlington. Salute. You have all the parts now, haven't you, Corinne? All the parts to the jigsaw puzzle for the highest stakes you've ever dreamed of. An hour or so later, that same night, back in your own suite, you put through a call to Mr. J. Arlington. Hello? Mr. Arlington? Yes? This is Corinne Sloan, a friend of Kuvar's. He's dead. And so I read in the papers. Shame. I was very fond of him. That's so? We work together. I see. What's on your mind? He was supposed to call you about the uh, shipment. That's right. So I'm calling you instead. Got the stuff? I will have tomorrow afternoon. All right. Have it delivered to me here at the hotel. You'll have the money? Yes. Good. See you tomorrow, Mr. Arlington. It's done, isn't it, Corinne? You've established contact with a man who is going to pay you $50,000. You should be pleased, shouldn't you? But something's troubling you. It's Larry, isn't it? The following afternoon, the shipment is delivered to your hotel suite. Heavy wooden box. You're puzzled. Wonder what it is. Whether to call a bellboy to help you open it. Then, as you're fixing a drink, Larry arrives unexpectedly, and the two of you open the box and examine the contents. Rugs. There's some Italian rugs. Larry, who'd want to pay 50000 for these? I told you this was a very unusual shipment. Hmm. What's this all about? Here. Now, here. Take a look at this rug. This label here is sewed in the corner. Oh, what about it? It just gives the rug size, value, pattern number, materials used, date of manufacture. Well, just things like that. Yeah, that's what you think. I don't get you. It's a code, sweetheart. What? Those value figures, pattern numbers and dates are code words. But what? Who? You remember that $250,000 Pemberthy payroll robbery last year? Oh, oh, yes. The money was never recovered, was it? No, no. But the words and numbers on this label tell somebody where to find that quarter of a million dollars. Arlington? Right. Quarter of a million. Too bad we can't decipher this. Well, I'll settle for the 50 grand. Oh, so will I. Uh, Do you know who sent these rugs and this code? You've heard of a gent named Despagos, haven't you? Chris Despagos, the racketeer? He was deported, wasn't he? Yeah, sure. But now he wants some of that dough. Oh, I see, but why, why didn't Uncle he... Uncle just... Sam watches people who get mail from certain countries, oh. especially cables and code. So he sends his instructions this way. <laughs> Rather neat, I'd say. <laughs> neat and worth 50 grand. And that's where we come in, isn't it? Yeah, that's right, sweetheart. 50, 50. Fifty-fifty. That calls for a toast, darling. Sure, Corinne. I was going to make the same suggestion. We'll drink a toast to the future, Larry. To us. If you've ever tried to drive your car with even one spark plug missing, you know what a big difference some little things can make. That's why the quality accessories which signal dealers carry can be mighty important to your car's performance. 
For instance, if it has been 10,000 miles since your spark plugs were replaced, a new set installed by your signal dealer will not only increase pep and power, but save up to 10% on gasoline, too. Another item which should be checked periodically is your oil filter. If the filter cartridge is dangerously clogged, your signal dealer can install a new one. Likewise, if your windshield wiper is leaving blinding streaks across your vision, your signal dealer can install a new blade while you wait. And other quality accessories he carries include guaranteed signal batteries, fan belts, radiator hose, light bulbs, polishes, and nationally advertised Lee tires. So remember, in addition to being headquarters for the famous Go Farther gasoline, signal dealers carry most everything you need in the way of accessories to make your car run better, look better, and last longer. The story of the two people sitting together quietly over cocktails came to an end there in Corinne Sloan's hotel suite in San Francisco. Homicide Lieutenant Davidson, still investigating this strange double tragedy, hours after its discovery, could fit only a few pieces of the puzzle together, answer but a few questions put to him by members of the local press. Uh, who found him, Lieutenant? The maid came in to fix the room, discovered the two of them sitting there, both dead. Mm. I heard the name Arlington mentioned. How does he fit into the picture? I wish I knew. According to papers found on both Larry Burton and the Sloan girl, they each had an appointment to meet Arlington at the Mid-City Hotel. Both of them? Yeah. When we checked with the Mid-City Hotel, found out that Burton himself had checked in there as Arlington. You mean Burton and Arlington were one and the same guy? Mm-hmm. They said at the hotel he'd stayed there only long enough to get a phone call from some woman. The late Corrine Sloan, here. Could be. Mm. Well, who do you figure poisoned the two cocktails? Corrine Sloan or, or Burton? Oh, it's hard to say. Looks to me like each of them poisoned the other. <laughs> Just two smart people who outsmarted each other. Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at this same time. Meanwhile, Signal Oil Company and the friendly independent dealers who help you go farther with Signal Gasoline hope you'll remember. Regardless of what gasoline you use, you'll enjoy more miles of happy driving if you drive at sensible speeds, obey traffic regulations, and avoid taking chances. You may even save a life possibly your own. Featured in tonight's story were Bill Foreman as the Whistler, Betty Lou Gerson, Wally Mayer, Herb Butterfield, Herbert Litton, and Bill Boucher. The Whistler was produced and directed by George W. Allen, with story by Joel Malone, music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. The Whistler is entirely fictional, and all characters portrayed on The Whistler are also fictional. Any similarity of names or resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Remember to tune in at this same time next Sunday, when the Signal Oil Company will bring you another strange story by The Whistler. Marvin Miller speaking for The Signal Oil Company. Stay tuned now for the Horace Height Show, which follows immediately over most of these stations. This is the CBS Radio Network. The Signal Oil Program.
Yes, the signal oil program, The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the signal oil program, The Whistler. the whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Friends, here's some exciting news. The latest Hooper ratings show that in the last two months, the listening audience of the whistler has increased by more than 50%. Yes, sir, 50%. And even before this increase, the Whistler was rated tops in popularity for a longer period of time than any other West Coast program in radio history. What do we at Signal Oil think about this? Well, naturally, we think it's wonderful. And we want to say thanks to our regular audience and welcome to all you new listeners. And remember, friends, Signal Gasoline is tops, too. And now, the Whistler's strange story. Last Curtain. The company's engagement at the Opera House in Los Angeles had two weeks to run. But Oriane Donati, whose beautiful voice was largely responsible for the success of the tour, had other things on her mind. Oriane was no longer thrilled by the curtain going up. She was not new to the music world. And moreover, when she allowed herself... She could feel the years inside. She didn't allow this often, of course, and certainly it was not being displayed at the moment. With Charles beside her, quietly reassuring, Oriane found it a simple matter to face the anger of the impresario, Giulio Cassini. Have you lost your mind, Oriane? You cannot just tear up a contract. I'm protected by the law. Law, law. There is only one law I recognize. I do as I please, and I will not desert my Charles. And? Why should you, my dear? Do marry, Charles, but remain with us for the season at least. Please, Carmilla. It is impossible. Charles will not hear of it. We are both desperately in love. Am I right, my darling? Yes, you're quite right, Orion. Orion, please, reconsider. Sorry, Julio, my mind is quite made up. Come, Charles, let's go someplace where we can be alone. By all means. (laughs) All right, play your games, but if you want my advice... He was rather unpleasant, dear. Julio, (laughs) he only thinks of the money he will lose. Enough of him, though. Do you really love me? Don't you know? Yes, I suppose I do. (laughs) That was nice, darling. Now I must go to my dressing room. Can you amuse yourself for a little while? Yes, but do hurry back. Yes, Sorianne, at this point in your career, in your life, the most important thing is Charles and your love for him. You're thinking about this, aren't you, as you sit down before the mirror in your dressing room? Mama. What? Mama. Oh, Felice. How often have I told you not to call me Mama? Oh, Mama. What am I going to do with you? Tell me, how are you coming along with your voice? Very well. Professor Gresby is pleased with my progress. What are you up to now? I've just finished Faust. I'm to take up Martha next. Oh, Martha, lovely. You know, Mr. Cassini has a great hope for your future. Do you enjoy your work in the chorus, darling? Very much. But, Mama, how long must this pretense go on? Now, Felice, my baby, it will be over sooner than you think. I... I am going to be married. Married? Yes, cara mia, to a very fine, handsome, rich man. We shall all three of us be very happy. Oh, oh, Mama, when? Soon, Felice, very soon. Now, child. Yes? A thousand pardons, my lady, but uh, if you have the time, I should like a word with you. I am very busy, Pepo. But, uh, well, young lady, 
You run along now. I hope the advice I have given you will help you to amount to something. Oh, it will, Madame Donati. And thank you. Well, what is it, Pepo? Please, Madonna. Is it true what they are all saying? That you are leaving us? Being married? Yes, it's true. Oh, no, my lady, no. You must remain. The opera needs you. The opera? <laughs> Go away, old man. Go to your world of props where you belong. You fatigue me. Oh, you grieve me, Madonna. True, I am without physical grace and beauty, but, oh, please, in my heart there is love. Love? <laughs> Love indeed. Go away, buffo. Go down to your room where you belong and stay out of my life. Stay out of what does not concern me. Peppo doesn't really annoy you, does he, Oriana? He only amuses you. But you're genuinely disturbed about your daughter, Felice, because you haven't mentioned her to Charles, have you? Somehow the opportunity has never been right. But you know there'll be plenty of time for that after you're married. And his love for you will make him understand anything. The following morning, Julio sends for you. And he seems in a strangely happy mood when you enter his office. Uh, uh, Orian, come in, come in. Where are the papers? Canceling my contract? On the desk, my dear. There are six copies. The sooner you sign them, the sooner you can start preparing for the great day. You do not want me to perform tomorrow night? Oh, not necessary at all, cara mia. Now, if you just sign the papers... Julio. Yes? Uh, tell me, how is it that this morning you seem so agreeable? Only yesterday you were tearing out your hair, shouting you were ruined. I have had a change of heart. I know about love. I know it cannot wait. I thought it over. After all, who am I to oppose Cupid, huh? Julio, you are lying. What has happened? All right, you ask. This morning, Madame of Brock signed with us. Kitty Brock? You sign her before you cancel my contract? Uh, yes, now I hear the paper, six copies signed at the bottom. I Every... sign nothing. Good day, Julio. Wait, Orion, we must discuss this, please. There is nothing to discuss. The thought that Julio has taken you at your word about leaving the company infuriates you, doesn't it, Orian? That he would sign someone else before you've even given the final release on your contract. And of all people for him to choose, Kitty Brock, a woman you've never liked. Since you refuse to cancel your contract, you continue to sing your roles. Then a few days later, you learn even more about Kitty. It's during a lull in the rehearsal while you're standing in the wings that Peppo, the property man of the company, whispers the unpleasant news in your ear. My lady. Huh? You... What are you doing sneaking about? I would like to tell you how pleased I am that you remain with the opera after all. Oh, go away, people. No, it is a wise decision you make, Madonna. Uh, that Porco, he's not worthy of you. Porco? How dare you speak of my beloved in that manner? Go about your business, wretch. I must sing in a moment. Yes, my lady, sing. Give your love to music. Do not waste it on him who deceives. Deceives? I speak the truth, my lady. It is him whom you would call husband that deceives you. He has been seeing her these past weeks. I know I followed them. Her? Who? Speak up. It is the other. The one with the voice of a goat. Kitty? Oh, no. Peppo, if you speak falsely, I kill you. No, 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 no. I speak the truth. Please, please. Even now, this very moment. Look. The third box to the left. Eh? They're together. Do, do you see, Madonna? They are not looking down at the opera. No, indeed. They look into each other's eyes. No. They are in love. Oh, is it her design to make me out a fool? To take all that is mine? No. Oh, no, I shall not let her do that. <laughs> With the prologue of Last Curtain, the Signal Oil Company brings you another strange story by The Whistler. But just for a moment, let's suppose this were a quiz show, and you were asked, what gasoline is known as the go-farther gasoline? What would your answer be? 
Well, if you've lived out west any length of time, you know that from Canada to Mexico, Signal is famous as the go-farther gasoline. Now, naturally, we're mighty proud of Signal's good mileage, but even more so, we're proud of what makes such mileage possible, the extra efficiency today's Signal gasoline coaxes from your motor. Because when your motor runs more efficiently, you also enjoy quicker starting, faster pickup, and smoother power, the things that make driving more fun. That's why folks who want superior performance, as well as those who insist on mileage, are both switching to Signal. They've discovered that to get the tops in gasoline quality, there are just two things to remember. One, in gasoline, it takes extra quality to go farther. And two, Signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. And now, back to the whistler. The worst has happened, hasn't it, Oriane? Charles and Kitty. The shock of it keeps you confined to your hotel rooms all the next day. And the evening's performance goes badly. And the day after that brings angry words between you and Julio when he tells you that Kitty Brock is going to sing your role tonight, regardless of your contract. Later, the odd, strangely devoted little Peppo comes to your dressing room. My lady. Peppo, please, let me be. Madonna, I beg of you, listen to what I have to say. Oh. Look, after tonight, Madame Brock will bother you no longer. What are you saying, Peppo? In the room where I keep my props, there is a mirror. A mirror especially created for the use of Madame Cazzana. A mirror? Yes. But, ah, such a mirror. And so, so, so practical. You see, it was purchased for Madame Cazzana nearly 20 years ago by a man who was madly in love with her. And very jealous. Oh, come now. You're speaking in riddles, old man. Explain yourself. Well, the mirror, the glass was treated in such a way that a high-pitched thrill or vibrato would instantly explode it in one's face. <laughs> a just reward for vanity, Madonna, would you not agree? Eh? Especially if one is accustomed to singing into one's mirror, like the good Faust Margarita. Eh? How is that that you have come to possess this... this mirror? <laughs> Madame Gazzana was in love with another, so she gave the mirror to me. Ah, you're dreaming, old man. If you were telling me the truth, you could not know of the mirror's treatment. Gazzana herself did not know. But I do know. The jealous lover told me. When Gazzana sang Margarita and the mirror did not explode, the man came to see why. When I told him I had the mirror, he begged me to give it back for fear some innocent one would be hurt, but... But you kept the mirror? Yes. I was certain that someday it would serve its purpose. Oh, get out of here, people. So, this, then, is my reward for offering you happiness. I told you to leave, Peppo. Very well, my fine lady. But the next time, you will come to me. Really? You think no, Madonna? I shall be waiting for you. Downstairs in my room, with my props, where I belong, where all the ugly things are kept. <laughs> you know in your heart there is only hatred for Kitty Brock, don't you, Oriane? And you wonder why you fail to take advantage of Peppo's offer. The more you think about it, the more you're certain Peppo told you the truth. The principle of shattering glass by, by vibration has been known for more than a century. And now you've sent him away, the only one who could help you. As you leave your dressing room and start down the circular stairway... Orion! Orion! Oh, Charles! Orion, where have you been? I'm... Tried to reach you. Uh... Charlotte, you have to excuse me now. I must see Julio. Oh, wait, it's important. I I have something to say to you. Well, all right, but do hurry. I I hardly know how to begin. It's rather difficult to... Charles, to... what is it? Orion, I must ask you to release me from my promise. Release you? Orion, please don't hate me. I... So it's true. 
The Brock woman, is it? Yes. Yes, it happened all at once. It was sudden, overwhelming. We... Well, neither of us could help it. Oh, Charles, you fool! Wait! It's finally happened, hasn't it, Orian? You've lost everything. Though you're still under contract, Julio has replaced you in the company. And now Charles has rejected you. You walk backstage behind the lofty proscenium as though lost in a dream. As the hours pass, you can concentrate on only one thing, one person, Kitty Brock. She's the cause of it all, isn't she? Then in the distance, you hear the chorus rehearsing for tonight's performance of Faust. Concealed behind a flat, you watch your daughter Felice as she sings. So young, so alive. Then another voice becomes audible. Kitty Brock rehearsing your role. The role of Margarita. Her voice taunts you, doesn't it, Orianne? You begin to tremble with rage. And then a thought flickers through your mind. Jewel song. Margarita gazes into a mirror. A mirror. <laughs> The hatred you feel for Kitty Brock swells within you. You turn, rush downstairs to the property room. It's the first time you've been below the opera house. You find the air damp, faded. And as you walk along the dark corridor, you see a dim light at the far end and you hear Peppo. Peppo! Peppo! It is the fine lady come to visit Peppo, huh? What an honor you accord me. Peppo, I... I am in need of your help. I have no time to lose. I must have the mirror. Peppo, please give it to me. A moment. For what reason do you want it? For what reason do you think? The Brock woman. She has robbed me of my fiancé, my position, everything. Everything, my lady? Or is it just that she has robbed you of your lover? Are you going to give me the mirror? Yes, I will give you the mirror. Take it, take it. <sighs> Thank you. And then now, Peppo. Yes? You leave the building and stay away until after the performance tonight. Oh, but Madonna, Mr. Cassini, what will he say when he asks me what shall I say? You were called away suddenly. Yes. Somebody in the family was ill, anything, I don't care. It will be safer. If you are not here, they cannot blame you. An accident. Someone picks up the wrong mirror by mistake. Yes, yes, I understand. Yes, I will go immediately. You watch Peppo back out of the room, twisting the tattered cap in his hand. The moment he's gone, you pick up the mirror. Quickly, you slip it under your wrap and hurry to your dressing room. You put in a call to Union Station, reserve a compartment on the late train to New York. Moments later, you're backstage. To the left wing, where the garden sequence paraphernalia is set and waiting. You hurry to the jewel box on the table. Quickly, you remove the mirror from the box. Replace it with the deadly one you got from Peppo. Yes, Sorian. In a fraction of a second, the deed is accomplished. Back at your apartment, you spend the rest of the afternoon packing for your trip to New York. Then shortly before six that evening, you hurry from the building. Your train doesn't leave till 9.40, and you decide to have dinner at a quaint little Italian restaurant not far from Union Station. As you approach the waiting cab, the driver opens the door for you. Hurry on! Hurry on, wait! Wait! You turn and see Giulio Cassini hurrying down the street towards you. Hurry, driver. If you're the Italian restaurant, commercial street. Hurry on, wait! Wait, Giulio! Hurry on, You're relaxed, aren't you, Orian? Hours later, as the train pulls out of the station, you lean back in your chair, give yourself up to the slow, hypnotic rhythm of the wheels on the track. Wheels that every moment take you further away from the opera house, where the performance is now in progress. Suddenly, a picture flashes through your mind. The opera, Kitty Brock and the Jewel Song. You can see her now, can't you? Singing into the mirror... You can almost hear the high-pitched trill and then the glass shattering. The 
It is too bad, Madame Brock, that your first performance with this company shall be your last. About ten o'clock, you step out of your compartment, start down the narrow corridor toward the club car, and then suddenly your ears become alert. Your brain starts spinning wildly as two voices emerge from a compartment up ahead. Oh, come along, darling. That's Kitty Brock's voice. What is she doing on this train? A moment later, you see her step into the corridor, followed by Charles. You stand there dumbfounded, unable to move, unable to think. Uh, Kitty, don't you think we ought to wire to Tulio? When we arrive in New York, we'll be soon enough. Do you think he'll be mad because we eloped? Missing the performance tonight, I mean. He'll be furious, of course. But who cares? <laughs> I doubt very much if Orion will ever sing for Cassini again. Oh, that's true, I suppose. Well, it's Felice. She's quite good, you know. Felice? Who is... Orion's daughter. You didn't know. <laughs> Felice. Felice. Oh, no. Oh, but Felice will have to sing. She's the only one left who knows the rules. <laughs> Conductor! Conductor! Yes, ma'am? I must get off the train immediately. You must stop. Oh, I'm sorry, ma'am. I've I... got to get back to Los Angeles. Well, we'll be in Pasadena in a few minutes. You can get off there, take a cab. What time is it now? Uh, ten minutes after ten, ma'am. All right, all right. I get off at Pasadena. <laughs> One, seven, nine, four. Busy. Oh, no. It can't be. It can't. Try, try operator. Oh. Oh. Oh, who was keeping the operator? Operator. Operator. I'm trying to reach Creston 1794. But I keep getting busy signal. Will you check that for me, please? That is a toll call, madam. Oh, hurry, it's important. The number is Creston 1794. Yes. Yes, do hurry. One moment, please. Oh. I really... Was taking her so long. Operator! Operator! I've got to reach Felice. Hello? Yes, operator. Creston 1794 has been reported out of order. Out of order? I'm sorry if you'll place your call later. But it's important. I must get through somehow. Please, is there anything you can do? I'm sorry the line is out of order. Oh! <laughs> Yes, ma'am. The Opera House in Los Angeles. Can you make it in 20 minutes? I've got to be backstage before 10.40. 20 minutes? Oh. Well, that's pretty quick, lady. Make it quicker if you can. Don't worry about traffic fines. I pay for everything. Please hurry. It's a matter of life and death. <laughs> The Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending of tonight's story. Meantime, a brief weather forecast. <laughs> no, I'm not going to predict just how cold it's going to be or how often. But this much I do know. The kind of weather we're likely to have during the next couple of months is tough on car batteries. And you can never tell how suddenly you may need a new one. That's why it'll pay every driver to keep these facts in mind about the new Signal Deluxe Battery. Unlike ordinary batteries, which may be guaranteed for 12 or 18 months, Signal Deluxe batteries are guaranteed for a full 30 months on a service basis. The secret of this extra-long life in Signal Deluxe batteries is their superior construction, which includes improved-type rubber separators and a new design all-rubber case, which requires water less often. As a result, Signal Deluxe batteries deliver up to 35% more power for quick, dependable starting. So before you buy any battery, stop by your signal service station. Find out the liberal trade-in your signal dealer will offer you 
on today's finer, longer life battery, a new Signal Deluxe battery. And now, back to the Whistler. It's a race against time, isn't it, Orianne? The minutes tick away, precious minutes. And finally, your cab roars into downtown Los Angeles. You must reach the opera before the jewel song begins, before your daughter Felice, as Margarita, sings into the deadly mirror you had hoped would shatter in Kitty Brock's face. Then, as you're within half a block of the opera house... Driver, what's the matter? Why are you stopping? Sorry, lady, I can't run over the car in front of me. Can't you go around there? Sorry again, that's impossible. All right, here's your fare. Keep the change. I run the rest of the way. I must get backstage before 10.40. Well, lady, you can't get out here. Be careful. A small crowd had gathered near the opera house, stunned by the news of the tragedy. They saw Giulio Cassini slip out the side entrance with Felice Donati. They watched the sobbing girl, a handkerchief covering her face, being assisted toward the waiting ambulance. Now, now, my dear, everything will be all right. Please, please, let us through. Here, let me help you, please. Please. Take it easy, please. Now, we're all right. Please. Hours later in the hospital waiting room, Giulio Cassini, hands clasped behind his back, stood by the window staring out into the night. The room was quiet except for the gentle sobbing of the woman who sat nearby. <laughs> Giulio turned, placed his hand on her shoulder, and then a door opened softly. A white-clad figure stepped out into the hall and approached them. Doctor. Oh. Uh, Doctor, how, how is she? Mr. Julia Cassina? Yes, yes. Will she be all right? Well, she'll pull through okay. Oh. But her oh. face was cut quite badly by the glass. Oh, may we see her now, Doctor? Oh, uh, uh, this is uh, Phyllis, Doctor, the injured lady's daughter. May we go in? For a moment, yes. Come along. Oh, thank you. Come along, Uh, Mr. Cassini. Yes. Do you know how this accident happened? Oh, well, um, according to the cab driver, Orion jumped from her taxi, started to run toward the opera house, saying she had to get there before 10.40. Oh. She did not see the car approaching. 10.40? Oh, yes, uh, that is just the time when the jewel song starts. And that's when Beppo rushed onto the stage, stopped the show. He grabbed the mirror from me and broke it into a thousand pieces. Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at this same time. Brought to you by the Signal Oil Company, marketers of Signal gasoline and motor oil and fine quality automotive accessories. Signal has asked me to remind you, to get the most driving pleasure, drive at sensible speeds, be courteous, and obey traffic regulations. It may save a life, possibly your own. <laughs> Featured in tonight's story were Jeanette Nolan and Mary Kroger. The Whistler was produced and directed by George W. Allen, with story by Frank DeFilitta and music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. All characters portrayed on the Whistler program are fictional. Any similarity of names or resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Remember, at the same time next Sunday, another strange tale by The Whistler. Marvin Miller speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Stay tuned for the mystery program that is unique among all mystery programs. Because even when you know who is guilty, you always receive a startling surprise at the final curtain. In the Signal Oil program, 
The Whistler. Signal, the famous Go Farther Gasoline, invites you to sit back and enjoy another strange story by The Whistler. I am The Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadow. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now for the Signal Oil Company, the Whistler's strange story. A matter of odds. It was a matter of odds from the beginning. Because that was the way Danny Atkins lived, by the odds, a betting chance. But he played safe, carefully figured the odds in Danny's own favor. It was that way right now, in a dimly lit back street in Panama City. Danny was carefully following a sailor named Keller, with whom Danny had had several drinks, before Keller left the Seven Sinners bar with a little too much alcohol aboard. Then two blocks and an alley later it happened. Up ahead, a dark figure leaping forth, an exchange of blows, and then Danny running forward. I'll get him, Keller! I got a boy, Jerry! Okay, okay, mister, I had enough. Let me go. Try to jump my pal, will you? Let me go! All right, keep your going. Get him, Danny. Oh, skip it. Ah, But I thought that we... You thought nothing. Here, wallet. Are you too tight to see? Oh, now look, Jerry. Sure, sure. Look, Keller, I suppose you didn't talk too much back there in the seven sinners, huh? Well, I suppose I... you didn't go big shot flashing that wad. Look, Danny, we just met. I'm not uh, used sure to... we just met, and I just saved you three months' pay, Jerry. All right. So come on, I'll buy you a drink. You're my pal. Yeah, sure. Okay, Keller, I'm your pal. You can just do that. You can buy me a drink. <laughs> Anywhere you say, pal. Any place in old Panama City. Amusing, isn't it, Danny? The way you picked up with Sailor Keller and the Seven Sinners became friendly with him. He showed you a picture he had taken in Tokyo. And you even showed him an old snapshot of yourself when you were a high school baseball star. And all the while you were figuring the odds weighing how much bigger Keller was, how drunk, how much of a protest he'd put up verbally and physically. Someone else jumped in, and now you emerge as a hero instead of a villain. But as you enter another bar, the blue moon, you tell yourself that it isn't over. Not yet. The blue moon here is as good a place as any. I even know somebody in here. Hiya, Francie. Hey, hey, take, take, take it easy, Keller. They'll toss us out of here. Hey, who's your friend, sailor? Danny boy. Ah, uh, he's just, just Danny boy, sweetheart. <laughs> Don't you go getting too well acquainted. Don't worry. Well, ditto. Hey, I'm not so sure I want to sit at the same table with him. Oh, come on, come on. He's my pal. Just save my neck. Oh, uh, okay. Here we are. Sure, my pal. Quite an athlete, too. Uh, show Fancy that baseball picture of your Danny boy. She isn't interested. Go on, go on. Hey, waiter, a round of drinks for my friends here, huh? Joey! Hey, Joey, got a customer for you. Huh? Who's Joey? Ticket vendor. You heard of the National Lottery. A lot of dough gonna be changed hands soon. Oh, sure. Yeah, really? Uh, hello, Fancy. Wanna buy some tickets? Well, my friend does, Sailor Keller. Oh, Mr. Keller. All right. How many, sir? I'll take a fistful. Joey, a fistful. A fistful? Hey, look, oh, Keller. Relax, Danny. I feel lucky. Uh, give me lots of threes, Joey. Three's lucky for me. Sure, Mr. Keller, sure. How about uh, 3303? Okay. Buy some for the lady, too? Yeah. Oh, gee, for my pal, Danny boy. Oh, no, never mind me. I'm no gambler. I thought you were always figuring the odds, Danny. Uh, 
Didn't we talk about that? Yeah, I said I figured the odds on people, Keller. People, situations. I don't make wild bets. Oh, you wouldn't. Okay, okay. It's going to be your loss. Uh, skip him, Joey. But me? Give me a fistful of those threes. And, and waiter, another round for us here for Fancy, Joey, and me, and, and my pal. My old pal, Danny Boy. Oh, you're a sport, oh, sweetie. Oh, look, Keller, you're a sucker. The odds are against you. 50,000 to one. Oh, pay no attention to him, <laughs> Against honey. me? Okay, Danny Boy, so what? <laughs> Oh, what? So I'll see you in the morning. Over at your hotel. <laughs> Anything you say, pal. My room's 214. Right now I'm going to stay anchored for a while. Me and little Francie. Mm, that's right, hon. Oh, I was wrong, Keller. A hundred thousand to one odds. And all against you, all the way. <laughs> just bitter. Little old Danny boy is just bitter. <laughs> Night, pal. Night. It's infuriating, isn't it, Danny? Watching Sailor Keller spend his money so foolishly. Money you'd hoped for. Money that might have taken you back home to the States. But there's very little you can do about it, is there? And the next morning on your way to Keller's hotel, you look into the bar, wondering if he even made it home last night. And then something hits you. A number marked on the mirror in the back of the bar. Number 3303, Keller's number. A winning ticket in the week's lottery. Your mind spins, already starting to figure the odds in still another direction. In his hotel room, Keller is probably still sleeping off last night. A plus in your favor. Keller has a gun, and that's a definite minus. But you decide you must get that ticket, Danny. You weigh the odds and decide your chance. You walk up the flight of stairs to the second floor, down the hall to 214, Keller's room. When you reach there, you're surprised to find his door half open. You enter cautiously. Sailor. Sailor. Sleeping like a baby. Great. Wait a minute. 3303 is missing. Winning ticket's gone. Francie. Francie, she beat me here. That's why that door was open. It has to be Francie, doesn't it, Danny? Yes, the girl in the bar last night. It's the middle of the afternoon before you finally find out where she stays and stop by her apartment. What you're talking about. Oh, no, you wouldn't. You packing, Francie? Huh? Going somewhere? Well, yeah, I got a new engagement. I'm being booked in the San Francisco. Oh, sure. It's funny, you know, I'm heading that way myself. Yeah? Hmm. Well, well, look here, Francie. Mm-hmm. Right on top of your pretty things. All this money. Okay, well, all right. So, so I cash Keller's ticket. Look, we can split it. I took it from Keller, sold it to my boss for thirty thousand. Uh, so I see. Thanks for cashing it for me, Francie. What? Thirty thousand will take me quite a distance. Hey, but you. Oh, poor old sailor. He wouldn't believe me about the odds, would he? Never mind the sailor. He'll sleep all day. Well, look, Danny, don't take it all. Leave me some of that money. After all, I was the. Yeah. Who is it? Hey, Francie. Sailor Keller. Open the bar. Come on, Francie. If you don't open this door, I'll blast the lock. He's got a gun. I got this, Francie. I'm giving you exactly ten seconds. No more. When Milady gets spring fever, out she goes and buys a new hat to perk up her spirit. Wouldn't you like to be able to perk up your car spirits that easily in spring? You can, friend, you can. Simply by treating your car to a tank full of the famous Go Farther gasoline. Signal, that is. Ah, you say you thought mileage is the thing Signal gasoline is famous for. You're so right. But that's only half the story. The other half is what makes Signal deliver such good mileage. Namely, 
Signal helps your engine run so efficiently you save gasoline. Well, when your engine runs that efficiently, naturally you also notice quick starting, peppy pickup, smooth, obedient power, the very things that make driving more fun. That's why Signal says performance and mileage are like birds of a feather. They go together. No need to choose between driving pleasure and economy. Get both by powering your car with the famous Go Farther gasoline. Fill up next time at a Signal service station. Signal, Signal, Signal gasoline. Your car will go far with Go Farther gasoline. Well, Danny, it was a frightening moment, wasn't it? Trapped in that Panama City hotel room with a furious armed man on the opposite side of the door. The odds were poor then, weren't they? But the window and the fire escape gave you a way out. Once you've given Keller the slip, you hurry to the airport, make airplane reservations for Mexico City under your own name of Dan Atkins to throw Sailor Keller off your trail. At midnight, you take passage on a slow freighter for San Francisco, where you arrive three days later. Once there, you relax. Begin to enjoy yourself with Keller's money. You replenish your wardrobe, buy a new sports model car, and start driving north. The odds you always figure seem definitely in your favor, don't they? With little chance of Keller finding you in your old hometown of Trent City. When you arrive there, you pull in at a gas station. Yes, sir. Fill her up. Hello, Jack. Well, what do you know, Danny Atkins? Hey, welcome home. You here to stay? Maybe. Uh, nothing like the old hometown, Danny. Yeah, it's good to me, Chuck. <laughs> nothing changed much, has it? Ah, the old gang's still around, too. Most of them married now, though. Freddie, Bert, Marilyn. Yeah? Just about all of them, I guess. Except Diane. <laughs> Remember her? Diane Johnson? Oh, she was just a kid out of high school. But my, how she's grown. Why don't you look her up? Yeah, maybe I will. You notice that new ranch house on the left as you came into town, just past the bridge? Yeah, I did. A lot of class, I was wondering. The old man built the place last summer. Some huh? of that mining property you owned up there in the hills paid off. You're kidding. Nope. Well, looks like maybe it was a mistake for you to leave town, Danny. I always wanted you to go into business with him. Oh, I know. Uh, still playing the odds, Danny? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. What are the odds in you staying on here? Oh, Right now, Chuck, they uh, look pretty good. After you leave, Chuck, you register at the local hotel and cruise about town. Your old friends are glad to see you, aren't they, Dan? Yes, and you can tell they're impressed. Your new car, the fine cut of your clothes. You spend two or three days enjoying yourself, renewing old acquaintances. And then one afternoon, you drive to the large ranch house near the bridge, the Johnson place. Danny Atkins. How are you, son? Hello, Mr. Johnson. Well, I'm glad to see you. I heard you were in town. Come on in. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you're looking fine, Danny. Fine. Oh, thank you, sir. From what I've heard from the folks around town, you seem to have done pretty well for yourself. Oh, I've heard the same about you, Mr. Johnson. Oh, I've been lucky, I guess. <laughs> I've been lucky, too. Oh, I know better than that, Danny. It's more than luck with you. Good common horse sense, that's what it is. You figure things out. Your dad was like that. Oh, Diane. Yes, sir. Come here, honey. I uh, haven't told her you were in town. Wanted to be a surprise. Wait till you see the look on her face. Danny. You stare at her, don't you, Danny? Unable to believe what you see. She has changed, hasn't she? Yes, you'd hardly recognize her from the gangling schoolgirl in the blue jeans and plaid shirt you knew years ago. She's really beautiful, isn't she? After you recover from the surprise, the three of you settle down in the den for a pleasant chat. You stay on for dinner. And through it all, you find you can't keep your eyes off of Diane, can you, Danny? And later, the two of you go for a walk along the quiet, tree-lined street. Oh, it's wonderful having you back here, Danny. Oh, it's good to be back. You know, I've missed all this, the old town, the friends. Well, we haven't had much time to talk about them, have we? With Dad monopolizing the conversation. 
I hope he didn't bore you, Dennis. Oh, of course not. I suppose you know what's on his mind. Do I? He still wants you to join us, Dan. Danny, when he does ask you, think it over carefully before giving the answer. It would mean a lot to him. And to you, Danny? Yeah. To me, too, Danny. It becomes quite clear to you in the days that follow, the hours you spend with Diane, that your friend Chuck was right, Danny. Yes, the schoolgirl crush she had on you hasn't left her, has it? Only it's more than that now. She's very much in love with you, isn't she? And then early one evening, the two of you drive down to San Francisco and have dinner at a fashionable hotel. You're having a good time, Diane? Oh, of course. But you still haven't told me what this is all about. Are we celebrating something? Yes. I am in your father's firm. Huh? Danny, <laughs> Danny, that's wonderful, Dad, didn't say. I wanted to be the one to tell you, darling. But Danny, I'm just so happy about this. I, I just don't know what to say. Well, you could say yes when I ask you to marry me. Well? Please, please go out on the parents, darling. I think little Diane is going to burst into tears. It's all working out just the way you planned it, isn't it, Danny? And you're looking ahead, aren't you? The day of Mr. Johnson's death, Diane will inherit his interest in the company. And she'll be your wife. You'll control it all. <laughs> Following morning, you accompany your future father-in-law into the hills to look over his newest project, the abandoned Crofton Mine. You catalog each item in your mind. Listen to Mr. Johnson's suggestion. And then you have some of your own to offer. Seems pleased. Son, I go along with those ideas of yours a hundred percent. A lot of angles there I hadn't figured on. Oh, Mr. Johnson, one more thing. About that double cable running from the mine entrance here across the river to uh, the road on the other side. Well, they're pretty worn out and rusty, aren't they? Well, I've already taken care of that, Danny. Gonna have the boys put in a couple of new cables. Well, why? Like I said, they're all rusty. They won't hold well, up. I mean, why Why use the cables at all? Well, how else are we going to haul the stuff we take out of the mine here to the tracks across we the river? We don't have to cross the river, Mr. Johnson. If we build a road from the main entrance to the new highway a few miles down, trucks could drive from the highway here to the mine on this side. We could load them on this side. Forget about the river. Uh, cost a little money, wouldn't it? Yeah, but it'd uh, be worth it in the long run, considering the time for it. Hmm. Yeah. yeah, maybe it's worth that. Doggone it, Danny, that's what I mean. Something as simple as this staring me right in the face and I don't see it. <laughs> <laughs> it takes a little figuring, Mr. Johnson. That's all. Plans for the reopening of the old Crofton mine run smoothly in the next few days, don't they, Danny? And you find more and more time to spend with Diane. And then one night, something happens that you hadn't counted on. You drop Diane off at her house after a date. And walk back toward your car. Hello, Danny boy. Kill her! Get in. Yeah, your sailor friend. What odds were you giving that I wouldn't find you? Look, I... Uh, uh, how did you find me? The baseball picture you showed me in the barn. You forgot it showed your high school in the background. Trent City High. Or maybe you thought I was too high to notice it. Danny, I want my dough. All of it. You don't think I carry it around with me, do you? Then we'll trot on down to the bank in the morning and get it. I, I don't have it. I, uh... I've invested it. You know, I was afraid of that, Danny boy. I heard around town that you'd gone into some business deal with a gent named Johnson. Okay. So get it back. Get it. Get it back. That's impossible right now. A, a few months, maybe. I can't wait that long. I'll give you a couple of days. The dough or else. Unless you plug me with that rod. What good is that? Oh, I wouldn't plug you, Danny. No. What? 
The hometown folks might be surprised to learn how you got that dough. The little chick you've been running around with, old man Johnson, all your pals. Oh, gee, a word against mine. So if you didn't cop the dough, where and how did you get it? They might like to know. Look, fella, you, you'll get your money. Sure I will. One way or another. But how do I know you won't tell me? You're good at laying odds. Suppose you figure that one out. There's little sleep for you that night, Danny, because of Keller and the threat he holds over you. He could ruin everything for you, couldn't he? And the odds are that he will unless you stop him, silence him. It's a dangerous step to take, isn't it? One you must think over carefully, weigh the facts, the odds. You've made up your mind what to do when he calls you two nights later. You arrange to meet him on a quiet road just outside of town. He's standing by his car waiting for you when you walk by. Right on time, Danny boy. That's fine. Uh, what's in the shoebox? A lot of cash, didn't you? Yeah. Hold still. I want to make sure you... I, I don't have a gun. I'll decide that. No? No gun. All right, now, how about putting yours away? Makes me nervous. Sure. Why not? Okay, let's have the dough. Open the box. The moment he slips his gun into his pocket, you open the shoebox. And your hand closes over the 38 you've hidden inside. <laughs> Kelly staggers forward as he's hit. The brief struggle, his hands close around your throat. You pull away. Then he falls back and slumps to the ground. You stare at him for a moment. And suddenly you're aware that a car is approaching. You dive into the ditch. A truck, Danny. Loaded with townspeople coming home from the barn dance at Fondale. And you recognize the voice of your friend, Chuck. Hey, hey, there's been an accident. Yeah, but uh, let's have a look. Huh? Hey, this guy's been shot, Chuck. He's dead. Yeah. Hey, better go for the police, Jimmy. All right. The rest of us stay here. Wait, what's this in his hand? Oh, that's somebody's shirt collar. Your hand goes to your collar. You realize for the first time that in the struggle, Keller ripped a good part of your shirt collar away. And if you're caught, it will be easy to prove the torn collar in Keller's hand came from your shirt. The odds against you have mounted fast, haven't they, Danny? You decide you've got to make a run for it. Nothing else you can do. Hey, look! Look over there! Somebody running across the field! Hey, maybe that's the kid! Let's get him, you guys! Come on! They're not far behind as you approach the foothills, are they, Danny? And then as you reach the river, you know you're trapped. There's no way to get across. But then suddenly you remember. Yes, the mine cable stretching across the river, not far downstream. A few minutes later, you reach them. What are the odds now, Danny? The cables are eaten by rust, and it's a long way across, isn't it? A rushing river below. You make it to the other side, you'll be safe. You stay here, the chances are you'll be caught. You weigh the odds carefully, don't you, Danny? It's a matter of timing. And even if the cables do break, and you fall into the river, you're a good swimmer. And you're certain you can make the other side. And then... I'll tell you, I'm sure he came up this way. Well, he isn't here. Did you get a good look at him? No, it's too dark. He probably headed downstream toward the bridge, the only way across. Yeah. Hey, hey but wait a minute. Huh? I just happened to think of something. What about those cable lines leading across the river? They're around here someplace, aren't they? Well, yeah, sure. But a guy would be a sap to try it. Hand over hand, more than 50 yards. Uh -uh. Uh, I guess you're right. He wouldn't try it. Come on. Wouldn't I try it, Chuck? Wouldn't I? <laughs> Time to change. Time to change. Yes, it's time to change, says that sign outside Signal Station. Time to drain tired out old winter motor oil. Time to refill with fresh, clean Signal Premium motor oil. 
the new heavy-duty signal oil that reduces engine wear 50%. Think what a 50% reduction in engine wear means to your wallet and your car's performance. Engines not only keep that new car pep and power twice as long, they also run twice as far between overhauls because new signal premium heavy-duty does so much more than just lubricate. In addition, it cools, cleans, cushions, seals, and protects. No wonder so many motorists who want to protect their car are changing this spring to new Signal Premium Heavy Duty Motor Oil. Changing at Signal Station, where you see that sign outside. Time to change. Time to change. Time to change. <laughs> A small group of townspeople, shocked by the news of the tragedy, had gathered at the river's edge just below the Crofton Mine. High above them at the mine entrance stood Sheriff Delsing and Mr. Johnson, surveying the scene in stunned silence. Presently, the two men approached the edge of the cliff. The sheriff pointed toward the opposite shore. Well, that's where Danny fell, Mm -hmm. right out there in the rocks. I just don't understand this at all, Sheriff. I don't understand why he was on those cables. Yeah, there's lots of things I don't understand about this either. One thing I'm pretty sure of, though. What's that? Well, according to where he fell, he must have been about a third of the way across when that first cable snapped. I guess he knew the other cable wouldn't hold his weight very long either. It's too bad. That second cable had broken a few feet further in either direction. He'd have landed in the river instead of on those rocks. Mm-hmm. Probably be alive now. Yep. Yeah, I can just see Danny. Up there in that cable... We've got a quick decision to make. Keep going or turn back. <laughs> you know how Danny was about decisions. Yeah, the odds. Always thinking about the odds. I guess this time he took just a little too long to figure them out. Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at this same time. Meantime, Signal Oil Company and the friendly independent dealers who help you go farther with Signal Gasoline hope you'll remember. Regardless of what gasoline you use, you'll enjoy more miles of happy driving if you drive at sensible speeds, obey traffic regulations, and avoid taking chances. You may even save a life, possibly your own. Featured in tonight's story were Bill Foreman as the Whistler, Lamont Johnson, G.G. Pearson, Tom Tully, Bob Bruce, Bill Boucher, and John Shea. The Whistler was produced and directed by George W. Allen, with story by Adrian John Doe, music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. The Whistler was entirely fictional. Any similarity of names or resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Remember to tune in at the same time next Sunday when the Signal Oil Company will bring you another strange story by The Whistler. Marvin Miller speaking for the Signal Oil Company. Stay tuned now for Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden, which follows immediately over most of these stations. This is the CBS Radio Network. And now, stay tuned for the program that has rated tops in popularity for a longer period of time than any other West Coast program in radio history. The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler.
Vigno, the famous Go Farther Gasoline, invite you to sit back and enjoy another strange story by The Whistler. by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now for the Signal Oil Company, the Whistler's strange story, The House on Hainsley Boulevard. The old Hackett Place on Hainsley Boulevard was a monument to the past, built by the very first of the Hacketts to arrive in California a good many years before. It clung now to its former grandeur with a sort of quiet, determined tenacity. But one evening shortly after midnight, the quiet of the neighborhood was suddenly shattered, the air torn with a startling cry... Fire! Fire! Yes, the cry of fire knifing through the stillness of tree-lined Hainsley Boulevard. The old house threatened as flames leaped to envelop it, and immediately the street was alive with activity. And miraculously, coming swiftly to the rescue, a fire engine, its crew working skillfully, fighting off the threat of destruction. And then out of the crowd, a man appeared. Oh, Mr. Hackett, the house is safe. Yeah, I see. No one in there, is there, Mr. Hackett? Your Aunt Leona away? Oh, she's away, thank heaven. Spending the night in Glendale. How did it happen, Lieutenant Mullen? How did you start? I don't know. I went past about half an hour ago, going on duty. Oh, and I, I know. To... Uh, Aunt Leona will be grateful to you, Lieutenant. No, no, forget it. The funny thing, though, Mr. Hackett, I thought I saw somebody running away from the place. Huh? Yeah, that's right. Well, I'll see you later, Mr. Hackett. Sure. And thanks, Mullen. I'd have been sick if anything had happened to the old place. You are sick inside, aren't you, Frank? Because your plan failed so completely. And even as you thank Police Lieutenant Mullen for his swift action, you inwardly curse yourself, forgetting that he passes this way regularly, and that only a matter of a half an hour destroyed your timing. And you have to have money soon. $5,000 to clear your gambling debt with Dino da Costa, or the payoff will be your life. Even with the damage very slight, the... Seen with Aunt Leona the next morning is an unpleasant one, as she surveys the scorched section at the rear of the old place. Disgraceful. Oh, there's very little damage, Aunt Leona. It isn't the extent of the damage. It's your carelessness that disturbs me. Hmm. I've left you everything I have in my will, and all I ask in return is that you assume some responsibility and make things easier for me while I'm still here. Look, Aunt Leona, it could have been much worse. You worry yourself sick over this house. It's my home, isn't it? It's my home, too, Aunt Leona. Half mine, half yours, according to Kathy's will. And it'll be all yours when I die, along with everything else I have. But I'm not dead yet, Frank. Just the same we ought to accept Mr. Fleming's offer to buy, if you ask me. No one's asking you. The old argument sounds even more hollow than usual, doesn't it, Frank? You're not getting anywhere with Aunt Leona. And you wish she were out of your way. You can't help thinking how pleasant your situation would be if something happened to her. You'd have everything you wanted. You could square yourself with Dino and have all you'd ever need besides. And there isn't much time, is there, Frank? Dino's given you ten days. You can't stall much longer. Later that day, you seek out the only solace these last few months have offered. Adele Richards, lovely, beautiful. You could marry her if you could support her. Couldn't you, Frank? She's a stubborn old woman. Fleming's outfit has bought up most of the other houses along the street, but she won't sell. She's going to put up an office building eventually. You probably want to sell that. Sure, sure, when it's too late. Uh, old Cappy had the right idea. Cappy? Captain Hackett, Aunt Leona's husband. Oh, he up and left about eight years ago. Went out one night for some pipe tobacco. 
And so he said. Never came back. I don't blame him. But then he had some money. He could afford to run. I can't. You want to run, Frank? From her and from that infernal old house, yes. From you, darling, never. <laughs> oh, Frank. Oh, great. Don't answer it. Hey, silly, I have to. Oh. Yes. Uh, yes, he's here. I'll call him. It's for you, Frank. Hmm? It's Dina de Costa. He knows you're here. Okay. Hello, Dino. I thought I might catch you at your girlfriend's. I was reading the papers, Frank. That was a dumb thing to do. What was? Setting fire to your house. You're nuts. No, no, Dino, you're wrong. I didn't do Sure you did, and it didn't work. Just wanted you to know. A bum angle, Frank. I don't like it. What difference does it make to you what I do to settle with you? I don't like strings on anything that's mine. That five grand you owe me. I want it on time, but I want it clean. Remember that, Frank. Hello? Hello? Uh, oh, Frank, what is it? Nothing. Oh, Frank. I'm, I'm sorry, honey. I've got a lot on my mind. Something to do with gambling and Dino de Costa. That's obvious. What is it? It's. Well, might as well know. I'm in the Dino for five thousand dollars. Frank. I've got to get hold of the money some way. Well, Frank, why don't you go to your aunt? Tell her everything. She'll, She'll blow her stack. You don't know Aunt Leona Adele. If I did that, she'd cut me out of her will. Everything. No. I'll have to get the money for Dino. Some other way. Yes, Frank, some other way. And the time is short, very short. It's ironic, isn't it? All Hackett House isn't worth much to anybody except Aunt Leona and Mr. Fleming, who wants very much to buy it. You could settle your debt with Dino if she'd agree to take Mr. Fleming's offer. That night after Leona retires... You're groping for a solution when the phone rings. Hello. Mr. Hackett, uh, John Fleming. Oh, oh yes, Mr. Fleming. Hope it's not too late to bother you, but about the house, have you talked it out with your aunt? Why, no. That is, I have talked to her, Mr. Fleming, and, well, she's weakening, but... Nothing definite yet, though. Nothing settled, eh? Well, no. Well, you know how it is, living there so long, she's pretty attached to the place. I know, but we can't stall this thing indefinitely... I wish you'd get a decision soon. Oh, I will, sir. Very soon. And it's going to be a favorable one, I'm sure. She is weakening. Good. We'll talk again soon, then, eh? You wish it were true, don't you, Frank? That there was even a slight sign of Aunt Leona weakening in her stand against selling the house. The next morning, you decide to bring the subject up once more. When, as you step out into the yard, you hear voices raised angrily. Aunt Leona's voice, and the voice of old Bozen Pete, an old friend, former shipmate of Captain Hackett, who now does odd jobs about the place. Oh, Miss, my rose bed, my favorite rose bed. And what do you do? Neglect it? Ignore it? Oh, the soil's been worked to death there, Miss Hackett. Best thing to do is rip all them prickly old scrags out of there. Don't you dare talk that way about my roses. Your roses, your house. Don't you ever think of anything of anybody else's? Like my patience? It wears my thin around you, miss. I want to tell you right here. Now, look here, bosun. If you don't enjoy the way I do things, you don't have to stay around, you know. All right. I will quit, and with pleasure. Goodbye to you, Miss Leone. Oh, and Leona. Oh, Frank. Well, I suppose you heard. Who didn't? Well, the neighbors must have heard you, too. Aunt Leona, you can't send that old gent away. Can't I? Cap Hackett said he was to have a place here as long as he wished it. Captain Hackett's been gone over seven years, Frank. I'd say that makes him legally dead. And dead people don't dictate to me. Nor live ones either. <laughs> Some 
something in Aunt Leona's manner has suddenly set you to wondering. Wondering if the rose bed might hold a grim secret of your aunt's. Perhaps even the secret of her husband's strange disappearance. And you're determined to find out. At dinner that night, you ask her an important question. Uh, this weekend, Aunt Leona, going to Glendale as usual? Cousin Ellie? Hmm, thought I might. Why? Well, nothing. Just wondered. Huh. If I do go, I hope I can trust you to remain in the premises and look after the place better than last time. Oh, of course you can, Aunt Leona. I'll look after the place very well this time. Tonight, I'm predicting again. This time, a sight you're going to see oftener and oftener as the days grow warmer. Overheated cars parked at the side of the road to let their steaming radiators cool off. To make sure this annoying occurrence doesn't mar your summer driving fun, signal service stations are now ready to serve you with these useful little items to rejuvenate your cooling system. Radiator cleaner to remove clogging scale, sludge, and rust. Rust preventive to protect radiators of old cars or new ones from further corrosion. Radiator sealer that stops small leaks in a jiffy. Plus new fan belts and radiator hose in case yours need replacing. And these, mind you, are just five items from your signal dealer's complete line of recognized quality motoring needs, which include Lee tires, nationally advertised brands of spark plugs and windshield wiper blades, plus many others. So when you drive into a signal dealer's to fill up with the famous Go Farther gasoline, remember he's also headquarters for a complete line of fine accessories and services to help your car run better, look better, and last longer. It's a hunch, isn't it, Frank? A growing belief, and quite possibly something that will help you considerably in your contest with Aunt Leona. It's far more than a test of individual wills, isn't it, Frank? The days are slipping by, and Dino da Costa will collect your gambling debt with him one way or another. And now with your aunt spending the weekend in Glendale, giving you some time alone on the premises, another more promising thought has entered your head. That's why you set to work as soon as she's gone. Set to work digging into the rose bed. Digging deep. But all your efforts avail you exactly nothing. Only a ruined flower bed. And at work the following Monday, you get the angry phone call you expected. Frank? Frank, how could you? How could you allow that terrible man to take his revenge this way? Uh, terrible... Terrible man? Bosun Pete. He's dug up my rose bed, ruined it for good, and you let him do it, you, when you said you'd watch the place. Well, I'm sorry, Aunt Leona. I only left for a short time. I had no idea the Bosun would do such a thing. I'm going to get the police on him. Lieutenant Mullen. I'll report him to Lieutenant Mullen. <laughs> That evening, as you sit on the front porch of Hackett House with Aunt Leona, you're a little hesitant to bring up the matter of Mr. Fleming's offer, aren't you, Frank? Yes, because you know she's still upset about the rose beds. You're sitting back, puffing on a cigarette, trying to think of some way you can ease into the subject when... Someone's coming up the path, Frank. Hmm? Oh, yeah. Looks like Bosun. Bosun? Well, well, I've got something to say to him. Now, now, take it easy, Aunt Leona. I see from the looks of that walk, he's had a few beers. Uh, hello, Frank. Miss Leone. Well, you have a nerve coming back, showing your face around here after what you've done. What? What are you talking about? I'm talking about your tearing up my rose beds. Me? I didn't have nothing to do with them rose beds. I just come from my money. Your money? What money? You know what money. Long before Cappy went away, he said I should have part of his money when he died. Oh? 
Did he tell you that? He told you too, and you know it. Really? I don't seem to recall. Listen, Miss Leone, I'm warning you. I better get my money or you'll be sorry. Are you threatening me? Well, call her what you want. I'll get my money if I have to choke it out of you. Come on, Bosun. Let's take a walk. Don't let go, Frank. I ain't finished here yet. Yes, you are. Yeah. Come on. You lead him away, Frank. The Bosun shouting threats. Walk him down the street for several blocks to calm him down. Then you leave him. You feel sorry for the Bosun, don't you? But as you turn, start back for the house. He's quickly forgotten. You have other things in your mind. Dino, Aunt Leona, Adele. You haven't seen her in days, have you? Then as you reach the crest of the hill, sight Hackett House silhouetted against the sky, you stop. Suddenly an idea hits you. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Sure. Why didn't I think of that before? And Leona! And Leona! In the kitchen, Frank. Oh, Tea. You care no, for no, thanks. Look, I just got an idea, Aunt Leona. Cappy left you several lots up in Glendale, didn't he? Not far from Cousin Ellie's place? Yes, that's right. Aunt Leona, why couldn't we have the house move there? Just have it picked up, hauled away. Move? To the lots in Glendale. Why not, Aunt Leona? Why not? Why not, indeed? Hmm. It'd be nice being close to Ellie. Sure, sure it would. But wait, wouldn't it cost a bit of money? Oh, I don't know. Look... Let me talk to Fleming. Now, don't rush me into this, Frank. I want some time to think it over. Okay. Okay, you think it over. But I've got another idea. And I'm going to see Fleming about it first thing in the morning. Hello? Aunt Leona, I talked to Mr. Fleming this morning... And he called me back a few minutes ago. His company is willing to move the house for us. Stand all the expense. Oh, really, Frank? How about it? Do I tell him it's a deal? Well, all right, Frank. All right. Good. Now, listen. They're anxious to get on this thing right away, so you'd better scout around. See if you can find us another place to live for the time being. There's a cottage just round the corner from here and up the street. It's for rent. I saw it this morning. Check on it right away. I'll see you tonight, Aunt Leona. Mm -hmm. Hello, darling. Oh, Frank, where on earth have you been? Well, it's a long story, but I'll be... You're through talking, Frank. Well, go on, darling. But you'll fall. I'll... You hear me? Hang up. I'll call you later, Adele. But, Frank... Later, Adele. All right. What's the idea, Dino? I came to call. That's the idea. Was in your neighborhood, as the saying goes, and decided to drop in. You're not the social type, Dino. No, I ain't. So we won't visit very long. Five more days, Frank. Or are you keeping score, too? I know. And it looks good, Dino. I'm not so sure. Five days, Frank. That's all the time you got. I need to do myself. Bad. Five days. It's got to be. I'll try, Dino, but I, I can't... I'd do that, Frank, if I were you. Just as if your life depended on it. <laughs> Dino means business, doesn't he, Frank? Five more days and that's all. Somehow you manage to move yourself and Aunt Leona to the little cottage not far from Hackett House in two days' time. And then you go to Mr. Fleming's office to press for payment for your property. So any time your company wants to start moving the house is fine with us. Good, my boy, good. I'll file for the moving permit right away. Sometimes there are little delays in getting it and sometimes not. But we'll move the house as soon as we get the permits. <laughs> Well, as a matter of fact, Mr. Fleming, when you move the house is of no importance to me. I don't even want to hear about Hackett House until it's safely planted on those lots in Glendale. I'm, well, about the money for the property. Since Aunt Leon and I own the property jointly, can we each receive a check for half the total amount? Perfectly agreeable with us, and I should say... If there's some rush about it, our accounting department could get the checks out for you right away. Oh, fine, Mr. Fleming, fine. There is some rush about it. It 
It's a relief, isn't it, Frank? You leave Fleming's office fortified with two checks. One made out to Aunt Leona for her half. The other to you for exactly the amount you must pay Dino da Costa. $5,000, your half. All for Dino. You're glad you have the money for Dino. But after you pay him, you'll be no better off than you were before. Now you know you'll never be. Unless something happens to your Aunt Leona. As you walk along the busy downtown street, you suddenly see an old friend right in front of you. Well, Bolson, how are you? Oh, hello, Frank. Look, I've been wanting to get in touch with you. I, I wanted to... Well, ask Miss Leone to forgive me for the other night. Oh, forget it. I didn't mean to say all those things, but... Well, I kind of needed the money. Oh? Things pretty tough? Yeah, pretty tough. Well, I'll see what I can do, boss. Oh, would you, Frank? You know I didn't mean to harm her or nothing like Where that. Where are you staying? A Siemens Hotel. I'll get in touch. <laughs> You watch Bozen as he turns away, disappears into the noonday crowd. Now you know what you're going to do, don't you, Frank? The Bozen is your answer. Soon you'll have everything you want, including Adele. Yes, Bozen Pete has given the solution, hasn't he? That night, a little after midnight, you make it a point to run into another old friend, Lieutenant Mullen of the police department, on his way to work. And as the two of you stand and chat on the street corner... You managed to steer the conversation in the direction you wanted to go. Yeah, I was beginning to wonder about Bosun. Haven't seen him in the neighborhood for some time. Well, he's living downtown now, I understand. Uh, heard he had a run-in with your aunt, is that right? About the rose beds? Yeah. What a session it was. He'd been drinking. Well, I really don't think he meant what he said. Threatening her, you know. Really? Still, you can't be too sure. He's got quite a temper. And the gun. Mm, I didn't know that. Yes. But I I don't think you have to worry too much about the bosun. Oh, here comes my streetcar. I'll see you later, Mr. Hackett. Good night. Night, Lieutenant. You're pleased, aren't you, Frank? Satisfied with your meeting with Lieutenant Mullen. The following afternoon, you phone the Siemens Hotel... Ask Bozen to pick you up that night, drive you out to the cottage. You've made a decision, haven't you, Frank? Set your plan into motion. Your debt with Dino will be settled. And when it's all over, you won't have to share the money from the sale of Hackett House with anyone. And you'll have all your Aunt Leona's money besides. Late that night, you're waiting on a quiet side street for Bozen to pick you up. And finally, he rounds the corner and pulls up at the curb. Hello, Frank. Right on time, Bosun. Yeah. Shouldn't want to keep Leona waiting, you know. Sure she'll be up this late? Seems like a funny time of night. Oh, you're wrong, Bosun. The time's perfect. Just perfect for this. Ten minutes later, you're parked in front of the cottage, and you're wearing Bosun's pea jacket and cap. Bozen is out of sight, slumped down on the seat beside you, still unconscious. You glance at your watch, then slip out of the car and hurry quietly up to the porch of the cottage to wait. It'll all be over soon, won't it, Frank? Once you get away, you'll wreck the car. Bozen will be killed, and the murder weapon will be found in his pocket. You glance at your watch again, a little after twelve, and down the street. And you see him approaching you right on schedule. It's Lieutenant Mullen. Yes? Who is it? It's Frank. Well, Frank, did you forget your key? What in the world are you doing in the bosun's cap? What? As your Aunt Leona slumps to the floor, you whirl, run back to the car, jump inside. Through the rear view mirror, you can see Lieutenant Mullen running towards you. And as you put the car in gear, you let the bosun's cap fall to the street. <laughs> Bye-bye, Lieutenant. And thanks. Thanks for being right on time. Like a spare tire without air. 
That's just how much good an oil filter does your car when the filter cartridge inside is filled up with sludge and goo. It can no longer do the job it was put there to do. And what is that job? Well, for every one gallon of gasoline an engine uses, it sucks in up to 9,000 gallons of air. And air carries gritty dust which gets into the oil and has to be strained out by the oil filter. Also, tiny metal particles wearing off engine parts must be trapped by the oil filter so they won't act as an abrasive on other costly parts. In recognition of the importance of oil filters, signal dealers are this month joining in the national program of the Purolator Company to check the condition of oil filters. If he finds your filter cartridge too clogged to give your motor proper protection, your signal dealer can replace it with a genuine Purolator filter cartridge. After all, the best two ways we know to prevent engine wear are one, a good, clean oil filter, and two, a change to new Signal Premium, the heavy-duty type oil that reduces engine wear due to lubrication 50%. A crowd had gathered in the usually quiet side street on the fringe of downtown Los Angeles. Folk in excited whispers stared at the body on the sidewalk. A few feet away, Lieutenant Mullen stood by, puffing slowly on a cigarette, and his face wore a puzzled frown. Then another officer pushed his way through the crowd and joined him. Uh, this one dead, Lieutenant? Yeah. Name is Frank Hackett. He killed the old lady back there at the cottage? Uh-huh. Tried to make it look like Boson did it. Boson? The man Boson. over there in the Essex. How's he doing? Oh, he's finally coming around. Uh... How'd you nail this Hackett fellow? Saw him run out of the cottage his aunt had rented after I heard the shots. Thought at first it was Bolson the way he was dressed. I took off after him. I never caught him either, except that after he turned the corner, he had to abandon the car and go out on foot. That's when my bullet nailed him. Something go wrong with his car? No, the street was blocked. Blocked? Yeah. The movers were hauling a house away. It blocked the whole street. Hackett here couldn't drive the car around it. Funny thing, too. It was his home they were moving. Hackett House. Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at this same time. And before you start your vacation trip, be sure to ask your signal dealer for a free copy of Lane's Guide, a booklet prepared by an independent travel organization to help you find good eating and lodging places. While no pocket-sized booklet can include all the good hotels, motels, and dining places, Lane's Guide covers a representative selection in hundreds of cities and towns, and a copy of this handy publication is yours free at Signal Stations. Featured in tonight's story were Bill Foreman, John Stevenson, Norma Varden, Gene Bates, Cliff Arquette, Herbert Rawlinson, Frank Richards, and Charles Seal. The Whistler was produced and directed by George W. Allen, with story by Adrian John Doe, music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. The Whistler is entirely fictional, and all characters portrayed on The Whistler are also fictional. Any similarity of names or resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Remember to tune in at the same time next Sunday when the Signal Oil Company will bring you another strange story by The Whistler. Marvin Miller speaking for the Signal Oil Company. Stay tuned now for our Miss Brooks starring Eve Arden, which follows immediately over most of these stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. And now, stay tuned for the mystery program that is unique among all mystery programs. Because even when you know who is guilty, you always receive a startling surprise at the final curtain. In the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. (laughs) 
Signal, the famous Go Farther Gasoline, invite you to sit back and enjoy another strange story by The Whistler. the whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now for the Signal Oil Company, the whistler's strange story, The Doctor's Wife. The Boston firm of Benneke and Woodruff, dealers in antiques, art objects, and rare books, has welcomed scholars and collectors into its long, narrow, and dimly lit showrooms for over 100 years. And since 1850, the same motto in neat gold letters on the plate glass window reads, A Firm of Integrity. But Charles Benneke, one of the present owners of Benneke and Woodruff, is too restless a man to follow in the traditional footsteps of his forebears. Even now, though his policies have brought the firm to the brink of disaster, Charles remains self-assured and unruffled. As he enters the showrooms late in the afternoon, walks back to the office of his partner, Paul Woodruff. Oh, there you are, Paul. Yes, here I am. Well, I did some good. Did you forge another letter by Keats, or was it Shakespeare this time? Lower your voice. What for? Because if I have to spend the next ten years in jail, I assure you, you will be in an adjoining cell. Thanks. Okay, what happened? They proved the Keats letter was a forgery. But they couldn't prove we, or should I say, I did it. But inasmuch as we guaranteed the letter in the bill of sale... Never mind the fine print. How much? Well, the judge awarded them $100,000. $100,000? You know what that means? We're through. Now, look, I told you five years ago when you started working in this dirty racket that I didn't want any part of it. But you never objected to sharing the profit. That's a lie. I objected then, I object now. I never wanted to get rich quick. Forget it. We've got to get busy. Oh? Doing what? Putting the stock up for auction and filing the bankruptcy papers? Not quite. I still have the genuine Tupo first edition of Bonelli's Fables locked away. Huntington Library offered $200,000 for mm-hmm. it. That was last month. They'll go even higher this month. I, I have a very unpleasant surprise for you. Another copy has turned up. Somebody was pulling your leg. Ours is the only copy in existence. Was. As you very well know, there were several copies turned out in the original printing. Another one has reared its ugly little head. Uh, the forgery. Yeah, sure, sure. That's the first thing you'd think of. Well, it's not. They did an infrared check on the watermark, and Huntington says it's an exact, exact duplicate of ours. Unmarked, perfect in every respect. Original Italian version, Bonelli's Fables, F. Tupo Press, first known printing, issued February 13th, 1485, complete with the woodcut borders. Do you, uh, do you want any more? Who has it? Elkin Arthur, London, is the agent for the book, but is still in possession of the guy who discovered it, Dr. Roger Brookhurst, lives in some London suburb. What do they want for it? Elk and Arthur figures they can swing the deal for around $50,000. Ridiculously low. We have to get hold of that book. <laughs> How? Even if we had $50,000, which we don't, thanks to you, Huntington already has an option on it. You seem rather pleased about the whole thing. As a matter of fact, I am. Even if I have to lose my shirt, at least I'll be through with you and your shady deals. Not just yet. I'm leaving town for a month, possibly longer. You'll remain in charge of the shop until I get back. Oh? Who says I will? I needn't remind you that in the eyes of the law, you're quite as involved in the so-called shady deals as I am. I would strongly urge you to remain at your post until I return. Where are you going? London, of course. And I'm not coming back until I get that other copy of Bonelli's Fables. Three days later, you're aboard a World Airline Clipper, completing your trip across the Atlantic, aren't you, Charles? You lose no time sightseeing in London, do you? And after finding yourself in a quiet, fashionable apartment, 
you immediately put through a call to Dr. Roger Brookhurst. Hello? Dr. Brookhurst's office? It's Dr. Brookhurst's residence. I'd like to make an appointment to see him. The doctor's no longer receiving patients. Oh, well, I'm not sick. I wish to see the doctor on a business matter of extreme urgency. I'm afraid Dr. Brookhurst will be unable Oh, please. To... I've come all the way from America to see him. I'll do my best. I can't promise anything, but you may call at the house tomorrow at four. Won't you come in? Thank you. Oh, excuse me. This is Gerald Kimberley, Dr. Brooker's secretary, and... Charles Benneke. Pete, I'm sure. Uh, forgive me, Yvonne. My head is splitting... I must be going. I'm sorry I'll about... I'll take care of it, Gerald. Don't worry. Well, then, goodbye, Yvonne. And good day to you, sir. Good day. Are you the doctor's daughter? <laughs> I'm his wife, but that is a compliment. Oh, the truth. Are all Americans like you? <laughs> In the presence of a beautiful woman. <laughs> In that case, I had better take you upstairs to see Roger immediately. Well, if you insist... I uh, want to warn you. He's been an invalid for some time. Stomach disorder. It makes him very short-tempered. Mm, I understand. Oh, Roger, the gentleman who phoned is here. Oh, yes, the American. Show him in. How do you do, Doctor? Uh, not very well. Sorry. Well, sir, what is this urgent business that brings you to my door? Your copy of Bonelli's Fables. You see... No, I don't. Now, look here, sir. I don't care if you came all the way from the North Pole. I have had quite enough of book buyers, book sellers, and book traders. My agent is Elkins Arthur, 84 Charing Cross Road. Consult him if you care to, but kindly leave me and my household alone. Well, I did tell you... Oh, no fault of yours. I try not to judge him, but... Cooped up with him day in and day out. Well, it's, it's just... Can't you ever get away? Oh, I can occasionally, but it's no fun by yourself. Well, uh, why don't you let me... Oh, no. I, I didn't mean to hint. After all, you're a complete stranger. All the more reason. Someone has to show me around London. I couldn't. Oh, nonsense. You can and you will. Let me take you out dancing somewhere after dinner tomorrow night. You can get away, can't you? Easily. Do you really want to? Oh, very much. Well, all right, I'll do it. Thank you. And I'm certain that neither of us will regret your decision. Yvonne. You know, the sound effects they use for radio are mighty interesting. For instance, supposing I were to broadcast that message you see on Signal's cartoon billboards. Next time, go farther with Signal. Well, if I said that same thing over a filter microphone, here's how it would sound. Next time, go farther with Signal. On the other hand, through the echo chamber, it sounds like this. Next time, go farther with Signal. But really, friends, the important thing is not how you say something, but what you say. And the important thing to you drivers is that from Canada to Mexico, Signal has become famous as the go-farther gasoline. After all, in order to give you such good mileage, today's Signal has to help your engine run more efficiently. And when your engine runs more efficiently, naturally you also enjoy quicker starting, peppier pickup, smoother power, more of the things that make driving more fun. So to be sure of both driving economy and driving pleasure, just be sure to fill up next time at a signal station and next time go farther with signal. It looked very bad when you first arrived in London. With Dr. Roger Brookhurst, the owner of the only other first edition of Bonelli's Fables, in very ill health and equally ill nature, it seemed as if you'd be completely unable to talk him out of his copy of the book. 
which you must have to ensure the value of the one which you and your partner in America now possess. But the doctor's wife is going to make a difference, isn't she? You two get along beautifully the first night that you take her out, don't you? Dining in a secluded restaurant, dancing after her. And then a romantic stroll along the Thames. You don't even mention the precious book until you're riding home together in a cab. I don't know when I've enjoyed myself so much. Oh, it has been a splendid evening. You know, I can't see how a woman of your beauty endures that... I don't say it. I am married to Roger and... It's not his fault. Well, all the same, I... I... don't want to think about it. <laughs> very well. Oh, this evening has been very strange. I feel as though I'd known you for years. And I've missed you for years. Charles, I... I... What are you trying to say? Nothing. Let's keep it light and gay. <laughs> all right. Let's discuss the subject you've avoided all evening. <laughs> I can't think of any. Remember I came to London to get my hands on a rare book? Oh, that. Yeah? How do you know I haven't taken you out for a purpose? I have had fun just the same. <laughs> oh, you little idiot. <laughs> Tell me, has your husband told you anything about the value of his Bonelli's fable? No, oh, he never discusses business affairs with me. It's worth quite a lot of money, you know. Really? Yes. As much as 10,000 American dollars. That much? Honestly? That's right. <laughs> You see Yvonne the next Friday, and then the weekend after that. You're sure she's in love with you, Charles, and you're sure she loathes her husband. But you have to find a way of bringing it out into the open, of taking advantage of it to get that book. Luck is with you there, isn't it, Charles? For on Wednesday evening, as you walk hand in hand down a quiet lane, Yvonne turns to you. You won't think I'm vicious, Charles, if I... If I... I know you're not. It's about Roger. I can't stand it another minute. Day in, day out, jailed in that old house with that nagging invalid. I, I, I'm sorry it's not his fault. But you can't help what you feel. It's true, I can't. I'm young and I want to taste life. Of course you do. Do you care anything about me at all, Charles? Don't lie or pretend, please. I love you, Yvonne. You're not just saying that to get hold of that old book, are you, Charles? Well, Yvonne, the book is important to me. I'm short of cash at the moment, and the client I represent will give me a handsome bonus for getting it, but, well, it has nothing to do with my love for you. You don't have to explain. Oh, darling, what can we do? Why don't you take the confounded book and run off with me? The devil take it off. I want to. I wish I could. Well, why can't you? The scandal would kill my family. Well, sometimes, Yvonne, we have... No, Charles, it won't work. There must be some other way. If I could get a divorce, I... Oh, well, that's impossible, isn't it? Under the circumstances, yes. But you've got to help me, Charles. There is another way. What do you mean? It could be done quickly, safely... No one would be the wiser. No, no, Charles. Your husband is in a great deal of pain, Yvonne. No, not murder. Don't forget I mentioned it. Perhaps we'd better say goodbye. No. I... Wait. How... How would you... We do it if we decided to do it? I... Uh, I assume Roger uses sleeping pills. Yes. Uh, a few extra in his glass of milk or tea... And, and it would be all over. Yes. Roger could leave a short note behind, explaining why he did it. Oh, but his handwriting. I've spent a good part of my life studying original manuscripts and letters. I'm something of an expert on handwriting. I see. Oh, but I'm afraid, Charles. I'm very afraid. Come here, darling. Please hold me close, Charles. Hold me tight. A few days later, Charles, as you sit in your lounging jacket reading a French novel, the phone rings. Oh. Uh, hello? Charles? Yes? Can you come tonight? What time? Eight. All right. Don't have the cab stop in front of the house. No, of course not. Be sure 
sure no one sees you. I'll take every precaution. Eight, then. Eight. I was afraid you wouldn't come. You know I wouldn't let you down. Did you get everything? Yes, in here. Mm-hmm. These are his letters? Yes, and they're recent, too. Good. Here's his pen. Hmm. Is this his usual stationery? Yes. Let me do a little practicing on this scratch pad. Huh? Yvonne? Yvonne? Uh, yes? Uh, yes, Roger? Is there anyone down there in the sitting room with you? Uh, not really, Roger. Not, not really? Now, what does that mean? Is there anyone down there or not? I, I heard voices. Uh, uh, only a neighbor. Well, what does he want? Just to borrow a copy of the Times. Oh, very well. But you might tell your neighbor that subscriptions are available at the Strand. Yes, Roger. And bring up my tea, please. In a moment. Now. I, uh, maybe we shouldn't go through with it. Slip the sleeping tablets into the tea. What about the note? Are you sure? It'll be perfect. All right, then. Yvonne! Yvonne! Coming, Roger! <laughs> Drinking the tea now. The note? Oh, Jim. How's this? I've been a burden on my wife long enough. Forgive me. Roger Brookhurst, M.D. Good. Charles, perhaps you'd better keep away until after the funeral and the inquest. Yes, of course. I'll miss you, darling. I'll miss you too, Charles. I uh, hate to bring this up at a time like this, but we must be practical. Yes. Perhaps I ought to sell the book for you immediately... You'll need ready cash for the funeral expenses. Oh, no, and... Charles. They might ask about it at the inquest. Give me a week. Certainly, darling. Shall we arrange for a place to meet? What about our pub off Piccadilly Circus? Uh, just the place. A week from today. Four o'clock be all right? Yes. Anything else? No. I only hope I can stand the ordeal. When it gets bad, think of us in America, married, happy, together. I will. And now... Upstairs. Do you suppose he's... Yes, yes. We'd better have a look. The days that follow seem endless, don't they, Charles? You scan every edition of the newspaper. But all you find are short paragraphs in the back pages stating the simple facts of Roger's death. You fight to keep from phoning Yvonne, and the week finally passes. You find yourself at last in the pub off Piccadilly Circus for the four o'clock appointment with her. You wait for her nervously, and suddenly she's there, sitting down beside you in a black gown. Charles, I don't dare stay very long, but it is good to see you. Oh, yes. Everything go all right, Yvonne? Yes. Nothing suspicious at the inquest? Nothing. Ah, good. Did you bring the book? No. Well, why didn't you? I got a sharp cablegram from my client, and I'll need his bonus to book passage for the both of us. Well, I, I, I couldn't help it. There were a million details tomorrow, Charles, I promise. Well, I'll meet you in the morning. You better make it afternoon. Why? Well, because, silly, the book is in the Bank of London, and I have to get all sorts of papers signed and sealed, proving I'm me and that Roger was my husband and that I have a right to his bank vault. Uh, all right. At three, the Bank of London. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry. I'll see you tomorrow. You're not cross with me? No. You still love me? Oh, you know I do. Three. Bank of London. You feel much better, don't you, Charles? You're certain that tomorrow afternoon you'll have your hands on the only other original printing of Bonelli's Fable. You feel a little sad about poor Ivan. But you don't let it bother you too much. You leave the pub and walk to the World Airlines office. Can I be of service, sir? I wish to book passage back to America, Boston. Oh, yes, sir. We have a flight leaving tomorrow night at nine. I'll take it. Uh, how many in your party? Uh, one. As uh, you're about to moment, get your sir. ticket, 
You yes, suddenly hear a familiar voice from another ticket window close by. Two for Paris. Yes, they'll do. I'm in a hurry. Here. You can only catch a glimpse of her back, but you're sure it's Yvonne. Your ticket, sir? Hold it for me. But, sir, I'll I... be back. You rush out after her, but she disappears into a waiting car and drives off. Desperately, you look up and down the street. Cabby! Cabby! Off in Yank. Bromley suburb. And step on it. Number and street, if you don't mind. I'll sir. show you. Get going. You have the driver let you off a block before Yvonne's house and walk the rest of the way. As you approach, you see Gerald Kimberly, the late Dr. Brookhurst's secretary, drive off in a roadster loaded with suitcases. You're afraid you're too late, aren't you, Charles, as you rush inside the Brookhurst residence. Gerald, darling, is that you? I'm in here. The rest of the bags are packed. I'm getting the book out of the safe. Hello, Yvonne. Charles. Surprised? Yes. I didn't think you could do a thing like this after all we went through. Didn't you know? I thought that lady loved me. No crocodile tears, Charles. I was on to your game from the first. What do you mean, game? Oh, oh, come off it, Charles. Imagine trying to tell me the book was worth $10,000 when poor Roger was giving it away at $50,000. You knew. All the time, you knew. What did you take me for anyway, an innocent little fool? Well, now you know much better. I'll take that book. Oh, no, you won't. You'll get out of here. Gerald and I are going away together. And if I have any more difficulties from you, I shall call the police. You wouldn't dare. Why not? As I remember it, you forged a suicide note. I... Uh, listen, Yvonne. <laughs> this is wrong. I... I love you, Yvonne. Don't lie. Besides, if it were true, it would do you little good. Gerald and I have been in love for years, but... he couldn't bring himself to do away with Roger. So that's why you let me... You used me. That's right. I'll take that book, Yvonne. No, you won't. I let go of me. I... Oh. Too bad, Yvonne. You could at least have had your life. And Gerald. Cats, which are said to have nine lives, were once used as a basis of comparison for things which are supposed to last a long while. But today, pussy is a piker compared with the new Lee Super Deluxe tires. Here's what I mean. For extra long mileage, Lee toughens long-wearing cold rubber still further with patented high abrasive Phil Black O. And for extra safety, extra protection against blowouts or road hazards, Lee reinforces the carcass with double life rayon cord. No wonder Lee of Conshohocken, for half a century maker of first line tires, dares to back these famous nationally advertised new Lees with a double guarantee. Guaranteed for life against defective workmanship and materials. Guaranteed 15 months against all road hazards. When you consider that Lee charges nothing extra for all this extra quality, and dealers are now giving generous trade and allowances on old tires, you can see why more and more drivers who want to be prepared for what's ahead are going to signal stations and Lee Tire dealers for the tire with nine lives. Lee Tires. It was over quickly, wasn't it, Charles? With Yvonne dead, you were able to take the book, dispose of your gun, and leave the house without being seen. Then you hurry to the transatlantic telephone, talk to your partner in Boston, give him some hurried instructions. You're certain you can expect a visit from the police, probably soon. And after talking with your partner, you're sure you're prepared for them, aren't you? Yes. You own an identical copy of the book. It's a matter of public record in book catalogs throughout the world. You're sure all you have to do is say that this is your copy of Benelli's Fables. Both volumes are identical, aren't they? Even the printing errors, the flaws in the lithography. And no one can know that your copy of Benelli's Fables is locked in the safe of your office in America. It's a risk, but only a slight one which you will have to take. You jump at the sound of a knock on the door. 
You wonder if it can be the police so soon. Quickly, you slip the stolen book from your briefcase and put it in the desk drawer and lock it. Coming. Coming. Yes? Who are you? I'm Inspector Kramer of Scotland Yard. May we come in? Oh, please do. Sorry for the delay. It's quite all right. And, sir, I am here about a murder. Murder? Yvonne Brookhurst was found shot to death two hours ago. Oh, I... I... Oh, this, this is a shock. Rare volume was stolen by the murderer. Uh, Bonelli's Fables. Yes, yes. Uh, we understand from Mr. Gerald Kimberley that you were most anxious to get the book. I certainly was. Uh-huh. It's an original edition. I have the only other copy. I have it with me, as a matter of fact. Our ownership is a matter of official record, if you care to investigate. Mm. Uh, How do you happen to bring your copy with you, as valuable as it is? Oh, with both copies in my possession, I could ask and get any price for either. Or both. I'd hope to sell them, either here or at home. Yes, and it still seems strange... You're more than welcome to communicate with my partner in the States, Inspector. He'll verify everything I've told you. The fact that this is our copy, the reasons why I brought it with you. Yes, yes, we may get around to that. Meantime, um, may I see your copy? Yes, of course. Here you are, Inspector. It's interesting. Tell me, are you familiar with the book at all? Oh, certainly. Mm -hmm. I read it twice a year. It gives me a chance to brush up on my Italian. (laughs) Good. Are there any identifying marks in the book? Uh, Let's see. Uh, Yes, it it turned to page 32, last line. Mm -hmm. Uh, Capital letter is missing on the first word. Uh, Any others? Mm -hmm. The, uh, The donkey, beautiful woodcut on the margin of page 50. Yes? The donkey's eye is missing. Mm hmm. Mr. Benecke, I shall have to arrest you for the murder of Yvonne Brookhurst. This is not your copy of the book, it's the Brookhurst copy. What do you mean, Inspector? What I said. You've never read this book, nor has anyone else. The two pages you mentioned are still uncut. Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at this same time. Meantime, Signal Oil Company and the friendly independent dealers who help you go farther with Signal Gasoline hope you'll remember. Regardless of what gasoline you use, you'll enjoy more miles of happy driving if you drive at sensible speeds, obey traffic regulations, and avoid taking chances. You may even save a life, possibly your own. Featured in tonight's story were Bill Foreman as the Whistler, Les Tremaine, Alice Reinhardt, John Daner, Herb Rawlinson, and Donald Morrison. The Whistler was produced and directed by George W. Allen with story by Meyer Dolinsky, music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. The Whistler was entirely fictional, and all characters portrayed on the Whistler are also fictional. Any similarity of names or resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Remember to tune in at this same time next Sunday when the Signal Oil Company will bring you another strange story by the Whistler entitled Man on the Run, in which a killer takes dangerous and breathtaking chances in an attempt to elude pursuit. Marvin Miller speaking for the Signal Oil Company. This is the CBS Radio Network. Signal gasoline. Let every traffic signal remind you, you do go farther with signal gasoline. Yes, you do go farther with signal. The Signal Oil Company and your neighborhood signal dealer bring you another curious story by The Whistler. Tonight, what makes a murderer?
I am the Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Murder is a peculiar affair. All it needs in many cases is the right pressure, the right set of circumstances, the right opportunity. And an otherwise respectable member of the community becomes a killer. If you tried to explain that to Arthur Winslow, he wouldn't have understood. If you told him he was in a fair way to become a murderer in a few months, he would have looked at you strangely. For Arthur was respectable, solid, exactly like a hundred thousand other respectable, solid Jersey commuters. His life was a pretty drab affair. Part of it was the office, J. Simmons and Company, American investment Farm brokers. American Farm, light seven and an eighth, no change. Seven and an eighth, no change. American Tell and Tell, 179 and an eighth, off an eighth. AT&T, 179 and an eighth. Off an eight. American Tobacco, 77, up one. 77, up one. Uh, better leave it there, Arthur. Five o'clock. Got to make that 519. Why? Uh, hmm? Why do we have to make the 519, Stanley? Why? Why, Arthur, because we always do. Why is that a good reason? What? I mean, do you think because we've always made the 519 that we ought to keep on making it the rest of our lives? Is, is something wrong, Arthur? Uh, maybe, I don't know. I've been thinking, Stanley. Hmm? For ten years now, you and I have been analyzing investment securities eight hours a day, catching the 519 every night, arriving home in East Orange promptly at 622, kissing our wives at approximately 650, eating dinner at exactly 7, reading the evening paper, and then going to bed. Well? Well, it's a little like... like death, isn't it, Stanley? What in the world gotten into you, Arthur? I've got a book here. Hey, hey, take a look. Book? It's a novel. Got me to thinking. Moon and sixpence. <laughs> it's about a man like us, Stanley. Mm -hmm. A man who got fed up with the 519 and dished the whole works. Well, what did he do? He took a chance. He walked out, just picked up his hat, and went off to the South Sea. You mean he he just left his family? Mm. They preferred the 519. Huh. Well, I can't say that I approve. No, I didn't think you would. Well, you better hurry along, Stanley. You'll miss your train. Yes, but what about you? Well, tonight, just for a change, I believe I'll catch the 555. <laughs> just for a change, Arthur, after ten years. You walk slowly down Broad Street, deliberately casual, noticing the swarms of hurrying commuters objectively, as if for the first time. It's pleasant strolling along like this, taking your time, stopping to look in a window now and then. Finally, you stop at a cigar stand. Have you, uh, you got a pack of cigarettes? Well, if you can smoke them. <laughs> yeah, here, 18 cents. Hmm? 25 and 50. Thanks. Yeah. Say, uh, uh, what's that back there? Oh, you interested in the uh, bang tails? Huh? Bang tails. Horses. Opening up Pimlico tomorrow. Hey, uh, come here. Sure. Now, there's the board. Take your pick. Current art in this car. Huh. Pink Lady. Mike the Third. Big Bonanza. Moon and Sixpence. Hey, what's that? Uh, uh, moon and Sixpence. Top horse in a parlay. Don't know nothing about them, though. Parley, what's that? You, you don't know what a parley is? No, I don't. Oh. Well, okay. Well, in that parley there, you got three horses, see? Yeah. Now, you put your dough on Blue Bonnet in the first. Uh. If he comes in, the dough goes on Glow Worm in the second. If he comes in, the works rides on Moon and Sixpence in the third. Get it? We interrupt this program. The B-29s are back in the war. The super fortresses, which have been the major factor in bringing Japan to her knees these past few weeks, have dropped high explosive and incendiary bombs 
on the Marisu Railroad Yard, the first purely rail target to be hit in Japan. There was no Jap fighter or flak opposition. It was the first heavy bombing Japan has received since last Saturday, the 11th. And during the three days that the very heavy bombers have rested at their bases, the diplomats have taken over to consider Japan's reluctant offer to surrender. However, the diplomats haven't done so well. If the tension here in the Pacific is any standard of judgment, the Japs have succeeded in conducting a fairly effective war of nerves against us by their failure to reply to the Allies. So now, General Spot's strategic bombers are back over Japan dropping explosive reminders to the Nipponese people they had better surrender or else. It is a feeling here that the super forts were sent to Japan as an allied prod for Hirohito and his ministers to make up their minds. If they don't, Japan can ex expect more of the same treatment. As a matter of fact, today's bombing is continuing right now. More and more bombers are over the Jap homeland, and the bombs away signal will come back to Guam many more times today. The Marifu rail yards and shops were hit by the 313th wing of the 20th Air Force, based on Tinian. Three B-29 groups planted the area with high explosive bombs. The rail yards form one of the most critical bottlenecks in the Japanese railroad system, serving the double trunk rail line that runs from Tokyo to Kobe and along the inland sea of Japan. Interruption of traffic on this line will first of all affect the Jap oil supply, and more important, it will affect the critical Jap food shortage already desperate in Japan's big city. The strategic air forces are not playing tag in this operation. Japan right now is being hit and being hit hard. The process will continue until we receive that notification of unconditional surrender, or wrest it from the hands of the emperor himself when we take his imperial castle in Japan itself. If they want it that way, that's the way they're going to get it. And this is Bill Downs and Guam returning you to CBS. But that's almost a year's salary, and you're holding it right in your hand. You just walk the streets for an hour or two, thinking, gradually realizing what happened. It can mean a new car, new dresses for Ethel, and more of the same. Or it can mean... Yes, Arthur, if you took a chance. It's crazy, it's wild. But if you act before you think... You walk into a phone booth in the financial center lobby. <coughs> The South Seas. No more figures. No more 519. Uh, hello? Brighton Travel Agency? I, uh, I'd like to uh, inquire about a reservation to, um, let's see, uh, uh, to Florida. Yeah. The name? Oh, yes, the name is uh, uh, Charles White. <laughs> There's good news for drivers in recent announcements that new cars are already in production. But there's bad news in the statement of Defense Transportation Director J. Monroe Johnson that it will be at least three years before all the people who want new cars can get them. Three more years. That's a long time to make today's cars last, especially when the average car is already seven years old. It means that now more than ever, your car needs the more thorough, more conscientious kind of service you'll find at Signal gasoline dealers. Yes, there's a very real difference in Signal service, and for two good reasons. You see, being in business for themselves, Signal dealers have made car care their specialty. They're experienced. They know cars. And two, because independent Signal dealers are in that business not just for today, but permanently. They're eager to please you so well, you come back regularly and be their steady customer. Added up, that assures you the kind of service that will keep your car happy and you satisfied. The kind of service that makes it well worth your while, getting acquainted with your neighborhood signal gasoline dealer. And now, back to the Whistler. Murder can strike anywhere, even among quiet, drab little people like Arthur Winslow. He has no way of knowing it, of course, as he buys a first-class reservation on the train to Florida. 
His only thought now is that this will be escape at last. New clothes, new luggage, a new name, and a new life. No 519 tonight, Arthur. It's the 730 to Florida and Waypoint. Oh, uh, which way is the dining car, waiter? Yeah, the three cars back. Oh, thank Better you. Better hurry along. Yes. Okay. Oh! Oh, oh I'm sorry. Oh, that's, that's quite all right. It isn't either. I wasn't looking. Well, neither was I. Where is it? Uh, what? The book. Book? Book? Oh, yes, the book. I knocked I... it out of your hand. It must be down here on the floor. Oh, here, let me. It's probably down under the no, seat. No, let, let me see. I can... Oh, oh I bumped my head. Oh, <laughs> Look at the gum under here. <laughs> ah! Did you get it? Last year's timetable. I've wanted one for ages. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, wait a minute. There it is. Where? To the right, just a little under the seat. Here, let me... No, let me get it, please. Uh, here we are. It's a fine thing getting yourself all dusty that way. Uh, uh, turn around. Oh, thanks. <laughs> hmm, moon and sixpence. There we are. That's a little better anyway. Wonderful, isn't it? Hmm? Moon and sixpence. I loved it. Oh, yes. I haven't quite finished it, of course. Do you believe it? I mean... Do you think it's right? You mean to toss everything over and take off to the South Sea? Uh, if you don't mind, pal, while you're going to the South Seas, I'll go to dinner. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. Excuse me. <laughs> we seem to be holding up traffic. We do, don't we? <laughs> Matter of fact, I was just going into dinner myself. <laughs> so was I. Uh, well, would you consider... Why not? Yes, yeah, why not? <laughs> I think Moon and Sixpence was a wonderful story. Of course, I can't say it was very realistic. Well, what do you mean? Well, I admit it was convincing, but when you stop to think about it, this, um, this running away business... Oh, you you don't believe in it, huh? Well, after all, running away is no solution. Well, sometimes there's uh, nothing else to do. He could have stuck it out. You mean licked it if it took the rest of his life? Yes. Well, all right. All right, he licked it. He found happiness at last, and he's 70. Mm-hmm. Is that all there is to life? Well, I haven't seen too much of it yet. I know it sounds cowardly, but I think there are times when sticking it out for 20 years is wrong. Time doesn't wait, you know. We we beat our heads against a wall day in, day out. We're tied down to a deadly routine. And then the first thing you know, it's too late. No, I, I, I think running away is better than that, don't you? I did once. Oh, uh. Sorry, I didn't mean to. Oh, that's all right. That's quite all right. You see, I did run away. It was just as you said. It was routine, a deadly routine. And when I couldn't stand it any longer, I ran away. Well, what kind of routine was it? Well, perhaps you've heard of my father, Edgar Brewster. Edgar Brewster? Uh Uh-huh. He's in Miami Beach now, waiting for me. Oh, I see. I'd finally decided to go back and face it, but, uh... Oh, dear. Now you've got me confused again. Oh, I'm sorry if I'd known I... Oh, don't misunderstand. You've really helped me a lot. How do you mean? Well, you seem to know why I did it. It's a kind of uh, moral support. Oh. You're going to Miami? Yes. Uh, oh, by the way, I'm I'm Charles White. I'm Vivian Brewster. Well, perhaps uh, perhaps I'll see you in Miami, huh? I hope so. Yeah, so do I. The daughter of Edgar Brewster. It's fantastic, isn't it, Arthur? You talked with her, had dinner with her. She even said she hoped you'd meet in Miami. But the first week goes by in the hotel set on the shore looking across Biscayne Bay. It's beautiful. But you aren't conscious of anything except Vivian. You wait for a call, but it doesn't come. You begin to realize how ridiculous it is. Of course, she's forgotten about you. You were just someone to talk to, a traveling companion. You can't hide the Jersey commuter under that Palm Beach suit. And then... Hello? Oh, hello. I, I'd like to speak to Miss Vivian Brewster. Speaking? Oh, uh, <laughs> this is Charles White. Well, hello, Mr. White. <laughs> I thought you'd forgotten me by this time. Oh, no, not at all. Uh, <laughs> I, I thought uh, we might have a, a drink together or something. Well, why don't you come out? You mean to your house? Uh-huh, of course. Father would love to meet you. Your father? Yes. What about it? When? Oh, tonight. Huh. 
All right, tonight. Well, Arthur, you can hardly believe it, can you? A few days ago, an obscure clerk. Today, sitting with Edgar Brewster, drinking his bourbon. That about right, Mr. White? Oh, there's a tightwad with this soda. <laughs> Outrageous way to treat good bourbon. What about it, White? Oh, that looks about right, Mr. Brewster. Yeah, there you are. Oh, thank you. What are you doing in Miami, White? Why, I, uh, I just got a little tired of New York. Yeah, you get the right idea. I did the same thing myself 20 years ago. I never went back. What's your line? Uh... Well, I I was in the, the market, more or less. Yeah, the less, the better these days. Nobody knows where it's going. Hard to figure these war babies. My broker and I were talking today about consolidated plastics. Know anything about it? Yes, a little. What do you think of it? Well, I don't know whether I should say or What's not. What's the matter with it? After all, it's your business, Mr. Brewster. I don't think I'd get off an opinion. Oh, all right, I'll put it this way. What would you do if you were into it pretty heavily right now. Well, I'd sell out. When? Right now. Any particular reason? Only that I happen to know that stock is being manipulated by a, an inside ring, that it'll take the Securities and Exchange Commission about six months to catch up with them. Boy, that's unbelievable. My uh, broker told... I know, it's, it's only my opinion, Mr. Brewster, but I happen to know that company's financial position. <laughs> you, you asked me what I'd do, and I just told you. You seem to know what you're talking about. Investments are my uh, hobby, you might say. I see. May I say something now? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, dear. I forgot you were still with us. I thought so. <laughs> well, now that you've settled the stock market problem, suppose we get down to the club. The water should be beautiful tonight. What about it? <laughs> oh, I'm afraid it's past my bedtime, dear. You two run along. No place for an old duck like me, anyhow. <laughs> well, Mr. White... Well, Miss Brewster? Oh, what are you waiting for? Get out of here. I'm going to bed. <laughs> and that was the beginning, wasn't it, Arthur? That $1,800 was a magic door opening up a thrilling new life for you. And incidentally, bringing you closer to murder. The next three weeks passed like a dream. More nights at the beach club, dancing in the open under the stars, with Vivian in your arms. Vivian? Yes? Vivian, why, why is it you've never asked me about myself, my, my background, where I came from? Oh, I don't know. Maybe because it doesn't matter. You know, I, I wasn't going to tell you, but I think perhaps I, I'd better. Will it make any difference? About us? Yes. Uh-huh. Yes, it will make a difference. It'll make a lot of difference. Well, then don't tell me. I really don't want to know. No, but Vivian, you... Please. Oh, darling. Darling, did I ever tell you I... I like you very much. I'm glad, Charles. I'm so glad. You were in love, Arthur, and for the first time in your life, you knew what it really was. Mr. Brewster began to concern you. He'd never approve in a million years. Or you thought so until that evening he dropped up to your hotel room with a copy of the financial journal in his hand. Look at that, Charles. Oh, well, what is it? Don't ask silly questions. Look at it, man. Hmm. I thought so. Consolidated plastic snowed under in selling rush. Sorry, Mr. Brewster. I am not. Oh, what do you mean? I took your advice. Sold out three weeks ago. I saved myself a hundred thousand dollars. Well, congratulations. Don't congratulate me. You're the one who deserves it. Uh, you might if I sit down. Oh, of course not. Here, here you are. Yeah, thank you. Uh, would you be open to a proposition, White? What kind of proposition? Oh, I realize you probably have other interests, but uh, I could make it worth your while. I think. There are two considerations. Yes. The first is the plain fact that my affairs are getting a little beyond me. As you know, I'm retired and haven't time to look after them properly. I think you're the man to take over. But, Mr. Brewster, I... I'm a businessman. If it weren't a profitable deal for me, I wouldn't think of it. 
I, I see. What's the uh, other consideration? I believe you're aware of that already. Vivian, you uh, approve? I do. <laughs> uh, may I have time to think this over? Of course. Just let me know in a day or so. There it is, Arthur, brief and to the point. Everything you ever wanted right in the palm of your hand. Open sesame, he said, and there it was. You go into the bar downstairs to think. There's only one thing in your way now, Ethel. You can't run away from that. You've got to make her see your side of it. You've got to go back to her and face it. Make her give you a divorce. You walk out of the bar, through the door, into the hotel lobby. And just as you're rounding the corner by the desk, something stops you in your tracks. This is Ethel Winslow, 5769 Laurel Road, East Orange, New Jersey. Is that all you want? Thank you, madam. Uh... Could I see the register, please? Oh, I'm sorry, madam, but we don't... Well, I, I understand there's a Charles White registered here. Charles White? Oh, yes, madam. Uh, room 132. Uh, is he a friend? Uh, yes. Uh, will this help? Oh, well, in that case, I, I, uh, I could give you room 131 next door. The windows open onto the same balcony. Oh, uh, very well. Uh, 131. <laughs> It was too good to last, Arthur. Just a beautiful dream, and you're just waking up. It's all over. Go back in the bar and think. Ethel, your wife, here. She's found you. And she'll never let you go, will she? You know her too well, Arthur. Cold, calculating, heartless. She'd laugh at you, wouldn't she? Yes, sir. Will it be? Bourbon, straight, right. Uh, just leave the bottle. You're beginning to see now, Arthur, what makes a murderer. You couldn't get away from her. Just as Vivian said, you can't solve anything by running away. All you get is a build-up to nothing. Whatever made you think you could talk her into a divorce? There's no other way out, is there, Arthur? You sit in the friendly darkness of the bar all afternoon, late into the evening, thinking, thinking. It's almost 11 when you make up your mind. There's a phone booth near the door. Hello? Hello. Hello, Vivian. Vivian, I have to talk to you. It's important. Why, Charles, what's the matter? Never mind. Just listen to me, Vivian. Just listen. I'm a phony. M my name is Arthur Winslow. I was running away when you met me on the train. I'm just an investment clerk. I have no money. I have nothing. Just $1,800 I won in a horse race. Listen, Vivian, I got a wife in East Orange, New Jersey. I've hated her for 10 years. I'd rather be dead than go back to her. I'm not going back to her. I I'm telling you this, Vivian, because I love you more than I ever dreamed I, I could love anyone. And I, I probably won't ever see you again. Goodbye, baby. Eleven o'clock, Arthur. You've got it all planned. Ethel is asleep in her room, room 131. A balcony connected with yours. It's easy, isn't it, Arthur? Yes, there she is. And she's asleep. You take a firm hold on the heavy brass candlestick you picked up from the mantel in your room. A blunt instrument, the police will say. You can hardly breathe, Arthur. Your stomach is full of ice water. You feel your heart's going to burst. Careful, Arthur. Careful. Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending of tonight's story. Meantime, a word about teeth and tires. They have a good deal in common, you know. For the good of your teeth, you see your dentist twice a year so he can catch small cavities before they grow big and endanger the tooth. 
And for the good of your tires, it's equally important to have your signal gasoline dealer inspect them regularly. So any small injuries can be repaired before they spread and ruin the carcass. Or so he can warn you before your tread is worn too thin for proper retreading. You'll find your signal gasoline dealer is completely equipped to give you the finest in modern tire repair, whether it's a small patch or a full recap. For those friendly dealers displaying Signal's yellow and black circle sign are much more than just a place to get Signal Go Farther gasoline and find Signal Double Check Lubrication. Each Signal dealer offers a complete line of automotive services and fine accessories to help your car run better, look better, and last longer. And now, back to the Whistler. <laughs> No, Arthur, when the cards were down, you couldn't do it. The wife you hated for ten years at your mercy, and you couldn't do it. But you came close enough to see what makes a murderer. And now you're standing over her. I can't. I, I can't do it. Oh, Arthur. I'm, I'm sorry, Ethel. I, I'm sorry I woke you up. Well, turn the light on. Don't stand there. Yes, Ethel. Oh, hand me my other slipper. Yes, Ethel. Well, you thought you could get by with it, didn't you? No, no, Ethel, I, I, I didn't. Don't deny it. I know what's been going on, and I can prove it, you, you philanderer. Ethel, I tell you, I... What, what did you say? Well, I have a complete report on your activities for the last month. You weren't very clever, Arthur. The detectives say you left a trail a child could follow. What are you getting at, Ethel? No. Listen, there's someone knocking on your door. A woman. Ethel, come back. Where are you going? This door, Miss Brewster. Oh, oh Vivian. A pretty picture. And you have the crust to ask me what I'm getting at. I've known about Miss Brewster all along. In fact, we've had a little talk. And for your information, Arthur, I'm leaving for Reno in the morning. In view of what's happening, I don't think you'll feel it's wise to contest the case. Contest it? We've waited five years for a chance like this. We? Mr. Dinwiddie and I? Miss, Mr. Dinwiddie. <laughs> Mr. Dinwiddie. <laughs> Arthur, what in the world were you doing with that brass candlestick? Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. This program directed by George W. Allen with tonight's story by Everett Tomlinson and Harold Swanton, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is Marvin Miller speaking suggesting that you let every traffic signal remind you that you do go farther with signal gasoline. Yes, you do go farther with signal. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. And now, stay tuned for the program that has rated tops in popularity for a longer period of time than any other West Coast program in radio history. The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. Signal, the famous go-farther gasoline invites you to sit back and enjoy another strange story by The Whistler. I 
am the whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now for the Signal Oil Company, the Whistler's strange story. She never would be missed. Mona had determined that her parting from her husband, Gerald Stanton, was to be gay and, as she put it, civilized. There were to be no tears to mar Mona's beauty, no tiresome recriminations. Best of all, Gerald had understood her perfectly. He had seemed to realize at once why she preferred Vincent, why the divorce was so very necessary to her. And now there was nothing more for Mona to do other than wait for train time, check on the few last-minute details with her maid. Oh, Lucille, did the man come for my luggage? He just left, madame. You made it clear that I wanted to arrive in Reno the same time I do. Yes, and I phoned for a cab. It will be right here. Oh, you're an angel, Lucille. You've been so good through all this. You don't know what it means to find someone who's charming after so many years of... So many years of what, my dear? Gerald. Gerald, what are you doing here? I thought you'd gone to your club. I came back because I have something to say to you. I'll uh, watch for your cab, madame. Thank you, Lucille. Mona, I want you to give up this foolish idea. Give it up? That's absurd. Everything's settled. You agree. I didn't know until today just whom I was being divorced for. You've always known it was Vincent. We've never made any secret of it. But I knew nothing about him. He's no good, Mona. I can understand your thinking so. It isn't just me. Do you realize he's been thrown out of every decent club in San Francisco? Why, no respectable society will tolerate him. You think you'll be happy married to that? I've never been able to understand your reverence for what you call respectability. He's a bounder, Mona. A cheat. Everything that's rotten. In short, a juicy topic for a club full of old men. It always comes back to that, doesn't it? You're young and I'm old. It's time we faced it, don't you think? Mona, believe me, if it were anyone else, I'd let you go. No protest. But this Carter, for your own sake, I beg you not to give up everything for him. I love Vincent and he loves me. You can protest or not as you like. I could make it very disagreeable, Mona, for both of you. Of course you could. Get into all the papers, too. But I don't think you will. Where would your respectability be then? I think I lost it, Mona, when I married you. Your cab is here, Mrs. Stanton. I'll be right down, Lucille. Goodbye, Gerald. Uh, One thing more, Mona. I'm going to revise our little agreement. There will be no property settlement. Ah. Now we come to the heart of the interview. If you leave here, you'll get nothing more from me. Vincent has enough for us both. Yes, it'd better be a lot. You're rather expensive. I expect to be well fixed. If he marries you. (laughs) Don't worry, Gerald, he will. Well, that's fair enough. Fair enough, Mona. You deserve each other. Number 32, right here. Thank you. Say goodbye to me now, Vincent. I can't bear these prolonged farewells. Darling, here's something to remember me by. What is it? Open it and see. Vincent, what a perfectly stunning ring. Mm, You like it? It's been in the family for ages. Oh, Vincent, I do love you so. Wire me when it's over and I'll meet you here at the station. Oh, no, darling, not at the station. I want to look my very best when I see you. Can't we make... How about where we always meet? Pietro's for lunch. One o'clock the day you get back. One. And you'd better be wearing that ring. <laughs> You'll see me flashing blocks away. Oh, 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 there it is, darling. I've got to run. Goodbye, Angel. I'll be living for our lunch at Pietro's, darling. The goodbyes are over, aren't they, Mona? And you're on your way, alone on the train. Only the memory of Vincent's flashing smile to comfort you to help you fight down any doubts, any misgivings that Gerald tried to plant in your mind. It's going to be all right, isn't it, Mona? Yes. You tell yourself that over and over again. But in the weeks you spend at Reno, you get few letters from Vincent. And then, none at all. And then at last, you return to San Francisco. Hurry to Pietro's, where you wait again. 
Because Vincent isn't there. You're terribly alone until... Pietro? Pietro? What is it, madame? I... Oh, Mrs. Stanton, I didn't see you come in. Welcome back. Pietro, for heaven's sakes, where is Vincent? When did you get back? Just this morning. Please, Pietro, where is he? Mr. Carter? I haven't seen him. He was to meet me here at one o'clock. I've called his apartment everywhere. I can't find him. What's happened? I'm afraid I don't know. Oh, that's nonsense. You know everything, Pietro. There's something you're not telling me. I'm sorry, Mrs. Stanton. Uh, now, if you excuse no, me. No, I won't excuse you. Pietro, come back here. I want to talk to you. You're getting a little shrill, darling. You better take it easy. Oh, Blanche Fontaine, thank goodness for a friendly face. Maybe you'll tell me what this is all about. Well, I won't pretend I don't know what you mean, because I do. What is it? What's happened to Vincent? Not here. Everybody's watching us. Come on. Where are we going? To my apartment. We can talk there. Now, Blanche, please. I said we'd talk in my apartment. Now, come on. I know how you feel, Mona, but a lot can happen in six weeks, and... Well, it has. Oh, I can't believe it, Blanche. Who is this other woman? Alice Phillips. Alice? Do you mean Vincent has thrown me over for that washed-out society, bud? I'll admit she is a pale one, but her family, my dear. Main line, old guard, and oh, so respectable. Respectable? Oh, this is too much. Well, it shouldn't surprise you. Vincent's always been a perfect sucker for that sort of thing. But he can't. He's going to marry me. I have his ring. Darling, what's a ring when he can marry a Phillips? This is the top for him. Big stuff. He'll never let that go. I think you're cruel to say things like that. I face facts, Mona, and so must you. Now, forget it. Go away for a while. Pull yourself together. Exit gracefully, you mean? You can go up to my lodge if you like. You'll be alone there, miles from everywhere. It'll give you time to get hold of yourself. Vincent loves me. I've given up everything for him. Husband, money, everything. I'll find him and talk to him. He'll say it isn't true. All right, darling. Have it your way. I will. You'll see. It can't be said that you didn't try, can it, Mona? Your efforts during the next few days to find Vincent may well become legendary in the lush circles you inhabit. You phone his apartment, his friends, all the possible nightclubs, but he's never there. You write him notes and long, pleading letters, but they remain unanswered. And still you refuse to accept the obvious. Finally, one afternoon at the cocktail hour, you catch him at Pietro's. He's as handsome as ever, but you're forced to see that things aren't the same now. Vincent has changed. Yes, I heard you were trying to reach me, Mona, but I really wish you wouldn't. It's rather awkward under the circumstances. Vincent, what are the circumstances? Oh, we know each other too well to pretend ignorance. Then it is true. Alice Phillips. Vincent, you can't do this to me. Well, nobody's done anything, Mona. It simply happened. And so I'm to be brushed off just like that. We should be grateful we found out before it was too late. Late? Do you realize what I've lost on your account? Well, that was your doing, Mona, not mine. Oh, you're contemptible. <laughs> just honest. Vincent, you don't love her. You couldn't. You love me. And it's all right, darling. I, I know these things happen sometimes, and I'm willing to forget it. Perhaps you, you haven't understood me, Mona. This isn't just a temporary romance. I'm going to marry Alice. Vincent! Which reminds me, darling, I'd like to have my ring back, if you don't mind. It's a rather good one, you know, sort of heirloom. And I think Alice... Your should... ring, indeed. Oh, you! Just try and get it. All right, Mona. But you can get out of my life and stay out. Mrs. Stanton, please, I'll have to ask Oh, you get to... away, Pietro. Wouldn't you like me to call you again? Get away, I said. Take your hands off of me. Mona, for heaven's sake, control yourself. You're making a spent. Control yourself, he says. Oh, that's good. That's very good. And quit hounding me or you'll force me to do something unpleasant. Come, come, Mrs. Stanton. Let go of me. This way, please. You'll never marry her, Vincent Carter. Not while I live. I'll kill you first. I swear it, I'll kill you. Next weekend, before you start off on your Labor Day trip, wouldn't it add a lot to your peace of mind to know that no matter how hard you may drive, no matter how high the thermometer may soar, your motor is protected by an oil that won't break down under heat, an oil that won't let unnecessary wear rob your car of its pep and power and turn it into an oil eater. Then this week is the time to change to new Signal Premium. The wonderful new signal motor oil that reduces engine wear due to lubrication 50%. In addition to providing the finest of lubrication, 
New Signal Premium protects your motor in four important extra ways. One controls harmful engine deposits such as carbon, gum, and varnish. Two keeps oil rings clean and free. Three keeps hydraulic valve lifters from sticking. Four stops acid corrosion and rust. Get all this extra protection of heavy-duty type Signal Premium is yours at no increase in price at Signal Stations. So if you want to save money and your car too, get your motor oil changed to new Signal Premium before your Labor Day trip. Get it changed at a signal service station. Well, Mona, you sensed it for weeks, that something was wrong that Vincent Carter had changed his mind about you after you've divorced your husband to marry him. And now, meeting him face to face, you've heard from his own lips that he intended to marry someone else, Alice Phillips. And your own words, angry, excited words, run through your mind to mock and torture you. Your threat to kill him. Yet you've been able to do nothing, nothing at all, except run to your friend, Blanche Fontaine, and pour out your heart. Oh, Blanche, it was so humiliating. And on top of that, to be thrown out. What am I going to do? I've told you, Mona. Go away somewhere by yourself and get over it. <sighs> go up to my lodge, darling. I'm running over to London for a few weeks. I shan't be using it. I've lost everything because of him. How could he do this to me? Why not? He's done it to every woman he's ever known. I wish I could hurt him as he's hurt me. You can't. It doesn't work that way with Vincent. When he's through, he's through. And like the old song, they never would be missed. They never would be missed. Here now. In case you decide to be sensible, here are my keys to the lodge. You'll be alone there. It's miles from everywhere. Nobody has to know anything about it. Oh, you're very kind, Blanche. No foe, nothing. It'll be good for you. The larder's well stocked. You'll make out. I'll make out better right here. I'm leaving tomorrow, so if you decide to use the lodge, go on up. Just stay as long as you like. Blanche, if you think I'm just going to leave town quietly and sneak up to your lodge and let Vincent Carter That's get... That's the sensible thing to do, and you should begin to use your head. I'll use my head, but I won't use your lodge. <laughs> Suit yourself. But in case you change your mind, I'll leave you the keys. Goodbye, darling. I'll call you as soon as I'm back. Have a nice trip, Blanche. Oh, Vincent, you fool. Here's one who's going to be missed. It's a vicious plan, isn't it, Mona? But you've decided, yes, to disappear suddenly and without explanation. You'll do it in such a way that Vincent Carter will be blamed for your disappearance. You're certain that the publicity, the suspicions in his direction will cause the ultra-respectable Alice Phillips to break off her engagement to him. And once that happens, you're certain you can win him back. And you're certain your plan will work, aren't you? Only Blanche knows that you know of the existence of the lodge, and you've told her you weren't going to use it. You're sure she'll be on the high seas bound for London and will learn nothing until her return. The next day... A phone call to Vincent is your first move in working him into your little scheme. I don't know what possessed me, Vincent. I was I was dreadful, and I'm terribly sorry. Oh, it's all right, Mona. Alice is a lovely girl, and I think she ought to have the ring. But you mean you'll give it back? Of course. Come over and have a drink with me. Show me there are no hard feelings. I'll give it to you then. Well, you're all right, Mona. I'll come by. Just for a minute. Done and done, darling. See you. Uh, Lucille? Yes, madame? I'll be dining out, Lucille. Fetch me something to wear and hurry. Mr. Carter's coming right away. Mr. Carter? Yes, he just called, asked me to have dinner. But uh, you think you should? Why not? If he wants me back, I'm quite willing. But, Mrs. Stanton, how do you know that's what he wants? How do you what? know it isn't... What do you mean, Lucille? Well... He called here yesterday when you were out, and, oh, he said dreadful things. He said that if you didn't quit bothering him, he would do something drastic. I didn't tell you that, because oh, but... I've... 
That was yesterday, Lucille. Uh, <laughs> oh, don't worry, I can handle him. Oh, I hope so, madame. But, Lucille, please don't tell anyone who I'm with. I, I promised Vincent he doesn't want it known yet. Oh, I don't like it, madame. I don't like it at all. Nonsense. Come on, help me get ready. He'll be here. You've been very decent, Mona. Thanks awfully. Well, after all, darling, when I have a ring, I want a man to go with it. <laughs> have another drink? Uh, no, thanks. I'd better run along. Must you? I was rather hoping you'd let me take you to dinner, a sort of farewell. Oh, I'm afraid... It's a divine little place just out of town. Very quiet. Nobody'd know. You're very persuasive. For old times' sake. We can take my car. What do you say? All right. I, I'd rather like to. It's all so easy, isn't it, Mona? You go downstairs with him. Make sure the doorman sees you drive off together in your car. The dinner at the obscure country inn goes pleasantly, with Vincent obviously relieved at your show of goodwill. By the time you drop him off at his apartment, he's forgotten the past unpleasantness between you. Here you are, darling, right to your door. Go straight to bed now. Oh, I will. I will. I'm tired. Au revoir. It's been fun, Mona. Fun's just beginning, darling, for both of us. And now, Mona, the easy four-hour drive to the lodge, where you run your car out of sight behind some trees. Then settle down amid the comforting simplicity of oil lamps and wood fires, certain that the mechanics of your scheme are going successfully. Yes, you were last seen with Vincent, and your disappearance is complete. The news breaks even sooner than you expected, and you walk down behind the clump of trees to listen to your car radio and the news reports. San Francisco police were still continuing their questioning today concerning the sudden and unusual disappearance of Mrs. Mona Stanton. The maid stated emphatically that her employer had no intention of taking a trip and expressed the possibility of foul play. Police are dissatisfied with the explanations of one Vincent Carter, former fiancé of the missing woman. It's perfect, isn't it, Mona? And the following day, the reports are even more exciting. Until finally, the one thing you most wanted to hear. In the case of Mrs. Mona Stanton, missing for the past five days, socialite Alice Phillips flew to Santa Barbara tonight, accompanied by her mother. Sources close to Miss Phillips indicate that she has broken her engagement to Vincent Carter, material witness and principal suspect in the mysterious Stanton disappearance. And now for some other coast news. <laughs> So she wouldn't stick by you, Vincent, eh? Too respectable. You've won, haven't you, Mona? You tell yourself over and over again you've won. Vincent has been humbled, Alice driven away. You can return to him now, take him back on your own terms. And then as you finish packing for the trip back to the city and close your suitcase, you hear a car approaching the lodge. Only one person knows you're here, Mona. Just one. Blanche. It has to be Blanche. She's bringing the police. I've got to get out of here. It's all clear to you, isn't it, Mona? Blanche must have heard of your disappearance before she embarked for London, changed her plans, and hurried back to San Francisco to investigate. You've got to hurry and get away. You race for the rear door to the cabin, and a lamp crashes to the floor as you swing the door wide open, Mona. But you're not stopping for anything like that now. No. You race to the clump of trees in your car... Your only chance to get away without being seen is the old river road. You noticed it while walking one day. Now it's got to provide your escape. Your heart pounds as you release the brake. Let your car coast silently down this back road. A mile from the lodge, you risk starting the engine. It's all right, isn't it, Mona? You got away. And exactly four hours later, you're walking in on Vincent at his apartment. Mona! Had enough, Vincent, darling. I could disappear again, you know. Uh, come in. 
Come in, Mona. Ready to listen to reason, I take it. Mm, it's close in here, darling. Untidy, too. <laughs> but you don't look too dapper yourself. <laughs> what do you mean, Mona? What do I mean? You asked me up, didn't you? You've had your fun. Why bother to come back at all? I want a husband, darling, and security. I want you. Security? <laughs> you don't have to lock the door. I shan't run away so long as you're reasonable. That's right, Mona. You won't run away. Ever. Vincent, what are you doing? You've had your little joke. Now I'll have mine. Oh, come now, darling. Put it down. You don't deserve to live. I said put the gun down, Vincent. Keep away. Come on, give it to me. Let go, Mona. Let go, I say. <laughs> <laughs> Why, you little... High heels can be rather painful, can't they, Vincent? Now our places are reversed. You're the one who doesn't deserve to live. Well, I, I, I was only trying to scare you, Mona. I, I wouldn't have killed then you. Then you shouldn't have let go of the gun when I kicked you, because I am going to kill you. No, no, no please, Mona. Wait a minute. Why should I? After wrecking my life and tossing me aside as if I were a casual pickup, you were going to kill me. I'm just turning the tables on you, that's all. <laughs> You stand there, Mona, terrified at what you've done. The revolver you wrested from Vincent still smoking in your hand. Then, as the paralysis of shock subsides, you begin to realize your own danger. You've killed a man, Mona, and your feelings about him are well known. It comes back to you in your own words, shouted publicly that day at Pietro's. You'll never marry her, Vincent Carter. I'll kill you first. And now you have killed him, haven't you, Mona? And who's going to believe that you didn't intend to? Suddenly, you lean down, quickly press the gun into Vincent's hand, smooth over the evidence of the struggle, and slip out of the apartment. Within a half hour, you're at police headquarters, telling a plausible story to the lieutenant in charge. You see, lieutenant, I'd gone up to the lodge for a complete rest, so I hadn't even heard a radio until a few hours ago. I happened to turn on the six o'clock news, and then it appeared, but naturally, I came back at once. I see. I'm afraid it's been a pretty serious mistake all around. Oh, it's dreadful. You'll have to let Vincent know immediately. Oh, I, uh, I'm afraid it's too late, Mrs. Stanton. What? The report just came in. Vincent Carter shot himself not more than half hour ago. He... Oh, no. Steady, Mrs. No. Stanton. Steady. It's all my fault. If I hadn't gone away... Well, I wouldn't say that. You didn't know. Oh, what shall I do if only I hadn't Best let... Best thing is to go home and try to get some rest. Oh, I couldn't. Not now. Not when... Try, Tony... though, will you? It's too bad, but you're not to blame. All right, Lieutenant. I... I... Next weekend, when you start off on your Labor Day trip, it'll be mighty handy to have a good map in your car. And there's no map handier than the free ones you'll find at Signal Service Station. No need to squint to find where you're going on a Signal map. They're jumbo size for quick, easy reading. And no need to wrestle with them, getting them open or folded again. Signal maps have the latest accordion fold for more convenient handling. But that's only the beginning. In addition, signal maps contain a guide to interesting places to visit, plus a traveler's radio guide so you can follow your favorite programs as you travel, plus enlarged sections of metropolitan areas. And if you happen to need a street map to guide you in the larger cities of the Pacific Coast states, signal stations have them free too. In fact, whether you need a free map, some helpful advice, or just a tank full of the famous Go Farther gasoline, you'll find that friendly, independently operated signal stations have just about everything it takes to make your driving over Labor Day or any day more pleasant. It's a shock, isn't it, Mona? Your disappearing act had unexpected results. Vincent is dead now. Dead, the police believe, by his own hand. It appears that you had nothing to do with it because of your story that you were in your car at the time, driving back from the lodge to save Vincent from the suspicion that he had done away with you. And they can only think of you as an innocent figure in a comedy of misinterpretation. The next day, the police lieutenant comes to your apartment. Confidently, you answer his questions with your usual inventive. I told you all I can, Lieutenant. I, I left the lodge right after the 6 o'clock news broadcast. When I heard on the new newscast that Vincent was being blamed for my disappearance, I went back to town. But what difference does it make now? Because, Mrs. Stanton, Vincent Carter's death wasn't suicide. 
wasn't suicide. You mean Vincent was... Murdered, Mrs. Stanley. The angle of the bullet proves the shot couldn't have been fired by Mr. Carter. I see. But surely you don't suspect me. Yes, I'm afraid I do. You have the strongest motive in the world. I've learned a great deal about you since I last saw you, Mrs. Stanton. Mr. Carter broke up your marriage, then tossed you aside for another woman. But that was some time ago since then. At I... least two different people heard you threaten to kill him. But I told you that was... We've got a pretty strong case against you, Mrs. Stanton. A woman answering your description was seen leaving Carter's apartment building about the time of the murder. Possibly so, but it couldn't have been I. I was driving into town. Let me see. Now, um, as I understand it, it's an easy four-hour drive from the lodge into town, right? Yes. Now, you say you left there right after the 6 o'clock newscast. You didn't arrive at the precinct station until nearly 12. That's almost six hours. That leaves two hours to account for. That's plenty of time for you to kill Carter. Oh, well, I can explain that. You see, I went to the village first, had a little lunch before driving in, and since I didn't realize there was any rush, I ate rather leisurely. Then I decided to phone or wire or something, but changed my mind and drove on in. I see. Don't you have to pass the lodge? Why, yes. Then I'm afraid I'm going to have to arrest you in the charge of murder, Mrs. Stanton. But that's absurd. Why me? Because you're lying. You couldn't have passed that lodge. The road was blocked. The lodge was burning to the ground. Somebody was in a big hurry to get out of that lodge. In the rush, they knocked over an oil lamp. Oh, if only Blanche Fontaine hadn't driven up... Miss Fontaine's still in London. That car you heard was a couple of forest rangers. Lucky thing, they were in that neighborhood. We might have had a bad forest fight. Come along, Mrs. Stanton. Let's go down to headquarters. Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at this same time. Signal Oil Company has asked me to remind you that starting next Friday, heavy holiday-bound Labor Day traffic will make it even more important to drive at sensible speeds, be courteous, and obey traffic regulations. It may save a life, possibly your own. Featured in tonight's story were Bill Foreman, Alice Reinhardt, Les Tremaine, Joe Gilbert, Ted Von Els, and Bill Boucher. The Whistler was produced and directed by George W. Allen, with story by William Engvik and Cleo Davis, music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. The Whistler is entirely fictional, and all characters portrayed on The Whistler are also fictional. Any similarity of names or resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Remember to tune in at this same time next Sunday when the Signal Oil Company will bring you another strange story by The Whistler. Marvin Miller speaking for the Signal Oil Company. Stay tuned now for the Horace Height Show, which follows immediately over most of these stations. This is the CBS Radio Network. And now, stay tuned for the program that has rated tops in popularity for a longer period of time than any other West Coast program in radio history. The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. Signal, the famous go-farther gasoline, invites you to sit back and enjoy another strange story by The Whistler. I am the 
a whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now for the Signal Oil Company, the whistler's strange story, Night Flight. It was early evening, but the man sitting in the corner booth with Kelly Owen had entered the hotel cocktail lounge in the early afternoon, and he was beginning to show it. He'd taken a liking to Kelly when he found out that he, too, was a flyer. As for Kelly, he wasn't in a mood for liking anyone. But his present situation of unemployment made him more than mildly interested in what the stranger had to say. You even find yourself willing to gamble a bit, don't you, Kelly? Spend part of the few dollars in your pocket on more drinks in the hope that you'll pick up some profitable information. Uh, Tokyo? <laughs> If I ever made that hop, <laughs> pal, I've flown freight back and forth across the Pacific so many times, I think I could swim a load over on my back. <laughs> Here you are, gentlemen. One oh, straight yeah. bourbon and one scotch and soda. I swell, is it? It's a dollar thirteen. I get this one, Sam. Huh? Oh, thank you, sir. Hey, wait, hey, wait a minute. What'd you do that for? I told you old Sam had hit the jackpot. All right, skip it. Ollie, uh, uh, you, you didn't finish telling me, Sam, something about a private deal? <laughs> I, 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 I can't tell you everything, pal. It's too important. Yeah? Hush, hush, understand? <laughs> important passenger. Big. Oh, yeah. that's it, huh? Well, a big fare is nice, Sam, but yeah. not like what you were talking about. Not, not enough to retire on. Uh, I think not, huh? <laughs> Don't you think 25 Gs go pretty far? Don't you? Twenty-five thousand. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Sam, who do you know that's taking a private trip around the world? I don't know, and they don't know me. That's why you ain't gonna know me either. Nobody. Does, see? All right, Sam. Yeah. Sir. Talking too much. Ooh. I don't feel so good. A lot to drink. Yeah, you sure have. Hey, look, I, uh, I gotta go upstairs, see, to my room, pal. I gotta sleep it off. I can't. Can't fly no plane like this. <laughs> what you are, you can fly without a plane. Yeah. <laughs> you are, Sam. Yeah, Help you yeah, upstairs. Sure, yeah. <sighs> thanks, thanks. Oh, hey, hey, hey. You you tell the desk clerk for me, will you, huh? Go, go, go. Tell, tell him what? Yeah, you to call me about uh, about 10 o'clock. They're, they're picking me up here in a car. Huh? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. I'll tell him. Yeah. Come on upstairs. Yeah, you know, looks so good. Well, yeah. <laughs> Sounded interesting, didn't it, Kelly? $25,000, Sam said. And something about it being his payment for flying an important passenger somewhere. But all too vague to be of any use to a man in your position. By the time you help Sam upstairs to his room, lay him on the bed, he's fallen into a deep sleep. And instead of $25,000, you're thinking of the dollar thirty you spent, aren't you? A dollar thirty that might have gone towards a better hotel room for the night. And then you think of something else. Yes. You're helping yourself to the contents of Sam's wallet as the phone near the bed rings. Sam stirs restlessly and you lift the receiver quickly to prevent waking him. Mr. Ledford. Hello. Mr. Ledford, there's someone here to see you. Mr. Ledford? Someone here to see you. The words flash across your mind, don't they, Kelly? And you recall something that Sam said downstairs in the bar. I don't know him, he said. They don't know me. But it wasn't until 10 o'clock that the somebody was to meet Sam in the lobby. Was it, Kelly? Mr. Ledford? Mr. Ledford? Why don't you answer? Uh, hello? Oh, Mr. Ledford, there's someone waiting for you in the lobby. Should I tell the lady to come up? Uh, no, no, no. I'll tell the lady that, uh, that Sam Ledford... We'll be right down. Yes, sir. It's a chance, isn't it, Kelly? A chance you've decided to take. And with Sam Ledford's wallet, identification, and pilot's license in your coat pocket, you let yourself out of his room and go downstairs. There's a girl in the lobby, a dark-haired, very attractive girl. She's alone, waiting impatiently. Miss, uh, 
Miss Martin? Yes? You wanted Sam Ledford? And supposing I did? Well, uh, you don't have to look any further. Oh, well, I, I didn't realize. That's okay. I suppose you're ready, Sam. Oh, I didn't expect anybody until uh, 10 o'clock. <laughs> well, that's right. Well, um, quite frankly, when I talked to you on the telephone, you sounded like you just might be in the mood for too much celebrating, but... Uh... Oh, that's so? <laughs> that's why I came earlier, Sam. I know $10,000 is something to celebrate, but... You're uh, uh, awful little there, aren't you, Miss Martin? I understood I got 25000 for this job. <laughs> All right, Sam, so we won't bargain anymore. Not at this late date. Okay. You, uh, you won't mind leaving now, though. Anything you say, Miss Martin, now, later, you're running it. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm glad we understand each other. All right, Sam, there's a cab outside. Wait for me. I've got one quick call to make. Uh, wait in the cab. Okay, Miss Martin. Uh, you, you won't be long, will you? No, Sam, I won't be long. <laughs> You've a nervous, uncertain feeling inside, haven't you, Kelly? Miss Martin seems to have accepted you as Sam Ledford. But walking out to the taxi cab parked in front of the hotel, you wonder about her reference to a quick call. Wonder if perhaps the call is in some sort of a checkup with whoever made the original arrangements with the real Sam Ledford. But there's nothing to do but sweat it out, is there, Kelly? Play it close and careful for the biggest payoff you've ever gambled on. Ten minutes later, Miss Martin comes out. Flips into the cab beside you. Everything uh, all right? Yes, Sam, everything's fine. Know where we're heading now? Like I said, uh, you're running this. (laughs) (laughs) Sam, I think we're going to get along perfectly. Driver, the airport, please. You understand everything now, Sam. I think so. Be sure you rent at least a three-place ship and make certain of the fuel. You, uh, you haven't uh, told me yet exactly how far we're... Never mind. I'll tell you that part after we're in the air. Check. You're not coming with me? I'll wait here till you get the plane. Tell them you want it for a sightseeing hop over the city. Tell them I'm the girlfriend. The girlfriend, huh? Okay. going almost too well, isn't it, Kelly? Thela Martin is a warm, exciting girl, and the thought of $25,000 isn't exactly chilly. But you are nervous over what's just ahead, aren't you? The renting of the plane in Sam Ledford's name. It has to be done that way, just in case Thela should check at the last minute. You cross toward one of the rental hangars, hoping whoever's in charge doesn't know you or Sam Ledford. But nothing goes wrong. Twenty minutes later, you escort Thela from the cab to the warm-up apron, where a mechanic is readying a trim Fairchild job. Help Thela into the front seat. Step back as the mechanic finishes the warm-up. Nice clear night for sightseeing, hot miss. Hope you enjoy it. Thanks, I'm sure I will. You're in good hands, all right. Understand Sam Ledford's taking you up. Yes, that's right. You freeze at the mechanic's words, leap back toward the tail of the ship, trying to avoid him. Thela can't see either of you, can she, Kelly? But the mechanic is waiting between you and the door to the ship. Then in absolute desperation... Hey! Yeah? Isn't there something wrong with this tail assembly? Wrong? I don't think so, Mr. Ledford. Would you... Hey, what is this? You're not Mr. (laughs) Sorry, pal, but I got a date with 25,000 bucks. And nobody's getting in my way. I'm sure, friends, you're glad that although this is the season when so many popular shows go off the air for the summer, there'll be no vacation for the Whistler program. Thanks to your loyalty to the Whistler, which has made this the most popular West Coast program in radio history, plus your loyalty to Signal Dealers, which made this last year the greatest year in Signal history. Signal Oil Company is keeping the Whistler on the air all summer without interruption. 
So each Sunday evening throughout the summer, when you turn to this spot on your radio dial, you can depend on finding your favorite mystery. Just as each time you turn into a signal station, you can depend on finding a friendly, independent dealer to serve you with fine quality signal products, including the famous Go Farther gasoline. Signal, signal, signal gasoline. Your car will go far with Go Farther gasoline. You've managed every step, haven't you, Kelly? Every one since the telephone rang in the sleeping Sam Ledford's room. The moment when you decided to take his place with the unknown air passenger who would pay $25,000 for a single mysterious flight in a rented plane. The last step was a dangerous one, wasn't it? Knocking out the mechanic at the airport, a man who realized that you weren't Sam Ledford. But it's going to be all right, isn't it, Kelly? And as you level out high above the twinkling lights of the city, you glance over at Thela in the seat beside you. Well, Thela, you said once we were in the air. Yes, I know. All right, Sam, we fly almost due south to a spot near Rosarita Beach. Across the border? Yes. There's a landing strip there. We'll sit down and wait. Been a lot of waiting. You're getting a lot of money. Yes, I am. All right, Thela, settle back. Grab a few winks if you like. I'll wake you up at Rosarito Beach. Thela? I think they're here. Car just pulled off the highway. All right. Get back to the plane. If it's them, they'll flash the headlights off and on. I'm to answer with a flashlight. Check. Taylor? Yes? You're sure you don't want to tell me who this guy is? Use your head, Sam, if you want to keep it. We're across the border, aren't we? We're flying him back to the States in the dead of the night. Doesn't that say enough? $25,000 says enough. And by the way, we're not taking him back to that airport, you Of course know. not. We've got a spot all picked out on the desert. There's a car waiting, everything. Yeah. Everything. Even you. Skip it, man. And remember, not a word to him during the flight. Just keep your mind on your flying. Oh, sure. Oh, there go the car lights over there. Yes. Go on, Sam. Back to the plane. I'll answer them. Mr. Ledford. Wait. What for? I'm flying back with you. We'll return the plane. Yeah, but I got him into the States now. What about my money? You'll get your money, Mr. Ledford. Just do as you're told. But... I said do as you're told. What about this guy, Thela? Look, Nick, this plane has to go back and be set down from where it took off, and two sightseers have to get out of it. You don't want to leave any trace. Sure, sure. All right, flyboy. You wait for the lady, huh? Uh, look... I'd, I'd, I'd like to go into town for a little while. Why? I I didn't mention it, but I was having a little trouble. A fuel line. I'd, I'd feel safer if I could ride in and buy some stuff for it. What do you think, Thea? Is it necessary, Mr. Ledford? Very necessary, Mrs. Martin. The plane won't be safe otherwise. Oh, Nick, I'll be flying back with him. All right. So he goes into town. Come on. You had to think fast, didn't you, Kelly? You know you can't take the plane back to the airport where you picked it up, posing as Sam Ledford. The mechanic you knocked out will have revived, reported the theft. And yet they've told you that you won't get your money until the plane is returned. You need time, don't you, Kelly? Time to think it out, decide what to do. And as you sit beside Thela and the big guy, 
in a chauffeur-driven limousine that met you when you landed, a plan begins to take shape in your mind. In town, you go through the motions of buying what you need to repair the broken fuel line, and then wait as the big guy gets into the limousine and is driven off toward the highway. You get everything you needed, Sam? Oh, yeah, yeah, all set. Well, then we might as well get back to the plane. Oh, what's the hurry? We can take a cab back anytime we want. Yes, only I, I thought you'd be sort of anxious to take off. Oh, an hour or so won't make much difference. Yeah, I, I, I was uh, going to suggest we have dinner. Well, there's a spot down the street a few blocks. The Palm Inn. Well, what are we waiting for? <laughs> Sam. Yep. I've been wondering. If I was going to buy another brandy? Sure. Oh, no. no, I was wondering about that 25000 What are you going to do with it? Oh, I don't know. Got a girl? Nope. Why? Oh, I don't know. Don't you ever think of the cottage small, white picket fence, roses around the door? Quit kidding, sailor. Anyway, I'm not in the market for real estate. Yeah, so, uh, you're the big guy's girlfriend, huh? That's right, meaning... Nothing. All right, so he buys me everything I need. Well, have fun while you're young, I say. <laughs> you know something? I like you. I like you a lot, Eddie. Eddie? You're a little mixed up, aren't you? Eddie, Frank, Harry, Sam. What's the difference? What are you driving at, sweetheart? What is your name, really? Sam Ledford. Uh uh-uh. uh. You see, I closed this deal with Sam Ledford in person long before you showed up. Okay. So, where does that put us? It's up to you. You went along with a deal even though you knew I wasn't Ledford. I was in the market for a new pilot. Sam was too talkative. Besides, I like you. I like your nerves. Something for a girl to fall back on. Well, you're pretty okay in my book, uh... Kelly. First to last. Kelly Owen. Kelly Owen. I like that, too. Yeah, so let's get down to business. Now, let's start with my 25 grand. So I'm not Ledford, but I pull the job. I'm entitled to dough. Of course you are. And more. Oh? Uh, How would you like to split $100,000? A hundred grand? Sound interesting? Very, very. Tell me more. <laughs> uh, let's get back to the plane. You have work to do. Uh, work? The fuel line, remember? Oh, oh, sure, yeah. Uh, Kelly. Yeah, yeah. Was that fuel line really giving trouble? <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> All right, sweetheart, suppose you fill me in. The big guy was willing to spend 25 grand so long as he got back into the state. Yes, I know. Oh, I said to myself, why shouldn't little Sealer pick up that dough after the job was done? Ah, double cross. So you knock off the pilot, keep the dough yourself. Why not? Go on. Well, when I saw you, another idea occurred to me. A way we could both get more than the 25,000, and I'll need your help. My help, huh? Definitely. I knew that as soon as you walked up to me in that hotel lobby. What's the deal? Nasty word. Blackmail. Oh, real nasty. Mm. But keep talking. The big guy's in the States now, and he plans to stay. Only how much do you think it would be worth to him to keep the information from the police? You tell me. Another 75000 for a starter. So, how do we set this up? First, a little trip to South America for you. I always wanted to go there, too. I'll go on to join the big guy in New Orleans. He's rented a house there. 21 Rue St. Germain. And? And in about a month, he gets a letter from South America. Ah, the blackmail pitch. He pays off or else. I like blackmail by long distance. <laughs> Much healthier. <laughs> well, Kelly? Is it a deal? Yep. One more thing. How do I get to South America? Oh, 
that. Yeah, that. My 25 grand. I have it. You'll need, let's say, uh, 5,000 to get settled. You'll want a few thousand to spend, so I'll give you half now. 12,500. What about the other half? I'll hold on to it for the time being, just to be sure you don't double-cross me in South America. After you've clipped the big guy, we'll meet down there and... and... Well, you think you could stand to have me around, partner? (laughs) Oh, give me time, sweetheart. I just might go to love you. (laughs) (laughs) Flying north along the coast, your mind is spinning, isn't it, Kelly? There's $25,000 in Sela's suitcase. And there will be another $75,000 once you reach South America and send the blackmail letter to the big guy. 100000 in all, Kelly. That is, if Sela doesn't double-cross you. After all, she was willing to double-cross Sam, wasn't she? Yes. And you decide quietly not to take a chance on her, to follow through alone now, not share the money with anyone, not even Sela. Darling, do me a favor. Sure. You have to fly over the water. It makes me nervous. Oh, no, what's your diff? Land the water. If you fall, you fall hard. Oh, please. Relax, Sheila. Say, uh, h- how do we address the big guy in New Orleans again? Big Hugh, 21 Rue St. Germain. You won't forget it, will you, darling? No, no, I won't. Nick Hughes, 21 Rue St. Germain. No, I won't. Forget it! <laughs> Your fist lashes out, catches Thela on the point of the chin, and she slumps down in the seat. You reach over, open the door beside her. So long, sweetheart! It's over quickly, and you're alone in the plane with a full $25,000. You swing the nose around, head inland. And soon ease into a landing in an empty pasture not far from the highway. A truck driver gives you a lift into Los Angeles, where you spend the rest of the night in a quiet hotel. The following morning, you're downtown. First stop, the fashionable men's store. May I help you, sir? Yeah, shoot the works. I uh, beg your pardon? I tried out the best you got. Suits, sport outfits. I'm in the market for a complete wardrobe. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, This way. I'll need some luggage, too. That, uh, light airplane stuff. Of course. You were planning a trip? Yeah, uh, South America. Uh, by the way, where's the nearest airline office? Uh, down the street, three blocks. However, if we may be of assistance, uh, that is to say, if you should care to use our telephone... No, no, thanks. I'll walk down after I finish here. Oh, uh, Mr. Knowles, this way, please. Best man in the store. He'll take care of you. Uh, thanks. I hope you have a pleasant trip. And a most enjoyable stay in South America, sir. Thanks again. I'm sure I'll have a great time. Yeah, a great time. A friend of mine was telling me last night that when he's eating out, he always chooses a restaurant that's crowded. They must have something, he says, to be so popular. Well, by the same token, Signal Gasoline must have something. When you consider that last month, drivers bought more gallons of Signal Gasoline than during any other month in Signal history. What is that something which accounts for such increasing popularity? Some users tell us it's good mileage, which has made Signal known throughout the West as the go-farther gasoline. Others say it's the life and pep and smooth, easy response they get with the gasoline that's engineered to help your motor run more efficiently. But frankly, friends, just as sure as my name's Marvin Miller, you're never going to know all the good reasons why so many drivers are switching to Signal until you try a few tankfuls in your own car. Do it this week and see if you don't agree with me you get a full, full measure of all the things that make driving more pleasure when you fill up with Signal, the famous go-farther gasoline. Signal, signal, signal gasoline. Your car will go farther, go farther gasoline.
The future looks bright, doesn't it, Kelly? Very. And you're looking forward to your trip to South America. You're carrying close to 25,000 with you now, and this to be more, a great deal more. Once you reach Rio and set up your plan to blackmail the big guy who has entered the United States illegally. The following morning, the airline limousine picks you up at the hotel, takes you out to the airport. And then as you're checking your luggage... Mr. Owen? Kelly Owen? Yeah, that's right. I'm Lieutenant Dawson, L.A. Homicide. Homicide? Yeah. You bought a new wardrobe downtown yesterday, didn't you? Yeah, I did. Discarded the old suit you were wearing, left it at the shop? Sure. I, I, I told the clerk to give it to his favorite charity. So what? Well, you dropped something out of your wallet as you were transferring it to your new clothes. The clerk tried to catch it, but couldn't. Then when he noticed the name he'd seen in the papers, he called us. Hey, look, look, I don't follow this. Here's what the clerk found. Identification cards, including a pilot's license made out to Sam Ledford. Ledford? Yeah. Better turn in your plane ticket, Mr. Owen. You ain't going anywhere. Now, wait a minute. What's this all about? That's what we want to know. You see, Sam Ledford was found in a hotel room late last night. Dead. He'd been murdered. M- murdered? Sheila. Sheila must have got him when she went back to make that call. You were carrying Sam Ledford's pilot's license around. I'm afraid that's one you'll never be able to explain, Mr. Owen. Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at this same time. Meantime, Signal Oil Company and the friendly independent dealers who help you go farther with Signal Gasoline hope you'll remember. Regardless of what gasoline you use, you'll enjoy more miles of happy driving if you drive at sensible speeds, obey traffic regulations, and avoid taking chances. You may even save a life, possibly your own. Featured in tonight's story were Bill Foreman as The Whistler, Lamont Johnson, Betty Lou Gerson, Bill Boucher, Byron Kane, and Jack Moyle. The Whistler was produced and directed by George W. Allen with story by Joel Malone, music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. The Whistler was entirely fictional, and all characters portrayed on The Whistler are also fictional. Any similarity of names or resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Remember to tune in at the same time next Sunday when the Signal Oil Company will bring you another strange story by The Whistler. Marvin Miller speaking for the Signal Oil Company. tune now for our Miss Brooks starring Eve Arden, which follows immediately over most of these stations. This is the CBS Radio Network. And now stay tuned for the mystery program that is unique among all mystery programs. Because even when you know who is guilty... You always receive a startling surprise at the final curtain. In the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. Signal, the famous Go Farther Gasoline, invites you to sit back and enjoy another strange story by The Whistler. Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. 
And now for the Signal Oil Company, the Whistler's strange story. Autumn Song. Sidney Sheldon stared dully at the happy groups on the platform outside his compartment window. In a few minutes, many of them would be boarding the cross-country streamliner, just as he had. For most of them, it was destination New York for business or pleasure. For Sydney, it was destination New York, perhaps for oblivion. No one was there to see him off, wish him well, and tell him to hurry back to Los Angeles. Carlson at Mammoth Studios had handed him a one-way ticket to New York and told him never to come back to Hollywood. As the streamliner eased effortlessly underway, Sidney managed a sardonic smile. He was on his way out in the grand manner of Hollywood. Sheila. Well, Sheila, what are you... You didn't really think I'd let you get away from me, did you, Sid? Well, I've got to go east. Just a quick trip for business, you know. Really? Yes, you see, I've got a... Thanks, I will sit down. I've got a feeling the story's going to be good. Now, listen to me, Sheila. Why, Sid? I've listened to you for a long time. I don't like where it's got me. That career you promised me. What a publicity agent you turned out to be. Great. I'm glad you feel that way. Because I'm sick and tired of trying to palm off a no-talent doll like you as an actress. Look who's talking no talent. You've been tossed out of Hollywood. Here's a one-way ticket to New York. Take it and never come back. Unquote Carlson. Every studio in town has your number, and it's zero. And you know why? Because you fouled up every publicity stunt I've handled the past year. Whether it had anything to do with you or not, you always did a walk-on at the wrong time. And now if you're smart, you'll pull a walk-off this time. Right off of this train at the first stop. I'm not getting off, Sidney. I'm going to ride all the way. Chicago, New York. And even then, I'm still not getting off. What are you talking about? I'm talking about us. Neither of us can go back, Sid. You to the studio, or me to the husband I left for you. I didn't tell you to leave him. Not in so many words. Let's skip it. That part's my worry. It's all your worry. Now go on, beat it, Sheila. I've got my own troubles. I know. I'm one of them. Your biggest, I expect. I told you to beat it, to run along. All right, Sidney. That's the way you want it. If you feel differently later on, I'm in car 179. I can't hear you. And like I said... I'm not getting off. Nighty night, Sydney. You watch her go, feel the cold rage mount within you. You try to tell yourself that Sheila's the real cause of all your trouble. But deep down, you know that's not true. Sheila's a problem, yes. You wish you'd never met her, made all those promises about her career. Now she's like a millstone around your neck. You'd like to strangle her, wouldn't you, Sidney? But after a while, you decide to try to forget about her, put her out of your mind. You go to the diner, order your dinner, and lean back slightly. React as you recognize the voice of the man sitting back to back with you. An important film executive, Sidney... E.J. Payton, imparting some very interesting information to his dinner partner. Yes, I suppose this craze for older stars started when Pinza made such a smash in South Pacific. Pinza did a lot for the so-called older star, all right. Mm -hmm. Uh, This chap, Norman Hale, you're going to sign in New York. I remember him. (laughs) I remember I was a boy the first time I saw him. Oh, yes. The name of Norman Hale was a box office word. Uh, I'd prefer you didn't mention it around on the train. I mean that my studio is after him. Of course. Uh, <laughs> Hale doesn't know it himself, but he's just right for us. This picture autumn song that we're going to make, you see? Oh, oh yes. Uh, it's about a star from the old silent era, isn't it? Right. Hey, this steak is good. You almost can't wait to finish your dinner, can you, Sidney? But you realize that you might as well. Yes, because the streamliner won't stop anywhere that'll fit your plans before Albuquerque. Meanwhile, you have other things to attend to. A 
Porter, Porter, can you help me a moment? Yes, sir. You looking for somebody? Oh, yes, Porter. This is car 179. Yes, sir. A friend of mine, Miss Sheila Martin. Oh, Miss Martin, that's room at B, sir. Oh, well, thank you, Porter. Well, but I, I think the lady is in the club car. Well, it's all right. I'll find her later. Well, I'll go see No, her. no, 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 no. Never mind, never mind. <laughs> You start out of the car, turn in time to see the porter disappear into another room to make up the beds. You move swiftly down the aisle to Sheila's roomette. Inside, you find what you want in a matter of seconds, in her overnight bag wrapped in a nightgown. The roll of bills, which you were certain she wouldn't carry in her purse. You take most of the bills out, wrap the few remaining ones around a roll of cleansing tissue you find in her bag so she won't discover the loss immediately. Then you hurry back to your own car. Yes, sir? I'd, uh, I'd like accommodations to New York. First plane out, please. I have space on flight 23. Leaves here in two hours. Uh, that'll get me in New York ahead of the streamliner? Oh, yes, sir. You'll be there in 12 hours. 12 hours? Oh, good, good. I'll take that space. One way to New York. Stop engine wear that can cut down your car's pep and power. Cut down your gasoline mileage. Stop it. Stop engine wear that can make your car become an oil eater, make it need an expensive overhaul. How can you stop engine wear? By simply by changing oil, changing to amazing new Signal Premium Motor Oil that reduces engine wear due to lubrication 50%. Through newly perfected scientific developments, wonderful extra protection has been engineered into new Signal Premium. One, it stops acid corrosion and rust. Two, controls and reduces harmful engine deposits. Three, keeps oil rings clean and free. Four, keeps hydraulic valve lifters from sticking. Yet there has been no increase in price for this superior quality, heavy-duty type oil at Signal service stations. So why not join the ever-increasing number of motorists who are keeping car expenses down and performance up by changing to new Signal Premium, the amazing new Signal motor oil, that reduces engine wear due to lubrication 50%. It's a windfall, isn't it, Sidney? The chance knowledge you picked up on the train. Yes, as you step from your plane in New York, you're many hours ahead of the train you left at Albuquerque, carrying E.J. Payton, the motion picture producer, who is on his way to search the city for Norman Hale, the one-time silent picture star. With luck, you can find Norman Hale first. That's why you no sooner check into a hotel than you begin the weary rounds of second-rate theatrical agencies. At one, you finally get a lead. Make your way out to an astonishingly good address. You wonder as you press the buzzer if perhaps they weren't all wrong about Norman Hale. That he might have saved some of his early fabulous earnings. As you stand there waiting, you pray that he didn't. Hope that he's in a bad financial position. Yes? I'm uh, looking for Mr. Hale. Norman Hale, the actor. Have you an appointment? Well, no. You see, I... Uh... The nature of your business, please. Well, frankly, I uh, represent some motion picture interests who would like to contact Mr. Hale. Motion picture interests? My dear fellow, I don't believe Mr. Hale would be interested. You see, he wouldn't want to leave New York. Uh, the excitement, the glamour of the city, the close proximity to the theaters. Mr. Hale. What? <laughs> I might have known. And posing as the butler. <laughs> you were always pulling something like that. Please, Mr. Hale, may I come in? The name is Shelton. Sidney Shelton. Why, uh, all right, Mr. Shelton. Enter. Thank you, sir. Well, this is a beautiful place you have here. Thank you. Won't you sit down? Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, have you a contract, Mr. Shelton? Are you actually prepared to make a business proposition? Well, uh, no, sir, not exactly. You see, I have an idea, a possibility for both of us. Ha! Possibility. For making a picture with a has-been, an old man, a, a profile from the past. Exactly, sir. And if you weren't so 
well, so well off here, you might consider that there are still fans everywhere who remember you and love you. Young man, I am not well off. This aristocratic establishment, it isn't even mine. <laughs> How do you like that? But I don't understand. Alas, Norman Hale must now be grateful to be a caretaker of another man's house. A caretaker? You? Yes, the owner's in Europe. I'm a fortunate man. I could be huddling in a tenement somewhere. Well, you'll never have to worry about that again, Mr. Hale, if you just listen to me. I've found a great part for you. I read a book, Mr. Hale, Autumn Song. Uh, and that, that's... that was a play, wasn't it? Uh, well, that's what I meant to say, a play. I'm sorry. <laughs> See, I'm excited now. Oh, Mr. Hale, you should play that part. Oh, yes, uh, Oliver. Oliver Wentworth. Oliver Wentworth. Oh, Norman, you are Oliver Wentworth. And I can get you that part. I know it. Will you believe in me? Will you give me the chance to make you believe in yourself? You're a persuasive man, Shelton, here, but... Uh... Here, I, I brought a contract. I'll just sign there, Mr. Hale, making me your personal manager. An hour later, you're on your way back to your hotel, Sydney. Only a brief stop at the theatrical agency which gave you the lead to Norman Hale. Five dollars in the hand of the man you talk to assures the fact that motion picture producer E.J. Payton will now be directed to you instead of to Norman Hale himself. It's late afternoon of the following day, and you're sitting in your apartment when you receive a phone call. It's the call you've been expecting, isn't it, Sidney? Yes, from E.J. Payton, the Hollywood film executive. Yes, sir, that's right. I'm representing Norman Hale. Then we can talk. I have a little something in mind for him. Well, I don't know. Norman's sold on the idea of doing a play. Well, for his own sake, then, talk him out of it. Now, let's speak frankly, Mr. Shelton. Your Norman Hale is passe, a ghost of the silence. People just aren't interested in him anymore. You are, Mr. Payton? Oh, yes, yes, in a way. Look, Mr. Shelton, I don't like to discuss business over the telephone. Uh, when can we get together? Well, let me see. What do you say about lunch tomorrow? Uh, Victor's on 45th? Good. Have Norman Hale there, too. Well, I'll see if I can arrange it. I can't promise, though. You're pleased, aren't you, Sidney? And your only concern now is how to get the biggest price you can for Norman Hale's services. It won't be easy, will it, when you're dealing with a man like Peyton? And you wish you had something more to sell than just Norman Hale himself. You decide a publicity stunt would do it, Sidney. Something big. And Peyton Studio would be eager to cash in on it. You spend the rest of the day thinking about this. Finally, that evening, the answer comes to you. Most unexpectedly. Hello, Sid. Sheila. Oh, well, Sheila, look, I'm sorry about... The money you stole on the train? No, you're not. I knew it was you right away. But I'll get it back. And more. Of course you will, baby, of course. I was going to get in touch with sure. you, but I've been busy all day. A new client I know. Mine. I traced you down through the theatrical agency. Oh, really? Well, Will I... there be anything in this new deal for little Sheila? You know there better be. Oh, naturally. Oh, I haven't forgotten you, Sheila. And it's going to be big, baby. Yes, sir, a nice big fat publicity stunt for Norman Hale. He's my new client. And I'm working out something for you, too, Sheila. Like What? An overdose of sleeping pills? Get engaged to Norman Hale? <laughs> Maybe both? Wait a minute. You think that's funny? What is it this time, Sidney? Oh, baby. Oh, baby. You and Norman Hale. That's what I was afraid of. But give me the details anyway. <laughs> Can't we eat, Sidney? I'm famished. Well, let's wait for Peyton, huh, Norman? Oh, he's late. It's a quarter after one now. I know, Norman, I know. Uh, are you sure you said Victor's restaurant? Yes, of course I said Victor's, and Peyton will be you, here. You don't suppose he's changed his mind? Oh, relax, Norman, will you please? Very well. I'll have another martini. You've had four already. Norman! Norman, hey! I, I beg your pardon, miss. Norman, Norman, I'd recognize you anywhere. Have we met, my dear? Oh, no. 
don't know, but I've dreamed of meeting you ever since I was a little girl. Oh, how I've dreamed of this moment. Really? Well, well. From that very first time I saw you. What picture was that, my dear? I worshipped you then. I, I still do. Norman. Oh, Norman. Oh, miss, please, just a moment. Stay out of this Not... old man. I'll handle it. Oh, just think I finally found miss, you. Miss, please. No, please. let me go. Let please. me go. Norman. Don't let them send me away. Waiter. Please. Waiter. Please. Waiter. Please. You struggle to keep a straight face, don't you, Sidney, as Sheila clings desperately to Norman, pouring out her adoration for him. And during the confusion of the next few moments, you notice Peyton standing at the door, watching it all. Then finally, when Sheila is led away, sobbing bitterly, Peyton comes over to your table. Well, that was something, wasn't it? Oh, Mr. Peyton, you saw what happened? Yes, yes, I saw. Uh, Norman, this is Mr. Peyton. Norman. What? Oh, oh, how do you do, sir? That poor girl, that poor girl, so madly in love with me. Here, uh, sit down here, Mr. Peyton. In love with me all these years. Did you hear her sob, Sidney? Did you? Yes, yes, sure, sure. She's really crazy about you, Norman. Yes, I'd say that was quite a performance. Quite a performance. Performance? For uh, my benefit, eh, Mr. Shelton? You think this whole thing was staged? <laughs> Wasn't it? How dare you suggest such a thing? Anyone can plainly see that girl is desperately in love with me. And why not? Why shouldn't she be? Norm, Norm, please. A good day, Mr. Payton. Good day. Sir. Norman, wait, wait a minute. Let him go, Mr. Shelton. We have things to talk about. No, 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 he's pretty sore. I'll have to see if I can cool him down. But uh, you Make don't... it at Norman's place in an hour. 467 Kenton Place. I'm sorry, Sidney. I shouldn't have lost my temper that way. Okay, okay, let's forget it. Tell me something. That, uh, that affair, it really wasn't staged, was it? Oh, Norman, of course not. Oh, I didn't think so. I could see it was real. I, I saw it in her eyes, Sidney. I'm not easily fooled, you know. She was rather an attractive girl, wasn't she? A real doll. Oh, just couldn't help it, I suppose. Falling in love with me, I mean. I, uh, have I ever told you about the Countess Delgano, have I? Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, uh, but save it for some other time, will you please? Peyton's waiting for us in the study. Oh, yes, 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 sir. Very well, my boy. Well, I'm sorry to keep you waiting, Mr. Peyton. That's quite all right. I was just admiring your paintings, Mr. Hale. Oh, nothing much, really. Picked them up here and there during my travels. This one, for example, I turned up in London while I was on a personal appearance tour. The English loved me, you know. Fine people, the English. I remember uh, so Shall well... we sit down, gentlemen? Hmm? I, I remember so... Oh, get that like a good chap, will you, Sidney? Certainly. Hello? How was I, Sid? Who? Uh, speak up, I can't hear you. Are they there? Yes, yes. Okay, go into your act. I'll see you later. Who is it, uh, Sidney? I, I think it's that girl again, the one in the restaurant. Oh, really? Hello? Yes? What? Oh, no, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. What, what's wrong? What's she says wrong? she's calling from her hotel. Says if you don't see her, she'll jump off the roof. What? Hello. Hello, oh, where are you? Where? What? I can't understand. Stop crying, Here, please. Here, give me that phone. She hung up. We must do something. I think she said she was at the Grayville or the Brave... Grayville, not far from here. Mr. Payton, call the police. Tell them to get over to the girls' hotel right away. Come on, Norman, come on. <laughs> Too late, Norman. There she is up there. Where? Where? Are On you? the ledge. The ledge. The fourth oh, good floor. Good Lord! Uh, what did you say her name is? Sheila. 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 Don't jump. Don't do it. She can't hear. Stand back, Norman. please. Everybody, stand back. Give room to the police and the ambulance. Clear that sidewalk over there. You hear it? Clear it. What are we going to do with? If only I could talk. Wait a minute, Norman. Wait. You hear that? Stand back. That policeman talking on the public address system. Yes, Hold but... those people back over there at that of corner. Of course, that's it. Come on, come on. Are you ready, Norm? Ready. All right. Here's the microphone, Ro Romeo. Now, there's your Juliet, up there on the ledge. Now, come on. Start talking and make it good. Sheila! Sheila! This is Norman! This is Norman Hale! 
Listen to me, darling. Listen to me, please. You stand back in the crowd. Look at the faces around you as Norman Hale begins to play the scene in his most dramatic fashion. And the crowd loves it. You're certain of that, aren't you, Sidney? And you know that close by, Peyton is watching, listening. Then finally, the exciting climax as Sheila steps off the ledge and goes back into her hotel room. Peyton is very impressed. When can we talk, Mr. Shelton? In the morning, Mr. Payton, over coffee and the headlines. Hmm? All right, all right. I must say you handled the situation magnificently, Mr. Hale. Oh, thank you, thank you. I wasn't the least bit worried, you know. I was certain I could talk her out of her madness. Sure, sure. You can't help it, can you, Norman? I mean, because you're so attractive to women. You're so right, old boy. That evening, back in your apartment, you're pleased with the way everything has turned out, aren't you, Sidney? Yes, and you congratulate yourself. You've put it over. Peyton will have to come to your terms now, if he wants to capitalize on the publicity. Sign a long-term contract with Norman Hale. Then shortly before midnight, you have a visitor. Sheila. What do you mean, now what? What's the next move? That stunt this afternoon went over big for little Sheila, but we're not going to leave it at that, are we? Ah, look, sweetheart, look. You got yourself a million bucks worth of publicity. I set it up for you free of charge. You take it from there. But I thought you were... I'm going to be very busy from now on, baby. Norman and I will probably be leaving for the coast in a few days. Norman? Sure. The stunt was all for him, wasn't it? He was the star. I was just an extra. You didn't do badly. No, that's right. I didn't. And suddenly, I've just gotten an idea how I can do better. What? Well, what do you mean? You had me write a suicide note, remember? To make it all look authentic when I was going to jump from the hotel. Yeah, yeah, I remember. Well, I've still got that suicide note right here in my purse. I wonder what the reporters will do to your story when I tell them this whole thing was a fake. What? Now, wait a minute, Sheila. Uh-uh. I have just enough time to catch the morning papers before they go to press. Bright idea of yours, that suicide note. Yes, wasn't it? <laughs> Thanks for reminding me, baby. Let me go. Oh, sure, sure, I'll let you go. <laughs> Only when I do, it'll be out the window. Oh. Because you are going to jump, and your suicide note will prove that you <laughs> jumped. <laughs> Signal Ethel. Try Signal Ethel. Try Signal Ethel. Sometimes I think Try Signal Ethel is the most important thing I can say to you drivers, because once you try the premium grade of Signal's famous Go Farther gasoline in your own car, I won't need to say anything else. Yes, once you see for yourself how smoothly, quietly, Signal Ethel floats you over hills, steep hills, in high... I won't need to say anything more about the superpower in this great super fuel. Once you see how effortlessly it makes the miles of highway flash by, I won't need to tell you anything more about Signal Ethel's obedient smoothness. And once you see how swiftly it rockets your car ahead when the traffic signal says go, you'll know why we say Signal Ethel is engineered to bring out the best in any car of any age. Yes, all of these things and many more you'll learn about driving pleasure when you drive out of a signal station with your first tank full of signal ethyl. That's why I'm so eager for you to just try. Try signal ethyl. Try signal ethyl. Try signal ethyl. It was the only way, wasn't it, Sidney? You had to kill Sheila to prevent her from exposing you and the publicity stunt you staged for the benefit of your client, the former matinee idol Norman Hale. And so you pushed her out the window of your apartment. And now a crowd is gathered in the streets below. And you hurry downstairs. The story you'll tell is very clear in your mind. 
Then, when the police arrived... You say this girl jumped from your apartment, Mr. Shelton? Yes, yes, that's right, officer. It happened so quickly I was unable to stop her. Mm -hmm. Oh, the poor girl, she did it because of Norman Hale. You've heard of him, the actor? Yeah. Hey, wait a minute. Uh, Is this the same girl who tried to commit suicide this afternoon? Yes, yes, that's right, that's right. She burst into my apartment about 20 minutes ago. Demanded to see Norman, and I tried to stall her, but she showed me a suicide note she'd written, and then she jammed it in her purse. Before I could stop her, she ran to the window. And... Oh, well, you know the rest. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Is this a note? Yes, yes, it is. Well, looks like you're right, mister. Pardon me, officer. Yeah? This guy's story doesn't hold up. What? Hmm? See here, what do you mean? Well, I was standing across the street when this happened. I saw it all. This girl didn't jump. She was pushed. And this guy pushed her. That's ridiculous. Now, hold on, Mr. Sheldon. I saw him do it. Yeah, who are you? I'm Jim Fergus, private investigator. And after this girl apparently tried to commit suicide this afternoon, Norman Hale was so worried about her, he hired me to keep an eye on her. Norman Hale hired you? Yeah. Mr. Hale said the girl was nuts about him. Crazy in love with him. Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at the same time. Since this week is National Farm Safety Week, Signal has asked me to remind you. Each year, injuries disable one out of every 18 farm residents and cost our country $1 billion. So on peaceful western farms, just as in the city, it pays to be careful, always. Featured in tonight's story were Wally Mayer, Virginia Gregg, Herbert Rawlinson, Jess Kirkpatrick, and Herbert Litton. The Whistler was produced and directed by George W. Allen, with story by Joel Malone, music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. The Whistler is entirely fictional, and all characters portrayed on The Whistler are also fictional. Any similarity of names or resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Remember to tune in at this same time next Sunday when the Signal Oil Company will bring you another strange story by The Whistler, entitled Danger is a Beautiful Blonde, in which a pickup date with a beautiful girl leads a young man to an attractive mansion and a dead man. Marvin Miller speaking for the Signal Oil Company. Stay tuned now for the Horace Height Show, which follows immediately over most of these stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. And now, stay tuned for the program that is rated tops in popularity for a longer period of time than any other West Coast program in radio history. The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. Signal, the famous go-farther gasoline, invites you to sit back and enjoy another strange story by The Whistler. I am The Whistler, and I know many things for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now for the Signal Oil Company, The Whistler's Strange Story. 
Curiosity Killed a Cat. Two people sit on an old wharf piled high with lobster traps, wooden buoys, and fish nets. But the dark, half-puzzled eyes of the young man are not on those things, nor on the distant masts of the fishing smacks and draggers scuttling into the harbor. No, John Hawley sees only the sun-bleached prettiness of the woman opposite him and the sturdy lines of the trawler approaching the wharf. Both the woman and the boat belong to Captain Daniel Bailey. Yes, John, that's what you're thinking about, isn't it? Ever since you came home from the merchant marine to find your childhood sweetheart married to a miserly old man, you thought how easy it should be to get Captain Bailey's trawler, his gear, his house, his money, and his wife. And taking a job with a captain was only your first step. Favoring your bandaged finger, you pick up a brush and paint a red stripe around the lobster buoy, the mark that tells the world it's not wise to tamper with anything that belongs to Captain Daniel Bailey. Carrie glances nervously toward the trawler and back. Guess it'd look kind of funny me going back to house now. With the Nautilus just landing. Yeah, Daniel sees you, Carrie. That was old Matt Tuttle. He just waved. Daniel took Matt along to haul traps in your place. Can't figure why they came back so early. Weather, probably. Oh, I counted on crushing my finger to give us the whole day to get her, Carrie. You think Daniel guessed you did it on purpose? So I could stay ashore with his wife? Are you crazy? Not crazy. A body has to live with my husband and know how suspicious and mean he can be. Uh, I don't know. I remember when we were kids, we used to holler at him in the streets, call him a miser. And later I joined the Merchant Marine, and while I'm gone, you haven't marry the old coot. We're not kids any longer, John. I know, but... Why did you do it, Carrie? I never had a house of my own. I never had anything. Money or clothes. Oh, that's a good one. He hooked you and never even lost his bait. Captain Dan will never spend a dime on you. No, he hasn't. Yet everybody knows he's been salting it away for years. Carrie, don't you know where? No. But I told you, he doesn't believe in banks. We knew where to lay our hands on that dough. We... Well? I've been going out to haul lobster pots with him ever since he sprained his back, haven't I? Accidents happen pretty easy, you'd see. Daniel's a violent man, John. He won't sit by. Listen, Carrie, the day we find out where his money is, you can get out your Sunday go to meet and dress. You always did look pretty in black. Give your ball line to me, Matt. Here she comes, John. Okay. These are off now. Hi there, Captain Dan. Good haul today? Fair. No thanks to you, John. Get that stern line out, Matt, and hop to it. Nice of you to come down to meet me, Carrie. I was mending nets while John painted the buoy. Kinda figured you would. Suppose you get back to the house now and see to supper. We got company. Figure I owe it to Matt for helping me out. That's one way of getting out of paying him. Matt's a friend of mine. Something you wouldn't understand, John. Think maybe we should invite John to supper too, Carrie? Whatever you say, Daniel. Seems like he needs somebody to help him nurse that crushed finger back to health. Right now, if you don't mind, I got to borrow John to help us sort lobster. Oh, I'll bring him home to supper. Well, you look right nice, Carrie. Quite a spell since you fixed yourself up like this. Quite a spell since we had company. Where do you think you're off to now? Want to go up to the attic for a minute. But supper's ready, Dan. Matt and John are all ready to sit down. It seems to me every time I call you for supper, you decide to go to the attic. <laughs> yeah, General likes to look at that old sea chest he's got up there. Uh, leastwise, what's in it. Maybe uh, put a little more in it, eh, Daniel? <laughs> <laughs> Seems like Matt's let the cat out of the bag about your, your private bank, Captain Dan. All right, suppose I have got some money tucked away. Hard work's just as important as ever, John. 
And that's what you're afraid of. Yeah, like all young people today, born to start at the top. Don't see where scrimping and slaving I got you, Matt. Up at 4.30 in bed at 8 all your life. I'd like to have some fun before I die. You never used to complain about your luck, Carrie? Anything special on your mind? I get fed up sometimes. Well, I'll put the things on. You men sit down at the table. Well, there's the horn starting. Guess I sniffed out the weather all right, eh, Matt? Eh, yeah, Daniel. I'm sure glad we aren't aboard the Nautilus now. Why not? She's got a good compass. You know these waters as well as the rest of us, Matt. Yeah, maybe so, John, but too many men have piled up on the inner reef just the same. Uh, not if you know where you're going and how to get there. Never heard you sound so almighty sure of yourself, John. Well, it's a question of knowing all there is to know about a subject, Captain Daniel. Navigation or anything else. Like, like maybe there's just one thing holding you up, and you find the answer to what you didn't know, and you're all set. I don't know as I exactly get the drift of all that, John. You understand him, Carrie? I think so, Daniel. <laughs> Daniel's mind is on uh, putting all that folding money in his sea chest. <laughs> no, no, I'm thinking more of the fog closing in, Matt. Yeah, I can't very well forget it with that foghorn sounding like it was calling the body to his doom. You know what the foghorn always makes me think of? Sure, Matt. Makes you think of death. Yes, sir. Yeah, it does it that. How'd you know, John? Well, I guess you might say it makes me think of the same thing. At this point in the Whistler, I usually bring you a message about signal products. But tonight, at this season of goodwill toward men, I'd like to reserve these valuable seconds for a little later in the program in order to have time to bring you a message about one of your neighbors, a message which I hope will serve to further strengthen the bond of understanding and friendship between you and him. John, it was quite a shock coming home from several years in the Merchant Marine to find your childhood sweetheart married to Captain Daniel Bailey, wasn't it? But you're certain Carrie still loves you, aren't you? And you tell yourself that things will soon be much different, especially now that you've made sure where the old miser keeps all his money, in an old iron sea chest in the attic. It's a cold and black Monday morning, two hours before dawn, as you walk into the cheerful beam of light coming from the Bailey kitchen window. Carrie's there getting her husband's breakfast. And you know she's thinking the same thing you are. How easy it is for accidents to happen at sea. Especially when there's a reason and a will to help them along. Then as you open the back door, you stumble over the sea chest. Oh, I hope you didn't hurt your toe on that chest, John. Be too bad if it kept you on land too, like that crushed finger did. It's your fault for leaving it there, Daniel. I can't see why you brought it down in the first place. I figure on stowing it aboard the boat. Get your mug up, John. Let's cast off. <laughs> you know, Captain, it's your wife's coffee, not your 25 bucks a week that gets me up at this unholy hour to go out and haul traps with you. You know, I guess there was something about Carrie that interested you. Yeah. Her coffee, huh? <laughs> Consider that a flattering remark, Carrie? I'm considering the work I got ahead of me, Daniel. The sooner you two get yourselves and that chest out of my kitchen, the happier I'll be. Well, that chest looks good and solid, Captain Daniel. Yeah, yeah, they made things to last in my father's day. I always thought a lot of that chest. Well, do you really think it'll be safe on the boat, Daniel? Well, an old, old sea chest? Why not, Carrie? I got a feeling it's better stowed away in a locker. Where I can keep my eye on it. Uh, good sturdy lock there. Uh, fine workmanship. Hey, put that chest down. It was only hefting it, Daniel. Well, I was figuring on carrying it to the boat for you, Captain. Will you keep your hands off things that don't belong to you? 
Now you swig down that coffee while I get a couple of lobster traps out of the shed if you're so anxious to carry something. All right, all right. All right, Captain, you don't need to get sore. You know, there's an old saying, John. Maybe you heard it. Curiosity killed a cat. Makes a lot of sense. Now, where he keeps the keys of that chest, Gary? On his key ring or the other. In his jacket. Hauling gets to be hot work if he'd take his coat off before he went out in the door. He might have a chance. Maybe he took the money out, hid it somewhere else. Uh, not from the way he's acting. He suspects it's John. That's why he's moving the chest to the boat. Listen, the cabin's always locked except when he's on board. He keeps that key on his ring, too. <laughs> Don't you worry. When I'm ready, Carrie, Captain Dan'l won't have things his way at all. <laughs> You wonder about Captain Dan'l as he shoulders the chest and walks behind you down to the wharf where you board the Nautilus. It's interesting to see that he can't wait to get out of the harbor before locking the chest in the big locker on the starboard side, isn't it, John? Of course, it's probably coincident that he suggests you both haul traps from the same dory when you reach the outer shoal, and that he never once takes his jacket off, even when pulling up the heavy crate. It makes you wonder if he knows you plan to kill him. But you've got to wait for the right moment, don't you? And two days later, you think that time has come when Daniel's about to climb up over the side of the trawler from the dory riding below. As you stand over him on the deck... Careful of your back, Captain. Uh, let me give you a hand up. No, no, not yet. Let me get the door a uh, mite closer, John. Wouldn't want to fall between her and the Nautilus. Well, come on, get a hold of my hand. I'll hang on to you. Say, would you look who's coming into view? Ahoy there, Matt! What's Matt's motorboat doing out here beyond the reef? I thought he stuck to shallower water. He changed his lobster traps the day before yesterday. That's funny. I wonder why. Because I suggested it, John. Now you can give me a hand up. That evening when you explained to Carrie that you failed, there's something almost like contempt in her eyes, isn't there, John? So you make up your mind tomorrow will be the day, no matter what. And by noontime, it looks as though Matt Tuttle was a blessing in disguise at that. You finished your haul when Captain Dan'l decides to give Matt a hand with his. You watch the captain set out alone in the dory. Then you go quickly below to the cabin, where you saw him throw his jacket on the bunk. When he comes back, you'll have the sea chest open and the money in your pocket. And there'll be no more hide-and-seek, no more waiting for the right setup. You'll kill him in the cabin, out of sight of Matthew's prying eyes. Later, there'll be ways of getting rid of the body. Eagerly, you pick up his jacket, and as your hand goes into the side pocket... I'll take my jacket, Cap I, if you don't mind. Captain Dentler, oh, I, I, I noticed you forgot your jacket, You sir, think I... so? Toss it here. Then take the Nautilus and head back to port. I'll be going back with Matt. He's expecting me, so I wouldn't try anything if I was you. Why, of course not, Captain. By I... the way, I won't be needing you anymore, John. I worked out a deal with Matt. He's going to help me. Oh? You intend to pay me for a full week? Not if you don't work it. Tomorrow's Friday. You want to make it your last day? You think of any reason why I shouldn't? Maybe. Now I got my keys, John, I'll be going. Just you better remember what I said about curiosity killing a cat. You've failed again, haven't you, John? You tell yourself Captain Dan'l wouldn't be alive now if he hadn't caught you by surprise. If it hadn't been that Matt was expecting him. The next morning, you skip your mug of strong black coffee in Carrie's kitchen and go directly to the trawler to wait for Captain Dan'l. This is your last chance. And you're afraid to let Carrie see the little fears and doubts crawling in your desperate mind. When the captain arrives, his mood is as cold and heavy and silent as the fog which hangs over land and sea. But just as you're about to cast off... Dan'l! Dan'l! Carrie, what do you want? I've decided to go out with you today, Dan'l. I'm coming aboard. Well, I'm counting on stormy weather when the fog lifts, Carrie, but if you want, you're free to come aboard. <laughs> Breeze has sprung up, Dan'l. Barometer's fallen, too. Well, it's time to make our haul anyway. 
We may catch it on the way back. Want me to take the wheel, Captain? No. The less you have to do with this boat, the better. Oh, uh, look, Captain. I know it looked bad yesterday, but when I picked up your jacket, it was, it was natural. Oh, I forgot to... all about that. I got other things on my mind. I reckon we all have. You mean the storm, Dano? There'll be danger, will there, coming back? You know, you sound a mite worried, Terry. Mind if I ask why? No reason at all, Dan. Well, as long as I'm at the wheel, you... Well, maybe she'd feel safer, Johnny, if you was to explain that you can navigate these waters as good as me. Well, sure I can, Captain, but... but Funny I, I... thing, you know, I don't remember your worrying about my getting home safe before, Carrie. I suppose it's different when you're along yourself. I guess that's it, eh? Of course. I'm going on deck for a breath of air. As long as Daniel insists on staying at the wheel, John, I don't see why you have to stay in the cabin. Why wait till we reach the lobster grounds, John? Why not now? These are fishing waters, Carrie. Don't you see those other boats off there? You think they're blind? Still trying to put it off, aren't you? Another half hour and we'll be there, Carrie. If the weather turns bad, can we get back without him? I've done it a hundred times. I know these waters like, like, like the palm of my hand. Look, Carrie. W- when we're almost there, I'll slip up behind him while he's still got his attention on the wheel. And... I'll be watching to see you do this time. No mistakes. It's got to be over before Matt Tuttle's boat gets there. For a half hour, there's no sound but the steady chugging of the engine. And then suddenly it stops. Dead ahead is the first of Captain Daniel's lobster boards. Carrie hands you the piece of lead pipe you dropped. There's no turning back now, is there, John? Holding the weapon in back of you, you silently open the cabin door and step inside. Captain Daniel isn't there. He's tied the wheel to a set course. And before you can turn... You can drop that lead pipe, John. I wouldn't want to shoot a man in the back. Now, let you and me step out on deck with Carrie. Look, look, Captain, I, I don't know what you're thinking, but... Thinking? I... For a whole week, I've been trying to keep myself from being killed and at the same time give you a chance to tip your hand. It would have been one or the other if you weren't so yellow. Is that why you let me come along today, Dano? I wondered if you wouldn't take a hand sooner or later, Carrie. You came along to give this young feller some nerve. Well, what are you going to do? Might kill you, John. <laughs> don't like that, eh? Well, I've always been a law-abiding man. I figure the sheriff will know what to do about attempted murder. And what about me, Dano? You you love this weak need squirt, Carrie? Yes, Dano, I always have. Then by thunder, you can stand right alongside him in court. Huh, there's Matt's boat coming in. We'll take him aboard. What does Matt Tuttle know about this, Dano? Nothing, up till now. I don't wash my dirty linen in public. Not much you don't, you tight-fisted penny pinching old... Old miser, huh? Maybe, John, but it appears to me your craving to get your hands on money beats mine all hollow. What do you mean? All you know, the way both of you perked up when Matt mentioned my old sea chest that night. Well, it was a sight to see. Right then's when I knew. Right then's when I decided to move it here on board. A man as mean and suspicious as you would be hard to fool. My money was the bait I hooked you two on. That sea chest was like a bait bag bulging with herring. And it pulled you into my trap like a couple of greedy lobsters. So all the time you were... Giving you a rope to hang yourself. And now let's have no more talk. We'll anchor and wait for Matt. You get up far, John. Be ready to drop that anchor over the side. And I'll come along. Just in hopes you'll give me calls to shoot you the way I'd like. And so, John, with Captain Daniel's revolver pointed squarely at your back, You move carefully before him up onto the slippery bow. He keeps his distance. He's not giving you a chance to turn on him, is he, John? Balancing yourself, you squat over the heavy anchor and move the line toward the chop. Then you notice something. As old Daniel stops walking, watches for the right spot to drop anchor, he steps into a loop of the anchor rope. This gives you an opportunity you hadn't expected. With one move, you shove the anchor over. And the rope tightens around Daniel's leg, pulling him overboard and into the sea. Now, now, 
out there, Carrie. John and me searched as long as we could. Daniel's gone. There's nothing more we can do. Thank you, Matt. I... I... Don't try to say nothing now. And you, John, you better get out of those wet clothes. It was a mighty fine thing you did, going right over the side after him like that. I couldn't reach him, Matt. I think he got untangled from the anchor line all right, but he must have been in bad shape. Probably hit his head as he went over. Eh, yeah, try not to think of it anymore. Lucky I happened along when I did, though. Oh, you were a big help, Matt. Ain't yeah, just what I mean, Carrie. There was something preying on Daniel's mind. Some said he was worried about you two. Uh, well, now, look here, Matt. I wasn't one of them, John. Jumping catfish, I've known your kid since you was knee-high to a grasshopper. But Daniel, rest his soul, he had one of them suspicious minds. I don't minds. think you should talk like that. But there might have been, well, talk about his death, Carrie. Lucky my boat was close enough so as I can swear nobody was near him when he fell over. You got me to prove to folks it was an accident. Well, I gotta get back to my motorboat. She don't ride a storm like this boat, eh, John? Hey, here she comes. I'll close your cabin door tight. <laughs> By the time Matt gets through talking to folks, you'll be a hero, John. <laughs> What a break. <laughs> Soon as he gets out of the way, we'll start back, eh? Then we'll get that sea chest out of the locker and have a look at it. He called it a bait bag. Bulging with herring, Carrie. To tempt a couple of greedy lobsters, John. Only this time, baby. You and me are the ones that got away. Now, friends, for that message I mentioned earlier. That message about one of your neighbors. This neighbor is someone who often doesn't get a chance to spend as much time as he'd like to getting acquainted with you because he feels you'd rather have him concentrate on serving you promptly and efficiently, checking your tires, your radiator, your oil, your battery. He's your signal dealer, of course. But who is he, really? Well, as you know, signal dealers are independent dealers. That means each signal dealer has invested his own money in his own business. So naturally, being a small businessman, he knows what's made America great. He's a strong believer in America, the kind of citizen you can be proud to do business with. Secondly, before deciding to go into business for himself, he, like most signal dealers, probably had long experience servicing automobiles. Experience which can be valuable in making your car run better and last longer. Moreover, each signal dealer realizes that his income and success depend upon pleasing you so well you'll want to deal with him regularly. That's why your signal dealer tries to give such thorough, such conscientious service. If all this adds up to the kind of service man you'd like to have looking after your car, then here's a suggestion. Sometime soon, before Christmas, stop at the signal dealer's nearest you and exchange some little friendly words, such as how you enjoy this radio program or the chuckle you get out of the cartoons on signal billboards or even the weather. You'll be making that dealer's Christmas a much, much merrier one. And you'll be getting even better acquainted with a good fellow American who is in business there to serve you. It was easier than you had dared hope, wasn't it, John? Captain Daniel's foot caught in the anchor line that dragged him overboard to his death. And your diving in after him took care of the rest, didn't it? And you're perfectly safe because Matt Tuttle saw the accident. Will even swear you risked your life to rescue Captain Daniel. You head the Nautilus back toward port. Leave Carrie at the wheel. Get the captain's sea chest and rejoin Carrie. The storm is increasing in fury. So you place the chest on the chart stand by the compass and take the wheel. But soon your curiosity overcomes you. You turn the wheel over to Carrie again and start to open the chest. This 
a few twists of the blade and we... Curry? What, John? That bell buoy sounds to port. Should be to stab it. Keeping the compass just like it said. Uh, I see. Oh, well, when rain cuts your visibility, you get to imagining all sorts of things about yeah, the Get on with the chest, why don't you? Oh, a lot broke. It's kind of stiff, but I'm getting it. Carrie, give me that wheel. What are you doing, John? You're turning us off our course. You mean I'm trying to? What are you talking about? We're too close to that reef. The wind and current are against us. We're being pushed under the rocks. Any second, Carrie. You said our course was north. It was. <laughs> when I put that iron chest on the chart stand, it affected our compass. We're headed right under the inner reef. If I hadn't been so excited about the money, I'd have remembered that chest was made iron. Look, the chest is empty. Empty? Yes, except for your old charge. Look for yourself. Oh, well, that's what that scheme and Captain Daniel was up to. He knew we were dying of curiosity about that old sea chest. And he knew it was empty. But where is his money, John? I don't know. Now we'll never know. Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at this time. Signal Oil Company has asked me to remind you. During this busy pre-holiday season, it's especially important to drive at sensible speed, be courteous, and obey traffic regulations so that some avoidable accident doesn't mar your Merry Christmas. Featured in tonight's story were Bill Foreman as the Whistler, Lamont Johnson, Peggy Weber, Griff Barnett, and Charles Seal. The Whistler was produced and directed by George W. Allen, with story by Jack Kelsey, music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. The Whistler is entirely fictional, and all characters portrayed on The Whistler are also fictional. Any similarity of names or resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Remember to tune in at this same time next Sunday when the Signal Oil Company will bring you another strange story by The Whistler entitled Christmas Gift in which a nice girl pays a high price for a single mistake and then receives an unexpected Christmas gift. Marvin Miller speaking for the Signal Oil Company. Stay tuned now for our Miss Brooks starring Eve Arden which follows immediately over most of these stations. This is the CBS Radio Network. And now stay tuned for the mystery program that is unique among all mystery programs. Because even when you know who is guilty, you always receive a startling surprise at the final curtain. In the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. <laughs> Signal, the famous Go Farther Gasoline, invites you to sit back and enjoy another strange story by The Whistler. Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now for the Signal Oil Company, the Whistler's strange story, Murder Over Burma. Benton wore the oppressive heat of the Burmese night like a thick coat over his makeshift flying uniform of the Far East Importing Company. 
He walks slowly, deliberately through the streets of Dinjan, his face furrowed with anxiety, accented with fear. For Cliff knew what the summons from Burma Charlie meant, and he knew that there was no escape. Reluctantly, he directed his steps along the familiar narrow road that led to Burma Charlie's gambling casino. A few steps from Burma Charlie's office door, a man slid out of the shadows. What do you want, <laughs> Benton? <laughs> oh, Charlie wants to see me. Just a minute. Oh. Hey, boss, the guy Benton's out here wants to see you. Send him in. The boss said... I heard him. Sit down. Sit down, my boy. Okay. Now, look, Charlie, I... Uh... Uh, do you know what these are, my friend? Yes, yeah, I know what they are. They're my IOUs. Exactly. They make a neat little stack, don't they? About $5,000 worth. But I told you I'd pay you as soon as I got the money. I have a record of that, too. You said that exactly one month ago. You will find I run a very efficient business, Cliff. I'm sure you do. Now, look, Charlie, I've always paid you before. You know that. Now, all of a sudden, my credit's no good. Why don't you level with me? My dear young friend, I am leveling with you. I want the $5,000 you owe me. But that's not the main thing, is it, Charlie? You want me to quit seeing Lila. That's why we're having this little chat, isn't it? Lila? Have you really been seeing the featured vocalist at my little casino? I had no idea. Oh, Chuck. You say it, Cliff. I am so busy with the business end that I... Lila is your business, Charlie. Everyone in Din Jan knows that. I'm the only one who ever dared pay any attention to her. She liked it, Charlie, and you know it. That's why you're pulling the big foreclosing act. That would be all, Cliff. $5,000 you owe me. I want it. In three days. Three days? You know I can't... I want your $5,000 on my desk in three days, Cliff. If it is not here... Oh, 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 but you will see that it is, I am sure. For tragedy to touch one so young would be... Well, tragic. You know I can't get that kind of money in three days. All I know is that you had better. Now, wait a minute, Charlie, wait a minute. Look, I got a proposition. I'm making a flight tomorrow to uh, deliver a load of machinery. That is a particularly uninspired bit of information. Now, listen to me, listen. I, uh, I got connections that have been trying to get me to fly contraband. They've promised me $5,000 a trip for every shipment I deliver. Now, give me a few extra days and I'll guarantee you'll have your dough. If that's what you really want. I really want to clear my books of you, Cliff. I want you to pay up and get out. From now on, Boma Charlie's casino is off limits for you. Oh, <laughs> Lila again, huh? You persist in that delusion, Cliff. And I do not care to discuss it. Now, where did you say you are supposed to pick up this merchandise? Right here in Din Jan. Then fly it to Hong Kong and they pay me on delivery. I don't get back here for five days after I leave. Give me five days, Charlie. What do you say? Guys, come in here. Now, look, Charlie, all I'm asking... Call me, boss? Yes, come in. I have a little job for you. Okay. Guys, take a good look at this man. Mm. He's going to fly a load of machinery out of here tomorrow. I want you to meet him at Hong Kong when he arrives and stay with him until he gives you $5,000 for me. Gotcha, boss. There is a commercial airliner leaving at 10 tonight. Be on it. If for any reason the money is not forthcoming, take care of him. Understand? Right, sir, Charlie. I understand. Perfectly. Does this arrangement meet with your approval, Cliff? You're not taking any chances, are you? No. Oh, one more thing. When you leave the casino, there will be a man assigned to follow you. He will not let you out of his sight until you take off in the morning. Good night. One uh, small request, Charlie? Yes? I'd uh, like to have a farewell drink with Lila before I leave the building. I just have the feeling that I might not be seeing much more of her. And since our little arrangement has nothing at all to do with Lila, you couldn't really object. Could you now, Charlie? Ten minutes. Only ten minutes. Gus uh, will be there to remind you when your time is up. Mm. 
The five-day reprieve Burma Charlie has granted you doesn't mean much, does it, Cliff? Because there is no connection in Din Jan, is there? No $5,000 for flying contraband. And now, with two of Burma Charlie's men assigned to watch you, there's no chance of sneaking out of Burma without paying your debts. Lila has just finished her song as you walk into the dining room. You catch her eye and she joins you in the bar. When you finish telling her about your meeting with Burma Charlie, her lovely face is drawn and scored with fear. I've been afraid all along that something like this would happen. Well, I guess Charlie figures he owns you, or at least has controlling interest. And maybe he does. Uh, I think you know better than that, Cliff. Maybe. But does Charlie know better? Cliff, I don't know what to do. I've got to get away from here. Please help me. I don't know what I can do, Lila. You can take me with you tomorrow morning. Yes, yeah, sure, sure. But what about the hired hand Charlie's got following me? And suppose we could shake him. What about that killer he's got waiting for me in Hong Kong? No, honey. No, I'm afraid he's got us whipped. There's got to be a way out of here. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Maybe there is. What is it? Dave. Who? Dave Cummings, my co-pilot. I just thought of him. Listen, honey, in the four years since it's been since he came to work for Far East, he hasn't spent a dime he didn't have to. Why, that money belt of his is so loaded, I don't know how he gets off the ground with it. He must have at least six or seven grand in it. What's that got to do with us? Just this. I'll borrow all I can, a few hundred more than 5,000 if I can get it. We'll pay Charlie off, and before Gus takes off for Hong Kong, that'll get the two thugs off my trail. Oh, Cliff. Then tomorrow morning, you take off with Dave and me, and when we get to Hong Kong, we just leave the plane, Dave and Burma, and head for the States. What about Dave? When do we pay him back? We don't, honey. Maybe that'll teach him to trust banks. Now, look, don't forget, we take off at 7 in the morning. All right. Then... Oh. Time's up, Benton. Do you go, or do I have to help you? Well, uh, Kyla, it's been fun. Take care of yourself, honey. And who knows, maybe I'll be seeing you again one of these nice mornings. I wish there was some way to help you, Cliff, but I just can't. Like I say, this is my last trip, and I'm not going to take a chance on losing all my dough. But, Dave, I told you I'll mail it to you within a week. Honest, Cliff, I'm sorry, but watching this little bundle grow is what's kept me from getting the Burma Jollies. I just can't loan it out, especially since tomorrow's my last trip. Now, now look, be a good guy, Cliff, and hit the road, will you? I got a lot of packing to do. Look, Cliff, really, I'm sorry, but that's the way it is. <sighs> okay. No hard feelings. No, no, of course not. Well, I'll... Oh, look, Dave, look, you know I'm good for it. Are you sure you won't change your mind? I know I won't, Cliff. I'm hanging on to this dough. And if anybody wants even a dime of it, he'll have to get it over my dead body. new baby that was announced only last Sunday has already been adopted by thousands of motorists throughout Signal's seven western states, from Canada to Mexico. I'm referring to the amazing new motor oil that reduces by 50% engine wear due to lubrication. New Signal Premium Motor Oil. And no wonder car owners are enthusiastic. After all, when you cut engine wear in half, you multiply performance and carefree driving pleasure. For instance, if your car is not already consuming oil, New Signal Premium will not only double the period during which you'll continue to enjoy low oil consumption, it will also keep that light new pep and power in your car twice as long. Best of all, New Signal Premium motor oil gives you these and many other benefits at no increase in price. So why gamble with the most important, the most expensive part of your car? Your motor may be wearing out twice as fast as necessary if you haven't switched to the amazing new signal oil that cuts in half engine wear due to lubrication. New signal premium motor oil. It's not going well, is it, Cliff? 
you still owe Burma Charlie $5,000. And Dave Cummings, your co-pilot, has refused to lend you the money. You know that Burma Charlie means business. If you don't deliver the $5,000, he'll kill you. Then you recall Dave's last words, that whoever wanted his money had to get it over his dead body. That gives you the idea, a plan to pay off Burma Charlie and perhaps have a little money left for yourself. You hurry to your car and drive out to the airfield. Go straight to your plane, climb aboard, and then go forward. You take a pair of pliers out of the toolkit, reach down behind the bulkhead, and put a crimp in the line to Dave's oxygen supply. You know that your plan would never work if it weren't for the fact that the two oxygen systems operate independently of each other. You know, too, that men have been known to do strange things when they couldn't get enough oxygen at high altitude. The job completed, you replace the pliers. Take a final look at Dave's oxygen line. You're sure no one would notice anything was wrong. You smile in satisfaction, then leave the plane. As you start for your car, a figure steps out of the shadows. You go somewhere? <laughs> Who are you? I am a friend of Burma Charlie. He informed you tonight that there was man assigned to follow you until tomorrow morning. This man are myself. Oh? Well, you can go home now. I'm not going anywhere. And you can tell Charlie that he'll get his dough. Forgive me for not delivering message. But I am forced to accompany you to ensure you against become lonesome and possible seeking company of midnight train. Where we go now? Home? Yeah. We go home, Mr. Moto. As you drive towards your apartment, your heart slowly resumes its normal pace. That was too close, wasn't it? Then as you come within sight of your destination, a thought suddenly intrudes itself. Lila, you can't take her with you tomorrow, can you? There's too much of a risk involved. The man assigned to follow you takes up a position on your doorstep as you enter your apartment. Lila. Lila, what are you doing here? Don't you know that... Yes, I'm glad you're back. For a while, I was afraid you might have... If you don't know what it's been like these past few hours since you left Charlie's place. What happened? Charlie called me into his office after you left. He told me that from now on I was his exclusive property. And that he'd kill any man I so much as looked at. How did you get here? I climbed out of the window in my dressing room. He'll kill me if he finds me. I, I can't go back. Oh, Cliff, let me stay here until the morning. And then we can go to the airport tomorrow. No. No, Lila, it's too risky. It's no good. We can't take the chance. It might ruin everything. If I didn't know better, I'd, I'd think that maybe you didn't want me to go. I can't help it. I've had to change my plans. Then you don't want me to go. That's right. I don't want you to go. But... Look, baby, I might as well tell it to you straight. I've changed my mind about taking you with me to the States. Why? Why? It's very simple, Lila. I'm playing this hand by myself. Now, don't worry. You won't have any trouble finding yourself another boy. Another boy? Cliff, Cliff, you said... Look, that... baby, I don't owe you a thing. If I promise to take you with me, that's my business. And if I've decided to break my promise, that's also my business. You were Burma Charlie's private property before I came around. Now, there's no reason why I should break up such a cozy little arrangement like that. That's not true. Besides, you told sure, me... Sure, sure, I told you a lot of things. But you don't go with me tomorrow. Uh, however, if you're real anxious for a change, there's the midnight train you can catch. Now, go on home. I've met some pretty low people in my life, Cliff. But I don't think I ever have or ever will meet anyone quite as low as you. This is the way out, honey. I'm sorry you have to leave so soon. Give Burma Charlie my love. Did you say that train leaves at midnight? Yeah, yeah. Oh, if you need a couple Never of dollars... Never mind. Uh... I always pay my own way. And I always pay my debts. Here's the first installment. <coughs> You're getting off easy.
Well, Matt Charlie speaking. Uh, Charlie, this is Cliff. Oh, yes, Cliff. Did you suddenly find $5,000? Uh, no, no. I just wanted to tell you that Lila left my apartment not more than five minutes ago. Oh, but I know that, Cliff. Huh? Ling telephoned the information to me as soon as she left. Oh. Now tell me something I don't know. Why are you telling me this? Hmm? Well, I just wanted to make sure that you knew this meeting with Lila wasn't my idea. And that I'm sticking to the terms of our bargain. I believe you, Chris. I know you're that smart at least. Even the weather has worked out perfectly for your plan, hasn't it, Cliff? When you reach the airport, you find just enough turbulence in the ballet to enable you to convince the chief of operations that a flight over the mountains is the wiser course. Dave should be along soon, and you hope he doesn't decide to come in and check the weather. After last night, he might grow suspicious if you were to change your flight plan on such a flimsy pretext. You whirl as you hear the door open behind you. Hiya, Cliff. Everything all set? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm getting the route forecast now. How does it look? Oh, not bad, but there's some stuff in the valley that I'm not too sure of, so I'm... I'm routing over the mountains. Oh, no, do we have to? Hmm? Why? Well, what's the matter? Oh, well, nothing, only I'm, uh... I'm not too eager about dragging on oxygen for two, three hours. Kind of hope my last ride might be an easy one. Let me see the report, huh? Here. It doesn't look too bad. I don't see what you're so worried about. Wait a minute. Let me do the figuring, will you? Okay, okay. Don't get yourself in an uproar. Oh, I'm sorry, Dave. I guess I'm a little upset about this being your last flight today. Sure, sure, Cliff. I'll wait for you out the ship. See you in a little while. You watch Dave as he leaves the operations office and goes out to the ship. You light a cigarette, drag deeply, and turn back to your paperwork. You wonder if he suspects anything. But then you're sure he can't, aren't you? When you've completed the paperwork, you relax a while to calm your nerves. Then go out to the flight line. Dave is in the cockpit, looking over an old Los Angeles newspaper. For a moment, you're tempted to ask him once more for the loan. But you're sure he hasn't changed his mind since last night. People like Dave never do. So you take off, certain that in a little while now it will all be taken care of. As you approach the mountains, you know it's time to put your plan into effect. Dave? Yeah, what is it? The controls feel a little sloppy. Go on back and check the cargo, will you? I think it shifted when we hit that bump a while back. Oh, I don't think so. Still flying straight and level. Well, it feels a little left wing heavy. Be a good guy and check it for me, will you? It'll relieve my mind. Okay. Only I think you're being overcautious. No, Cliff, you're not being overcautious, are you? You've got to check that oxygen line again. As Dave closes the bulkhead door, you get out of your seat and check the crimp you made in his oxygen line last night. You make certain that it's not cut off entirely because then Dave might notice that there wasn't any oxygen coming through the gauge on the instrument panel. It had to be crimped just so, just enough so that Dave wouldn't notice anything was wrong until it was too late. You're sure this method is foolproof, that no one will ever be able to prove you had anything to do with Dave's death. You get back in your seat as Dave returns. Told you it was okay back there. You couldn't shift that cargo if you did a barrel roll. Well, I just wanted to make sure, that's all. You know how it is. Yeah, I guess so. Well, let's start climbing, huh? The mountains are only about 50 miles away. Right. Check oxygen. Oxygen, check. Increase the revolutions to 2300. Manifold pressure to 39. Set turbos. Roger. Climb slowly, doesn't it, Cliff? Seems like hours before you reach 10,000 feet. You both put on your oxygen masks. Then the altimeter inches up slowly to 15,000 feet. 
At 18,000 feet, you steal a glance at Dave. Little beads of sweat fleck his forehead, and his fingernails begin to turn blue. As his eyelids grow heavy, he fumbles for his gloves. As he fumbles, you know that he's on his way out. Anoxia, the army called it. Nobody ever knew they were suffering from oxygen starvation until just before they passed out. Then it was too late. Well, Dave is on his way out now. He fumbles and fumbles, trying to get his gloves on. Then settles in his seat, his head slumped forward on his chest. You wait five minutes, and then call him on the intercom. Dave. Dave. I made it. He's dead. <laughs> I made it. You have to work fast now. You turn the ship around, then put it into a dive. You must descend to 10,000 feet before you can take your oxygen mask off and finish the business at hand. At 10,000 feet, you level off and engage the automatic pilot. Then you unbuckle your safety belt and drag Dave to the rear of the cargo compartment. There, you rip open his shirt, transfer his money belt to your own waist, and open the hatch. Sorry, Dave. You had your chance last night. While the radio warms up, you open the toolbox and very carefully remove the crimp in Dave's oxygen line. And then... Far East Flight 4, calling Dinjan Tower. Far East Flight 4, calling Dinjan Tower. Over. Dinjan Tower to Far East 4. Go ahead. This is Benton, co-pilot Cummings, victim of anoxia. Bailed out, tried to stop him. Couldn't do. Coming back to field. Over. Are you all right? A little groggy, but I think I can make it. Have everything ready for report. Will do. I say, take it easy. Everything will be all right. Over and out. <laughs> everything is all right, buddy. Burma Charlie, here I come. You're gonna get your dough. want a baby your car, then the motor oil for you is Signal's amazing new motor oil that reduces by 50% engine wear due to lubrication. Consider just four of the important extra ways new Signal premium motor oil helps to keep your car young for additional tens of thousands of happy miles. One, keeps oil rings clean and free. Two, controls and reduces such harmful engine deposits as carbon, gum, and varnish. Three, prevents sticking of hydraulic valve lifters. And four, stops acid corrosion and rust. Result, maintenance costs are kept down, down, down. The average car should actually drive twice as far before needing an overhaul due to engine wear. So save money while you save your car. If you're still using lazy old-fashioned oil, ask your nearest signal dealer to drain it out now and refill with a new hard-working signal oil that reduces by 50% engine wear due to lubrication. New Signal Premium Motor Oil. Well, Cliff, it's all over, isn't it? Your co-pilot, Dave Cummings, is dead. And you're sure that the treacherous heights of mountain range will be a safe guardian of your secret. You smile as you point the ship back in the direction of Din Jan. Dave's money belt, now strapped securely around your waist contains enough money to pay off your IOUs to Burma Charlie, and you'll have some left over to enjoy. In the office of the chief of police, you have no trouble convincing them that Dave, apparently a victim of anoxia because of defective oxygen apparatus, had gone berserk, and despite your heroic efforts to control him, had broken away and leaped to his death. I kept my eyes on him as long as I could, sir. I never did see his shoot open. Then I started to get groggy, so I stumbled back to the cockpit and switched from portable to main oxygen supply. Have you any idea as to why his oxygen supply was cut off? No, sir. That is, I don't think so, sir. 
The only clue I could possibly give you is that I noticed uh, ice crystals in the intake valve of my mask. Uh-huh. That sometimes happens at extreme altitudes. Maybe Dave's mask accumulated too many crystals. Of course, that's only a guess. Sir. Yes, of course. Well, I don't see any reason why you should have to stick around here any longer. I... Oh, excuse me. Yes? Oh. Are you sure? Yes, he's here. Yes, by all means, right away. Thanks. Um, Mr. Benton, I'm... I'm afraid I'll have to detain you a while after all. What? Why? Well, what for, sir? Lila. Yes, Cliff. But the midnight train, you said... Yes, I said I might take the midnight train. But when I left your place, I knew I'd been spotted by the man in front of your house. So I went out to the airport and hid in your plane. And... In my plane. This young lady claims to be a witness to your co-pilot's death, Mr. Benton. Oh, Lila, oh, you couldn't have. Dave checked the plane before the takeoff. Checked the plane and found me, Cliff. He even set up an oxygen supply for me because he knew you were going over the mountain. I saw you throw Dave out of that plane. Wait a minute, Captain, wait a minute. It's her word against mine. Why, how do we even know she was on the plane? She can't prove it. Oh, but I can, Cliff. Before you threw Dave out of the plane, I saw you take off his money belt. What? It's strapped around your waist right now. <laughs> Go on, Cliff. Deny that. What? Well, Mr. Benton, can you deny it? Lila. Lila. Like I told you, Cliff, I always pay my debts. whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at this same time. Signal Oil Company has asked me to remind you this about the amazing new Signal Premium Motor Oil, which reduces by 50% engine wear due to lubrication. It's available only at independent Signal service stations from the same friendly dealers who help you go farther with Signal Gasoline. <laughs> Featured in tonight's story were Bill Foreman, Wally Mayer, Doris Singleton, Larry Dobkin, Marvin Miller, Ben Wright, and Jack Moyles. The Whistler was produced and directed by George W. Allen with story by Ross Murray, music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. The Whistler is entirely fictional, and all characters portrayed on The Whistler are also fictional. Any similarity of names or resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Remember at the same time next Sunday, another strange tale by The Whistler. Marvin Miller speaking for the Signal Oil Company. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. And now, stay tuned for the program that has rated tops in popularity for a longer period of time than any other West Coast program in radio history. The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. Signal, the famous go-farther gasoline, invites you to sit back and enjoy another strange story by The Whistler. I am The Whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now for the Signal Oil Company, the Whistler's strange story. Attorney for the Defense. <laughs> The trial had captured the headlines and commanded the bulk of page one news since its very first day. Randolph Abbott made news because he was dead, murdered, and his only daughter, lovely Ruth Abbott, was standing trial for his murder. 
Defending her was her father's own attorney, Joseph Herman. Now the court stood recessed, and Joseph Herman walked confidently from the crowded courtroom. Think you've got the DA on the run, Mr. Herman? Well, the district attorney has his job to do, and I have mine. But you may quote me as saying that Ruth Abbott is innocent, entirely innocent of her father's murder. And I propose to prove her innocence. Got Let's get to the point. A splendid statement, Joseph. Clear cut to the point. Your words will look good in print. But then, your words are most important in this murder trial, aren't they, Joseph? More important than anyone else's. Because you're the only one who knows exactly what happened. The night Randolph Abbott was murdered. Yes, Joseph, you remember that night well. You called on Randolph Abbott for a very special reason. Oh, it's you, Joseph. Come in, come in. Good evening, Randolph. Oh, I hardly expected you to answer the door. Come on into the study. Medford's out this evening. All the servants are. Ruth's gone up to her room, probably didn't hear the bell. Well, sit down, Joseph, sit down. No, this won't take long, Randolph. This is a business call. Business? Oh, yes, the payment on your note, I imagine. The last payment on my note, Randolph. Ten years. That's a long time, Randolph. I'm glad it's over, Joseph. I should think you would be glad. Huh? That's a small word for ten years of effort. Ten years of crawling to you with the payment, Randolph. I don't understand you, Joseph. You act as if I've done a villainous thing, saving you from prison, disbarment. The courts don't look kindly on embezzlement, Joseph. You should know that. You're a lawyer. Randolph Abbott's attorney, if you please. All right, Joseph. I've never asked for your gratitude. I don't expect it now. I'll get the note, and we can complete this unpleasantness. Uh, fine, fine. Get the note. Oh, and shall I hide my eyes, Randolph, while you work the combination to the wall safe? That won't be necessary, Joseph. The safe's merely closed. It's not locked. I was putting some things in when you rang. Here we are. Now, if you'll give me the money, Joseph, the note is yours. Okay. Here's the money. Thank you. And here's your note. Okay. Well, I... I guess I should thank you, too. That won't be necessary, Joseph. Oh, you don't want my thanks. You just want my money, is that it? No, Joseph, that's not it. But if that's the way you feel toward me, I'm releasing you. You're at liberty to find employment elsewhere. You don't owe me a thing, Joseph. Oh, so this is the payoff. You kept me crawling to you for ten years for this? I've kept your career safe for you, Joseph. And by keeping you employed, helped you pay back the money that you stole. You seem to forget all that. I've given you another chance. Another chance. And then there's young Douglas, Drake Douglas, Ruth's fiancé. He's showing promise as assistant district attorney. In all probability, after their marriage, I'll turn my legal representations over to him. Oh, no, you won't, Randolph. I think you'd better leave now, Joseph. I'm not leaving, Randolph, not yet. You said I didn't owe you anything. But you're wrong. Now, don't start threatening me, Joseph. I'll... You'll do nothing. You've done the last thing that you'll ever do. No, Joseph, stop! Here's, here's what I owe you, Wait. Randolph. The final payment. This! Since this is vacation time, I'd like to say a word tonight about an item that will have a lot to do with your driving pleasure. Gasoline. As you travel throughout the Pacific Coast states, you can continue to power your car with the famous Go Farther gasoline. Signal, that is. Yes, from Canada to Mexico, you'll see the familiar signal circle sign in yellow and black that identifies friendly, independent signal dealers. And when you gas up at a signal station, remember, mileage is only one of the benefits you enjoy. After all, the reason today's signal gasoline gives you such good mileage is that it helps your motor run more efficiently. And when your motor runs more efficiently, naturally you also notice quicker starting, proud pickup, and smooth, responsive power. That's why we say mileage and performance are like birds of a feather. They go together. So on your vacation trip or any time, remember you get all the things that make driving more fun when you get Signal, the famous Go Farther gasoline.
Randolph Abbott lies dead at your feet, Joseph. Instinctively, you wipe your fingerprints from the heavy bookend, from everything that you've touched. You move for the safe. You're certain Randolph kept the record of your payments there. Yes, you find them, neatly kept in a small record book. But there's something else in the safe, Joseph. You flip open the large leather case, and the light catches the brilliance of Randolph Abbott's collection of historical gems. You make a split-second decision. Robbery, Joseph. Yes, you'll make it look like robbery. Half an hour later, you carry your heavy, bulging briefcase into your own home. Your wife, Helen, sensing your urgency, follows you to your room. What's the matter with you, Joe? You paid Mr. Abbott, didn't you? You got the note all right. Yeah. Yes, I got the note. Helen. He's dead. Abbott's dead. I killed him. You killed him? I, I paid him. See, I got the note, and then he fired me. Just like that, he fired me. I, I, I couldn't help it. I, I must have hit him with a bookend. And all of a sudden, there he was. He's dead. Joe, but did anyone see you? Does anyone know you were there? No, no, no. The servants were gone. He said that Ruth was upstairs, but there wasn't a sound in the place after it happened. Oh, your fingerprints are probably all over the place. Oh, no. No, I wiped everything off. Oh, and just to be sure, I took these. I made it look like robbery, see? Opened a window in the study where we were. Well, what on earth are these? Jewels. Abbott's been collecting a few historical jewels. Oh, nothing much, but it was all I could think of to take. What do you mean, nothing much? They look genuine to me. Oh, maybe they are. He said that they were a hobby with him. You don't think he'd tell me about his jewel collection, do you? Wait a minute. What's in the separate case? Well, how would I know? I never saw it before. Oh, look at that, Joe. Huh? You think that necklace isn't worth a fortune? Why, I don't know. That's stunning. Well, I'll say it's stunning. See, it's funny, too. I don't know why it should, but it, it looks familiar to me somehow. Well, uh, see... What are you doing? Looking through these magazines. One of them ran some color pictures of old jewels. I know that's where I saw that necklace. Oh, look, Helen, this is crazy. This necklace isn't important. We've got... Now, wait, the... wait a minute. Here it is. Huh? Oh, I knew I'd seen it. Look, Joe, a life-size color print. Here. I bet this necklace of Abbott's fits perfectly. There. Oh, I'll be... Hey, what does it say? There, below the picture. Well, it says the... Anne Boleyn necklace said to be the final gift of Henry VIII to Anne Boleyn before she was beheaded. It has in it all kinds of... Here, diamonds, sapphires, and emeralds. Oh, let's see. Good heavens. Well, what is it? Appraised by present-day gem experts at a value of $150,000. But think of it, Joe. It's worth $150,000. And we've got it. <laughs> Well, Joseph, the brilliance and value of the Anne Boleyn necklace blinds both you and Helen for the moment. Until you remember that Randolph Abbott is dead, that you murdered him, Joseph. Still, you feel secure in the knowledge that no one knows you were with him tonight. And your wife, Helen, assures you that there's no reason for anyone to suspect you. That thought comforts you as you lock the Abbott jewels in your files and prepare to retire for the night when... Uh, hello. Uh, this... This is Ruth Abbott, Mr. Herman. Oh, yes, Ruth. My father... My father's been murdered. Murdered? Oh, no, Ruth. Oh, please, I... Mr. Herman. The police are here. I, I, I'm very tired. Can you come right away? Why, of course I can, Ruth. Of course. It looks as if I'll need an attorney, Mr. Herman. The police think that I... I killed him. They think you... I'll be waiting for you, Mr. Herman. Please, come quickly. Ruth Abbott? Yeah, the police are there. They think she killed her father. She wants me to defend her. You've got to do it. Do I? Why, Helen? Why not let Ruth take the rap? Don't you see, Helen? They don't suspect me. They suspect Ruth. <laughs> I think it's wonderful. N now, think a minute, Joe. You're Randolph Abbott's attorney. You've got to defend his daughter... You make a brilliant defense for her, Joe, because she's innocent, you know. No one knows that better than you do. I'm sure she's innocent, but I've got to think of myself. This is thinking of yourself, Joe. 
After your devoted, brilliant defense of an innocent girl, no one will ever be looking for you. And later, when it's all forgotten, we, we can sell the Anne Boleyn necklace and go anywhere and live comfortably. Yeah, maybe you're right, Helen. Yes, I think you are. Okay. I'll do it. I'll be the attorney for the defense. As you reach the Abbott home, you manage an expression of grave concern as Medford, the Abbott butler, ushers you into the study where Ruth Abbott and Police Lieutenant Simpson are waiting for you. Ruth stoically accepts your expressions of sympathy. And the lieutenant begins to fill you in on the uh, details of Randolph Abbott's murder. There aren't too many facts, Mr. Herman. I can give them to you quickly. Then you can talk with Miss Abbott here. Very well, Lieutenant. Mr. Abbott was killed earlier tonight at approximately 8.30. Huh. Between 8.30 and 9 o'clock. There was no one at home at the time except Miss Abbott. Are the servants? The servants had been dismissed for the evening immediately after dinner. Before they left, the butler, Medford, and a maid overheard a violent quarrel which took place at dinner between Miss Abbott, her father, and Miss Abbott's fiancé, Drake Douglas. It was not a violent quarrel. It was merely a misunderstanding. Miss Abbott and the servants don't seem to agree on that, Mr. Herman. Oh. At any rate, at the height of the quarrel or misunderstanding, Mr. Douglas left in anger, I understand. He was upset, that's all. Father disagreed with us about the date of our wedding, Drake's and mine. He wanted us to wait and have a large wedding. We wanted to get married right away, a small family wedding. That's all we were discussing. Mr. Douglas went directly home. There are witnesses to testify. He was there the rest of the evening. When the servants left at 8 o'clock, Miss Abbott was alone here. She claimed she went to her room where she stayed until 11 o'clock. When she came down here... Found her father. That's the truth. Oh, no, please, Ruth. Her fingerprints are on the bookend, Mr. Herman. That's the murder weapon. We also found the safe open. And her prints are on that, too. How many times do I have to tell you, Lieutenant? The bookend was lying beside father. I don't know why, but I picked it up. The safe was open. I just closed it. That's all. The safe, Lieutenant. Was anything taken from the safe? Miss Abbott says her father kept a jewel collection there. Historical jewels. They're missing, but that's all. Why, then, don't you think the motive could have been robbery and murder from the outside? The doors were all locked, Mr. Herman. One window in this study here was open. But there were no footprints outside the window. Now, Mr. Herman, this was an inside job. And we're holding Miss Abbott for the murder of her father. <laughs> When the lieutenant leaves you alone with Ruth, you assure her you're convinced of her innocence. That even the web, even though the web of circumstantial evidence encircles her, you're sure that you'll find the wink link in the chain. The next morning, you go to your office to plan your defense for her. Late that afternoon, you receive a caller at your office. Well, Mr. Douglas, I am happy to see you. Thank you. Sit down. Uh, Mr. Herman, I'll come right to the point. I don't have very much respect for you as an attorney. So? I happen to know that you handled only small routine things for Mr. Abbott for the past few years. Just why he apparently lost faith in you, I'm not sure. Mr. Douglas, do you think that perhaps your own desire to handle legal matters for Randolph Abbott has anything to do with your appraisal of me as an attorney? I'm sure it hasn't, Mr. Herman. And if I'm wrong about you, as I hope I am, I'll be the first to admit it. You see... If I were anything but assistant district attorney, I'd defend Ruth myself. Obviously, I'm not assisting the prosecution in any way. I've disqualified myself. Ruth wants you to defend her. She insists on it. Well, I'm glad to hear Mr. that. Mr. Herman, I'm very much in love with Ruth Abbott. She's innocent. That's a pretty good defense right there. And you had better build a good defense for her, or you'll answer to me. Drake Douglas's words echo through the next few days as you prepare Ruth Abbott's defense. There can be no slip-ups now, Joseph. Douglas is always around, isn't he? When you and the district attorney select the jury, 
Through all the preliminaries to the trial, he's there watching you, weighing every word you say. Then finally, the trial begins, and the district attorney is completing the opening statement of the prosecution. In summary, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the prosecution will prove that the defendant, Ruth Abbott, had both a primary and secondary motive for murdering her father. The primary consideration was money, the vast Abbott wealth she was impatient to acquire. The defendant's secondary motive took hold after a violent quarrel when her father voiced disapproval of her approaching marriage. I have no doubt, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, that much will be made by the defense of the fact that Randolph Abbott's collection of historical jewels were taken the night of his murder. But I say to you that these jewels represent a paltry sum in comparison with the wealth the defendant would inherit at her father's death, that these jewels were, in fact, expendable in the defendant's plan to make the murder of her father appear to be the work of a common thief, a housebreaker. You watch the jury for reaction, Joseph. Sense the temper of the crowded courtroom. Yes, the district attorney has made his points well. And he continues to build his case against Ruth with the testimony of the Abbott maid and Medford the butler. I distinctly heard them quarreling. Miss Ruth, Drake Douglas, and Mr. Abbott during dinner, uh, they were shouting at one another. And finally, I heard Miss Ruth say... I won't have it. I won't have it. You're not going to interfere with my wedding. Yes, sir, I would say it was an angry quarrel. Mr. Douglas left quite suddenly, and Miss Ruth saw him to the door. They seemed quite upset, emotional. Will you say they were angry with one another? Oh, no, sir. They were angry, extremely angry, with Mr. Abbott, sir. <laughs> Well, Joseph, you need only see the expression on Helen's face when you go home that night to confirm what you already know. Things are not going well for Ruth Abbott, and that means they're not going well for you. But as you remind Helen... The DA's having his day, that's all. I'll get my crack at them tomorrow. Now, don't you worry about it. Well, I am worried, Joe. Have you forgotten what's at stake in this thing? Your own guilt and those jewels you've got locked in the file and that necklace, Joe. Well, of course I haven't forgotten. I... Oh, now what? Hello. Drake Douglas, Mr. Herman. Oh, yes, Douglas. I'll be blunt about it. I want to know what your plans are for Ruth's defense. Ruth is innocent. She's also the woman I love. And I warn you, whatever you do tomorrow, it had better be good. Yeah, well, for your information, Douglas, it will be good. I have an ace in the hole that'll blast the DA's theories to pieces. The next morning in court, you set the stage for playing your ace in the hole. You dwell on the close, happy association of Ruth Abbott and her father, on Randolph Abbott's sincere affection for Drake Douglas, his faith in him. Yes, Joseph, your defense of Ruth Abbott is building nicely. The angry quarrel of which the prosecution and its witnesses have made so much, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the defense shall prove to be merely a family squabble concerning the date and size of the defendant's wedding. Spirited, perhaps, but nonetheless the kind of lively discussion in which all families indulge. I dare say even my esteemed colleague, the district attorney, has raised his voice in such a minor disagreement with his own family. <laughs> but far more important and far more conclusively shall the defense rip through the single flimsy thread on which the prosecution hangs its full and highly vulnerable case against Ruth Abbott. They refer to the Abbott jewel collection as paltry in value and dismiss it with that. Why? Because it is far from paltry in value, and that is the one big flaw in their case, and they know it. Therefore, I shall call but one witness, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, one witness, the defendant, Miss Ruth Abbott. Yeah. 
It's a dramatic moment, Joseph, and you play its drama to the hilt. Quietly, compassionately, you ask the first routine questions of Ruth. Each one a strategic step toward your main line of questioning, your ace in the hole. And finally, you begin to frame the all-important questions. Miss Albert, are, uh, are you familiar with your father's collection of historical jewels? Oh, yes, of course I am. Hmm. Did you have free access to these jewels? Why, yes. Father frequently discussed them with me. In fact, at his insistence, I, I, I wore them many times. I see. Now, Miss Albert, according to the transcript, the prosecution refers to these jewels as paltry in value. Do you know their actual worth? Well, I, I know that a diamond brooch which once belonged to the Royal House of the Netherlands was insured for $20,000. A ring of emeralds and diamonds from an ancient Oriental dynasty was appraised at $10,000. A 15th century ruby pendant was valued at $15,000. And the Anne Boleyn necklace, Miss Abbott. What value did it have? Why, I, I, I don't know its value. Well, would you say the entire collection would be worth enough that not only a common thief, but a big-time, highly expert jewel thief might consider it more than paltry? I object. Objection sustained. All right. I'll reframe the question. Would you say the entire collection was worth $200,000? Well, yes, I, I would think that's the approximate value. Oh. You let the full impact of Ruth's words sink in. Then you turn and face the prosecution quickly huddled together. The value of the jewels, the real possibility of theft by a jewel expert has dealt their case a telling blow, Joseph. You're certain of that. You're even more certain when the district attorney arises and addresses the court. Your Honor, the prosecution requests a recess of two hours for purposes of reviewing the recent testimony. Unless the defense has objections, the court is recessed until two o'clock. The defense has no objections, Your Honor. No objections at all. Now, I'm going to predict a sight you're going to see oftener and oftener as the days grow warmer. Overheated cars parked at the side of the road to let their steaming radiators cool off. To make sure this annoying occurrence doesn't mar your summer driving fun, signal service stations have three little items to rejuvenate your cooling system. The first is radiator cleaner to remove clogging scales, sludge, and rust. The second is rust preventive to protect radiators of old cars or new ones from further corrosion. And the third is radiator sealer that stops small leaks in a jiffy. These, incidentally, are just three items from your signal dealer's complete line of recognized quality accessories that include Lee tires, Champion spark plugs, Rainmaster windshield wiper blades, and Purolator oil filters. So when you see the familiar signal circle sign in yellow and black, remember, there you'll find not only the famous Go Farther gasoline and signal premium compounded motor oil, but also a complete line of fine accessories and services to help your car run better, look better, and last longer. Yes, the trial had captured the headlines and commanded the bulk of page one news since its very first day. Randolph Abbott was dead, murdered, and his only daughter Ruth was standing trial for his murder. Defending her was her father's own attorney, Joseph Herman. And now, after spending the two-hour recess lunching with his wife at a nearby restaurant, Joseph Herman has returned, and the judge has declared the court to be in session again. Are the attorneys ready to resume the case? We are, Your Honor. Uh, and will the defense resume questioning, please? The defense has no further questions, Your Honor. Your Honor... Mr. District Attorney? Your Honor, in view of the evidence which has quite recently come to the prosecution's attention... I move for dismissal of the case against Ruth Abbott. Oh, Order! Order in the court! On what grounds does the prosecution move for dismissal? Your Honor, facts have come to my knowledge from the very record of the trial, based on testimony, on record in these proceedings, which are sufficient to dismiss the case against the defendant. In light of this, I would like the assistant district attorney, Mr. Drake Douglas, to tell the court what he told me. It's in regard to the Abbott Jewel collection, Your Honor... 
only three people could have known about one piece in particular. The defendant, Ruth Abbott, will swear that on the night her father was murdered, he showed her the historic jewel he had acquired only that afternoon. At that time, he requested that she tell no one about it. Ruth told no one until she told me a few moments ago during recess. The only other person who could possibly know about the jewel is the person who killed Mr. Abbott and stole the jewels. That person has revealed himself, Your Honor. Just before the court recessed, the attorney for the defense, Mr. Joseph Herman, specifically questioned Miss Abbott about the jewel, the Anne Boleyn necklace, during direct examination. No, no, he told me about that necklace, Your Honor. Uh, order in the court. Your Honor, after Mr. Herman's question this morning, the prosecution obtained a search warrant. And during the recess, while Mr. Herman was lunching downtown, we went to his home and found the Abbott Jewel collection in his files. We submit them now in evidence. Your Honor, the state requests that you order the arrest of the attorney for the defense, Mr. Joseph Herman, for the murder of Randolph Abbott. Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at this same time. Brought to you by the Signal Oil Company, marketers of Signal gasoline and motor oil and fine quality automotive accessories. Many drivers, when buying gasoline, forget what a big part of the price goes for tax. In fact, every time a driver in the average western city buys a dollar's worth of gasoline, tax adds 33 cents to his bill. In other words, the tax you pay on three would give you a fourth gallon free. Featured in tonight's story were Bill Foreman, Ben Wright, Sarah Selby, Don Oreck, and Gene Bates. The Whistler was produced and directed by George W. Allen with story by Stephen Abbey, music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. The Whistler is entirely fictional, and all characters portrayed on The Whistler are also fictional. Any similarity of names or resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Remember at this same time next Sunday, another strange tale by The Whistler. Marvin Miller speaking for the Signal Oil Company. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. And now stay tuned for the mystery program that is unique among all mystery programs. Because even when you know who is guilty, you always receive a startling surprise at the final curtain. In the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. Signal, the famous go-farther gasoline invite you to sit back and enjoy another strange story by The Whistler. I am The Whistler, and I know many things for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now for the Signal Oil Company, the Whistler's strange story, a friendly case of blackmail. <laughs> In this world, there are two kinds of people, those who do things and those who dream about doing them. That was the philosophy of Albert Goodman. At least, that's the way he explained it to his old friend George, George Wilson. It was the night George came over to Albert's apartment to ask for some money, alone. Yes, Al, uh, a couple of thousand dollars. A couple of thousand? 
What in the world do you need that much money for, George? You never had that much money in your life. I know. I. Well, you see, I, I want to get married. Married? <laughs> Why, George, after all these years, I thought you were a confirmed bachelor like me. Well, I've just never been able to afford to before. No, 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 I suppose not. Still, George, maybe having a wife will inspire you. Thank you. Help you make something out of yourself. Start a new career, perhaps. Oh, I, I couldn't leave Shannon and Reed not after all these years. Oh, why not? You're still on the same job you were when I left there 18 years ago, aren't you? Oh, I've had some raises. Well, that's something, of course, but you haven't advanced your position. No, I'm still a bookkeeper. Well, I understand many bookkeepers are married and quite happy, but some women want a lot, you know. A car, clothes, jewels. Oh, no, no, Ethel's different. Oh, oh, I see. Well, I'm very glad to hear that. Anyway, it's your business. You do what you want to do. But the $2,000 you're asking me for, George, that's a lot of money. If you don't have it as a bachelor, I don't see how you expect to put away enough after you're married to repay me. I'm afraid I can't let you have it. Well, I, I thought... I know, I know. We've been friends for a long time. And believe me, George, I'm refusing to lend you this money as your friend. Borrowing that much money to get married on is a big mistake. But Ethel doesn't want to wait. And I... In that case, you'll just have to make the best of your present situation. Then start doing something to better yourself. It's time you did anyway. I don't exactly know what you mean. Well, I'll tell you, George. There are two kinds of people in this world. People who do things and people who only dream about doing them. Now, take us, for example. Us? Sure. Twenty years ago, we were both in the same spot. Bookkeeping for a second-rate investment company for a hundred bucks a month. We both had the same chance to get ahead. Today, I have most of the things I want. Money, position. I've earned them, George. And you? Me. I have to come to you for money to get married on. Yeah, I think I see what you mean. No, don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. All I'm saying is that you've got to set your sights high and then work like the very devil to reach your goal. Sure. Well, Al, I... I guess there's nothing more to say. Believe me, George, I'm sorry, but... Honestly, I think you'll thank me someday for not lending you this money. Maybe you're right, Al. I don't know. Maybe you're right. Well, George, your old friend Al doesn't think you're a good financial risk, does he? And in the name of friendship, he's given a very unflattering description of yourself as a person. A dreamer, he calls you. Not a doer. And you know how right he is. You're afraid right now, afraid that Ethel won't wait. That all the dreams you've dreamed will fade into ashes, just as they've always done. You have to do something, don't you, George? Especially after you talk to Ethel that evening. Well, of course I love you, George, but we have to have money to live. We want a home at least. Uh, I, I just talked with Al. Al? Oh, he's your friend with lots of money, isn't he? Say, maybe he could help us out at the start. That's what I talked to him about. Oh, did he say he'd help you? He said he'd do me the biggest favor a guy could do. Well, then what are we worrying about, honey? He didn't give me any money. Huh? Oh, well, why not? Oh, it doesn't matter. But he did do me a big favor. He gave me an idea. An idea about what to do. Yeah, what? Ethel. Do you love me? Oh, you know I do, honey. And you don't care too much where our money comes from? I mean, as long as we have plenty? Well... Enough to buy you everything you want? Oh, gee, honey. What you do is your own business. As long as you don't get into trouble. Okay. Well, Al reminded me of something today. You see, Al left Shannon and Reed about 18 years ago, and no one heard of him for several years. Al doesn't know it, but I know where he spent those years. Where was he? In prison. In prison? Why? Embezzlement. Old Mr. Shannon told me before he died. Oh, the whole thing was handled very quietly. Al replaced the money he'd taken from the firm, served his time. And since he's been out, he's been a model citizen, made good in a big way. Don't other people know about it? I doubt if anyone does. Mr. Shannon kept it pretty quiet, kept it out of the papers. And nobody in the organization knew what happened. <laughs> we all thought Al had gone east. <laughs> And now he's sitting on top of the world. That's a nice spot to be sitting in. Yeah. Most of all, Al's proud of his solid position, his good standing in the community and all. You know, I wonder just how great a value Al does put on his position in life. George, you don't mean... I mean blackmail, Ethel. Oh, let's say uh, a friendly case of blackmail. Blackmail. <laughs> 
Are you the kind of motorist who gets fun out of driving? Then just for the fun of it, here's an experiment I'd like for you to make. Try just one tankful of Signal Ethyl, the premium quality of Signal's famous Go Farther gasoline, engineered to bring out the best in any car. Yes, if you like fun, you'll get sweet satisfaction out of the prompt obedience with which Signal Ethyl makes your motor respond to the starter. If it's fun you like, it's fun you'll have when the traffic light goes green and your signal Ethel Pep makes other drivers turn green. And if it's fun you like, you'll still be having it as Ethel signals Ethel's power whisks you effortlessly down highways and up hills with the hushed purr of your motor echoing your own feelings of relaxed contentment. Yes, driving can be fun. And you'll be sure you're having all the fun your motor has to offer if you just fill up next time at a signal service station. Fill up with Signal Ethel. You're really taking Al's advice to do something, aren't you? The next day, you carefully print a note to Al on a plain piece of paper demanding $5,000. There'll be no telltale marks to identify you. Then you send Ethel down to Phoenix for the weekend with explicit instructions about how to mail it from there. Then you wait. Al will get it when he gets home Monday evening. Then the fireworks will start. After all, Joe. You're his best friend. If he talks to anyone, it'll be to you. So you sit around your drab little apartment and wait. Finally. Why, Al! Well, this is a surprise. I gotta talk to you, George. Sure, sure, come in. Thanks. Uh, sit down. Thank you. Uh, George... Do any of the old gang from Shannon and Reed live down around Phoenix? Gosh, I don't know, Al. I haven't kept track of any of them. Except you. Why, are you going down there for a vacation or something? No, no, I... I got something in the mail today. Here, take a look at this. This is strange. It's printed. Yes. Go on, read it. Good one. Understand you're doing very well for an ex-convict... If you want to keep the past dead, you'll have to pay me $5,000. If I know you, you won't want your present friends and business associates to know that you served time for embezzlement. Why, Al, that's blackmail. Yes, blackmail. Yes, blackmail. Al, surely it's not true. I'm afraid it is, George. Mr. Shannon was the right guy. He kept it very quiet. Even let me tell everyone I was going east for a few years the day the auditors caught up with me. But I really went to prison. George, if this gets out, it'll ruin me. Oh, you paid for your mistake? Yes, I know I have, but apparently I haven't paid enough. People are funny about ex-convicts. I, I just can't let this get out now, George. It would kill me. You, you're my best friend. Maybe you can help me. Huh? Well, I'll do anything I can, Al. Good. Now, I'm supposed to leave the money in small bills in a shoebox on the top of the mailbox on the corner of Franklin and Hudson tomorrow at 3 in the morning. But you're not going to do it. I tell you, George, I've got to. But I want you to be there hiding somewhere to see if you can see who picks it up. You mean you're going to try to track down who this blackmailer is? Of course. I'll pay this time, but I'm going to find out who's doing this. And when I do, well, that guy, whoever he is, will be in for plenty of trouble. Yeah. Yeah, he, he sure will. You're frightened, aren't you, George? Al was right about you, wasn't he? Inside, you're a weakling. Still, you're determined to go through with it. And Al's making it easier for you, isn't he? He wants you to watch the blackmailer's pickup. That will make everything much simpler. And the following morning at a quarter of three, you're standing in the shadows across the street from the mailbox. The street is deserted, silent. Soon, Al walks past you, nodding silently. 
Then he crosses the street, places the shoebox on top of the mailbox, and goes on. A minute before three, the lights of a car swing into the street. Ethel's right on time. As she pulls to a quick stop, rush across the street, pick up the shoebox and toss it into the open car window. Then Ethel steps on the gas. She's out of sight in ten seconds. Everything perfect. You slip out of the shadows and head for your rendezvous with Al. Halfway down the block, you pass an alley and... George! <gasps> Al! Oh, I... I thought you'd be down the next corner. I doubled back and hid here in the alley. Did you, uh... Did you see anything? Oh, just the car pulling away and turning up the side street. I couldn't see what kind it was. Could you? Well, just it was a sedan, about a, I think, a 46. But I did get part of the license. 6I42. I oh, had something, Al. And you can check up on that tomorrow at the Department of Motor Vehicles. Yes, I will. And the man, did you see him? No. I guess that's why they wanted to put on top of the mailbox. They just slowed up and scooped it in. They? They were more than one? Well, I, I think so. I'm not, I'm not sure. Gee, I'm sorry, Al. I... I guess I wasn't much help. Oh, that's, that's okay. We got part of a license number. I think you were more help than you realize. What did Al mean by that, George? The pickup went all right, didn't it? He couldn't have seen you go over and toss Ethel the shoebox, could he? Well, it's done now. And you're sure that phony license number you told him about will take Al off on a wild goose chase for a while. He's checking it himself. And you're jittery the next day as you wait for him to get back from the license bureau with the news. And finally, when he comes... Well, wh what'd you find out, Al? One thing that you slipped up, George. I... I slipped... slipped up? Yes. You see, there are no licenses in this state that use the letter I. 6I42, you said, wasn't it? And it's a wrong number. Oh, well, I... I, I oh, yeah, sure, sure, I know. You just made a mistake. It was dark, the car was moving, everybody can make a mistake like that. Yeah. It's too bad, though, that license number was our only clue. Gee, I'm sorry, Al. Well, it, it looks like we're up a blind alley. Oh, no. No, I've got a couple of ideas. I'm going to Phoenix for the weekend. Phoenix, George. You wonder if Ethel could have left a clue behind her. If anyone saw her in Phoenix who could connect her with you. But all you can do is wait over the long weekend. On Monday, Al is back. But you don't hear from him all day. By nighttime, you're jittery. And when Ethel stops by and wants you to take her out, you tell her you have to wait for Al's phone call. Both of you wait nervously until it comes. Uh oh. I think this is it. Hello? George? Oh, yes, Al. Uh, any luck? Yes, a little. I checked all the hotels and tourist camps for people from Los Angeles who were in Phoenix the day the blackmail letter was mailed. Yeah? And I found one. Oh? A girl named Ethel Martin lives on Orange Drive. I'm just going over there now to look her up. Oh. Oh, I see. Well, uh, <laughs> good luck. Yeah. Well, I'll let you know what I find. Goodbye. Yeah. G goodbye. George. George, what's the matter? You. He found out you were in Phoenix. What? Oh, we got to get out of town. I guess you're right. Well, with that 5000 we got from Al... That $5,000 won't go very far. But that's all there is. We can get more. The same way you got the 5000 Only this time, we'll get a big stake and clear out. Oh, no, honey, it's too risky. Al's too close already. Not if he doesn't find me. Why, it's even riskier not to send another letter, especially since you asked him to lend you money. He's got to get another letter or he'll figure the back blackmailer was, was just somebody that knew him and, and needed a few thousand. And that's you, George. Golly, maybe you're right. I never thought about that. Yeah, this time we'll ask for 25,000. I don't know just how we'll do it, but I'll figure something out. Well, George. You're finding out something that Al didn't know. That weakness can make people do things, too. You're frightened, but you can't turn back. Next day, you try to figure a smart way to send the next letter. And you get the idea when you go up to meet Ethel for lunch. She works in a big office. And just outside the door, you find the cleaning man has left the trash basket to be picked up. Right on top, George, staring you in the face is an open envelope postmarked 
San Francisco. It's just what you need, isn't it, George? You reach down and pick it up. Oh, oh pardon me. Oh, nearly knocked you over. That's all right. I, I shouldn't have been standing in front of the door. Looking for something? No, no. I, uh, I, I, I just wanted to write a note. I, I was just picking up a piece of waste paper. I see. Well, I guess nobody will miss a piece of waste paper. No, no, I, I, I guess not. Still a weakling, aren't you, George? Frightened because a man sees you take that envelope out of the trash barrel. And he'll probably forget it in a matter of minutes. But everything frightens you now, doesn't it? That afternoon, you take some ink remover and carefully remove the address from the back of the envelope and the return address from the back. Then you print Al's name and address carefully, slip a new blackmail note into it, and place it securely in your pocket. You'll take no more chances with Ethel. This job you'll do yourself. Early that evening, you walk to Al's apartment, and after making sure there's no one in sight, you hastily slip it into his mailbox and return quickly to your apartment, certain you'll hear from Al as quickly as he finds the letter. Al, what's up? Why all the noise? George, it's, it's another blackmail note. Look. Oh, look. Well, I'll be. This time they want 25000 Pick up in the same place Friday night. That gives me three days to raise the money. Well, are you going to pay it? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Also gives me three days to track down the blackmailer. Yeah. A any ideas? Yeah. This envelope's postmarked San Francisco, but that doesn't mean anything. Oh, no. Why not? Because this wasn't delivered by mail. I picked up all of my mail when I got home this evening, then I went out to have dinner, and while I was gone, somebody slipped this in my box. Oh, what, uh, what makes you think so? There's no special delivery stamp on it. This envelope's been used before. Oh, no. How do you know that? The original address was removed with ink remover. You can see the yellow stain, you see? Uh -huh. Now, watch while I hold it in front of the light. You see those pin scratches? Yeah, but you can't tell what they are. No, the new address written over has obscured them. But you can make out something of the name, you see? It's Rap... Rap... Rafferty. Yeah, that's it, you see? Rafferty. Rafferty. You can make out part of the return address, too. San Francisco 14. Yeah, I think... Uh, I think maybe you're right. Uh, no, I've got something. Rafferty, San Francisco 14. I'll go up there tomorrow, and if I can find out who that letter was written to down here, then I may have the trail. And believe me, George, if I find this guy... He'll wish he'd never started this. You already wish you hadn't started it, don't you, George? And all the time Albert is in San Francisco, you're jittery. Even though you tell yourself that no matter what he finds out, he can't connect his findings with you. But as one day passes and then another, your fears grow. Finally, the next day, you can stand it no longer. You decide to leave town immediately. Hurry to Ethel's office, and you walk in the door. Oh, hello, darling. How nice. Just in time to take me to lunch. Hey, uh, come on, hurry. What? George. George, what's the matter? That man, that man in your office in the brown top coat, that was Al. Al? You mean... Yes. What's he doing here? I don't know. He came in a few minutes ago. I thought he was still in San Francisco. Who was that other man, the one he was talking? The man he asked for, or Jim, Jim Rafferty. Jim Rafferty? Yes. Oh, what's the matter, George? That, that man Rafferty. He's the one who saw me pick up the envelope in the trash barrel, the one I put the blackmail letter in. It was his envelope. Come on, honey, we've got to get out of here fast. Well, George, Al was a much better detective than you even suspected, wasn't he? It's all quite clear, isn't it? Just returned from San Francisco. And while he was there, he found the Rafferty family. Then learned that the envelope you'd found in the trash barrel had been sent to Jim Rafferty, employed in the same office with Ethel. Now it's a race to get away. You're certain he's on your trail. You and Ethel, hurry out of the office. No time to wait for the elevator. Take the stairs, race down. But not fast enough. Just as you get to the bottom hall, the elevator door opens and out steps Al. Well, hello, George. Oh, oh Al. Oh, hello. I uh, <laughs> I didn't expect to see you here. No, and I didn't expect to see you either. 
Shannon and Reed haven't moved to this building, have they? Oh, no, 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 no. I, I, I just came over... To, uh, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't introduce you. This is my fiance, Miss uh, Smith. Happy to know you, Miss Smith. Uh, you remember Al, honey. I've talked so much about him. Oh, yes, yes, of course. How do you do? George, I want to talk to you. Suppose we could make a dinner tonight at my place, just like old times? Gee, I, I, I'm sorry, Al. This I... is important, George. Well... And I'm sure that Miss Smith won't mind one night. Oh, no, no, of course not. Good. Then six at my place, George. Just the two of us. Well, George, you have to face him, don't you? Flight now would mean confession. And wherever you went, especially with Ethel, you'd be found. So at six o'clock, you're at Al's apartment. Al is jovial, friendly as you eat dinner. You just play along with him, watching for anything, waiting, afraid, just as he said you were. Then after dinner, he fixes two drinks and places them on the table, one at your place and one at his. This is it. Your drink is poisoned, you're sure of that. You can tell by the careful way he mixed them behind your back, the way he sets them down carefully, not spilling anything. So you have to act fast. Oh, say, Al, I forgot my cigarettes. Uh, do you have any? Uh, sure, of course, I'll get you one. Okay. He turns his back for a minute to get the cigarettes. With one quick movement, you switch the two drinks. Then he's back. Ah, there you are. Oh, thanks. Now, how about a toast, George? Sure. To friendship. There's very little of it left these days. Yeah, I'll drink to friendship. <laughs> yes, there are very few friendships like ours, George. That's why I wanted you here tonight. You see, George, one of those drinks we just had was poisoned. Yes, I know that, Al. You know? I'm not as stupid as you think. I know that you found out I was blackmailing you. And I knew you'd planned to kill me. It was the only way you could keep your past covered up. If you'd had me arrested, everything would have come out. But I fooled you, Al. I fooled you. Because while you got the cigarettes, I switched the drinks. No. No, George. Yes. Yes, Al. That's right. Turn white. Now it's your turn to be afraid. Go on, Al. You said you were different. A strong man, a doer. All right. Now let's see how strong you are. <laughs> To be sure that the automobile battery you buy today will last a long while, you want to be sure you're choosing a good one. And you can be sure if you choose a Signal Deluxe, the battery which embodies what has been called the greatest battery improvement in 20 years. I'm talking about Signal's microporous all-rubber separators. Because they hold twice as much acid solution between the plates, Signal Deluxe batteries deliver up to 35% more power. Plenty for extra quick starting plus the many electrical gadgets on today's cars. As a result, these super-powered batteries stand up so well, Signal guarantees them a full 30 months on a service basis. That's up to two and one-half times as long as many ordinary batteries, which means that all the while you're enjoying its dependable, trouble-free performance, a Signal Deluxe battery is actually costing less per month, less than you think, because your Signal dealer will not only trade in your old battery, but has liberal credit terms available. So when you need a new battery, play safe. Get a good one. Get a Signal Deluxe battery at a Signal service station. So, George, you've outwitted Al at last. You didn't get the 25,000, but you're certain you'll be free. And no one will ever know about your blackmailing your friend. Al is pale, trembling. You're sure he'll be dead in a very few minutes. He can't even phone a doctor, can he, George? Not while you're there to prevent it. You smile at his first words. George. George, you don't know what you've done. I think I do. I've simply outsmarted you. You told me how you were the kind who did things, that I was the kind who just dreamed... Well, this time I've switched things on you, literally. On yourself, George. What do you mean? I mean you'll be dead in a few minutes. 
I? Yes. I didn't intend to kill you. It was my drink that was poisoned. Your drink? Yes. I told you I was the kind who did things. Well, I simply followed out my own philosophy. I've spent too many years building myself to lose everything, so I decided to end things deliberately. Rather than have my life ruined by a blackmailer, a blackmailer I couldn't trace. But you couldn't trace? That's right. That man Rafferty was my last chance, and when he told me how the trash barrel was accessible to anyone, that he'd seen a man pick an envelope out of it but didn't remember what he looked like, I figured my situation was hopeless. There wasn't any use going on. You mean you, you, you didn't know about me? I didn't even suspect you. But you've settled a score for me. You've brought on your own punishment. Al, Al, look, do something. Oh, it's too late, George, much too late. No one in the world can help you. And the funny part of it is I was doing everything for you. You were getting the big favor you asked. I, I don't get it. I... I knew you were a weakling, George, that you'd never do anything on your own, but I liked you in spite of your weakness. So when I decided to take my life, I wrote out a will. A will leaving everything I have to you. That whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at this same time. This month throughout America, churchmen of all faiths are calling special attention to the part religion plays in building and preserving our American way of life. Religion is one of the freedoms our forefathers fought for, one which today more than ever needs not only our protection, but our active support. <laughs> Featured in tonight's story were Bill Foreman, Joseph Kearns, Joe Gilbert, and William Conrad. The Whistler was produced and directed by George W. Allen, with story by John Everett, music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. The Whistler is entirely fictional, and all characters portrayed on The Whistler are also fictional. Any similarity of names or resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Remember at this same time next Sunday, another strange tale by The Whistler. Marvin Miller speaking for the Signal Oil Company. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. And now stay tuned for the program that is rated tops in popularity for a longer period of time than any other West Coast program in radio history. The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. famous Go Farther Gasoline invites you to sit back and enjoy another strange story by The Whistler. I am The Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now for the Signal Oil Company, The Whistler's Strange Story. You can't trust a stranger. <laughs> As you walk down the crowded corridor from the district attorney's office, you can feel the stares and hear the whispers. There's Frank Malloy. He's getting out, but not for long. It's costing you $10,000 to walk out that front door, but it's worth it, isn't it, Frank? 
Because you have a plan, at least part of one. Yes. You reach the front entrance, push open the heavy door, and go out into the street. There at the curb, you recognize the long yellow convertible and the attractive blonde sitting inside. She slides over as you slip in behind the wheel. In again, out again. Yeah. How was jail this time? Lay off, Vivian. From what I read in the papers, they're going to put you away for a long, long time after the small formality of a trial. Well, don't believe everything you read. I'm not going on trial. You are? No. I'm going to be around long enough to give them a chance. You're going to jump bail. That's exactly what I'm going to do. You'll lose your $10,000 bond. Doesn't matter. I've got plenty, and it's put away where I can get at it in a hurry. Where will you go? We. We're going together, baby. I'm ready, Frank. I don't know how or where we're going, but we're getting out of the States. We can beat it to Havana and then maybe South America. I'll get a divorce and we're all set. We've got enough money to last us the rest of our lives. That sounds wonderful, but how do you expect to get away? The moment they miss you, they'll be watching for you everywhere. Yeah, I know. The DA wants to see me in a couple of days. So whatever we're going to do, we're going to have to move fast. Well, we, we can't just take a plane or a train. Before we start running, Frank, we, we have to think of something, some kind of plan. Yeah, I know. What about a private plane and pilot? Let's find out about it right away. No. There's something else I've got to find out first. What do you mean? I'm going out to the ranch. I'm going to see my wife. You're going out to see Martha? That's right. Why? Vivian, didn't you ever wonder how the district attorney got hold of all my records and books that I kept? Do you think I sent them to him? Do you think I wanted the smoothest gambling syndicate in the state to come crashing down around my neck? somebody else did. It had to be somebody I trusted, somebody close to me. I want to be sure it wasn't Martha. But, Frank, don't you... And they have enough on me to put me away for 20 years. I want to know where they got it. Oh, Frank, what difference does it make now? All that matters now is getting away. We'll get away, baby. Don't worry. But first, I want to see Martha. I just want to know. As you drive through the city and across the Bay Bridge, your thoughts dwell upon your wife, Martha, don't they, Frank? You begin to think back, wondering just how much Martha knew about you and your organization. Wondering if she knew about Vivian or any of the others. Wondering if it could have been Martha who brought everything crashing down, sending you to jail. And there are other things to be thought of. How will you manage to get out of the country before the district attorney knows you're gone? chartered plane and a private pilot might work. And you do have friends in Florida who would help you and Vivian get out of the country. After an hour of driving and thinking, you're suddenly startled as Vivian pulls violently at your arm. Frank, look out! Did I hit him? I, I don't know. He's lying by the side of the highway. I didn't see him in time. What was he doing out in the middle of the highway? Look, look, he's getting up. Come on, we better have a look at him. Come on. He is getting up. Yeah. Doesn't look like he's hurt too badly. Hey, hey, you all right? I, I don't know. I think so. What were you doing out in the middle of the highway? I was trying to catch a ride. Uh, but does a anything feel broken? No. No, I, I don't think so. I saw you coming right at me, and I dove for the side of the road. You didn't hit me. Oh, that's a relief. <laughs> Looks like my trousers are finished. You, you're sure you're all right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Forget it. It's my own fault for standing in the middle of the highway. Uh, what's your name? My name? Yeah. Chuck, why? <laughs> well, Chuck, I feel kind of bad about this. I think the least I can do is offer you a ride. Do something about those trousers, too. Forget it, forget it. It's my fault. Well, we can't leave you standing here. We're going another ten miles. Okay. Let me get my hat out of the ditch. Frank, do you have to give him a lift? He admits it was his fault. Let's get out of here. Didn't you notice something, Vivian? Something real interesting about that fellow? What? what are you talking about? Look, he's just turned around. Look at him. Now look at me. Notice anything? Frank. See it? Looks a lot like me, huh? Yeah. Same size, build, even his features. Yeah, if I worked it out right, I could get away with it. Get away with what? Just think, Vivian. How much easier it would be for us to get away. 
if everybody thought that I was dead. If you really want to protect the money invested in your car, then the motor oil for you is Signal's amazing new heavy-duty oil that reduces engine wear 50%. Signal Premium, heavy-duty Signal Premium. Now there's the oil that really protects your car. This proved and improved heavy-duty Signal oil does more, much more, than just lubricate. In addition, Signal Premium motor oil cools, cleans, cushions, seals, and protects. Result? Tests under all types of driving conditions prove new Signal Premium motor oil reduces engine wear 50%. Your engine keeps its like new pep and power twice as long. So if you're still using lazy, old-fashioned oil that merely lubricates, it's high time to make a change for the better. Change oil next time at a Signal service station. Change to new, harder-working Signal Premium motor oil that reduces engine wear 50%. Signal, signal, signal gasoline. Your car will go far, will go for the gasoline. Almost every piece of the plan seems to fit together, doesn't it, Frank? If the police thought you were dead, you and Vivian could take your time about getting out of the country. You could go knowing they weren't watching for you. You study the man whom you almost hit on the highway, and already you're planning the last few hours of his life. I'd be real nice to him, Vivian, and get him to talk about himself. We have to find out as much about him as we can. You just leave it to me, Frank. Okay. All set, Chuck? Yeah. Let's go then, huh? Buggy. Yeah. Always promised myself I'd have one of these someday. <laughs> Look at me. I don't even have bus fare. My clothes are dirty and wrinkled, and I need a shave. <laughs> I look like a tramp. I don't blame people for passing me by. Where were you headed, Chuck? Los Angeles, I guess. They tell me the nights are balmy down there. It makes a difference when you sleep in parked cars. But well, don't you have any friends in Los Angeles? I don't have any friends anywhere. Well, that's a pretty broad statement, Chuck. Must have friends somewhere. Maybe uh, back home, huh? I wouldn't know. I haven't been home in a long time. Been everywhere else. Australia, Africa, Brazil. Been working on freighters. Just got back to the States last week. Just last week, huh? Right. Been gone nearly five years. Oh, where is your home? I come from a place called Hyannis. Ever hear it? It's in Massachusetts, Cape Cod. No, never heard of it. It's a fishing village. Oh. Still, it doesn't seem possible that a man doesn't have any friends. Oh, you must have a girlfriend. Hmm? Yeah, yeah. Had a girl once in Hyannis. Her name was Mamie. Mamie? Mm. It was a long time ago when I was young and foolish. Whatever happened to Mamie? I wouldn't know. I wrote her for a while, but... When I didn't get any answer to my letters, I just forgot about Mamie. Say, Chuck, tell me, what kind of work do you do? I'm one of those guys who can do anything until you pin me down, and then it turns out I can't do much of anything. Well, I'm sure you'll fit in somewhere, someday. Just haven't run into it yet. Maybe. In the meantime, I like drifting around the world. I'll talk too much. I don't get the chance to talk to people very often, especially about myself. Everybody likes to talk about themselves. What are you going to do when you get back to L.A.? Look for work, I guess. I'm broke. Well, if you really want a job, Chuck, maybe I can do something for you. What, uh, what do you mean? Well, do you have a ten bar? No. Well, I own a string of bars throughout the valley. If you're willing to learn, maybe I can put you to work as a bartender. Me, a bartender? <laughs> uh, a guy's on his feet a lot in that kind of work. You can make good money. Yeah, yeah, I can believe that. But uh, tell me something. 
Why all the interest in me? Well, we might have run over you, maybe killed you. I think the least Frank can do is try and help you out a little. Do you, uh, do you think I could learn to tend bar? Oh, I'm sure you could, Chuck. It's an interesting proposition, Mr. Uh... Malloy. Just call me Frank. I'm Vivian, Chuck. Hi. <laughs> How do you like that? Yesterday, I was bumming around. Today, I'm going to be a bartender. Who knows what'll happen tomorrow? You know, don't you, Frank? You know exactly what's in store for Chuck tomorrow. As a matter of fact, you wonder if he'll even be alive tomorrow. Because now you're certain that he will do fine as a part of your plan. No one knows about him. No one even knows where he is. No one would miss him if he disappeared. He assured you of that. As you turn off the main highway toward your small ranch, you already have the first stages of the plan ready. You stop the car at the gate. I have to take care of some business here, Chuck. You go with Vivian. She'll put you up for the afternoon. Whatever you say, boss. Take him to my apartment, huh? Here's his key. I'll call you. When? As soon as I've made the arrangements we were talking about. Will they take long? No. Everything will be taken care of by tonight. Tonight? Yeah. And take good care of Chuck, huh? Make him feel at home. Now, well, we'll be at your place. You call me. I'll call you. Well, I'll see you later tonight, Chuck. Sure thing, Mr. Malloy. Bye, baby. Bye. You watch them disappear down the road, Frank, and then you turn toward the house. Everything seems peaceful and undisturbed, and you realize how long it has been since you've come out to the ranch. As you reach the steps and put your hand to the door knocker, you wonder if Martha will be surprised to see you. Hello, Frank. Hello, Martha. I, uh, I've come to see you. Come in. You don't seem surprised to see me. I'm not. You were expecting me? Yes. Then you knew I was out of jail. Sit down, Frank. Would you like a cup of coffee? No, nothing, except... Martha, I think you know who turned me into the district attorney. Who was it? Why, I did. I did what I thought was right. You must have known, Frank. I always trusted you. You were the one person I thought I didn't have to worry about. That's it exactly, Frank. You never worried about me. I don't think you even thought about me. There was a time when I was the most important thing in the world to you. So you fix it, they'll send me to prison. You belong in prison. You become nothing more than a, a gangster, a hoodlum. You're not the man I married 15 years ago. Little by little, I watched you change. You began to make money, lots of money. And along with your money, you gained power. The more you got, the more you wanted. And anything you couldn't have, you destroyed... What did you expect to do? Own everything and everyone someday? But to turn me in I like that, I... had to stop you for your own sake, and I did it the only way I knew how. I cried for months because I knew the only way to stop you was to... was to call the district attorney. I did what I thought was right. <laughs> now you know, Frank. You know who betrayed you and why it was done. You begin to pace around the room, walking faster and faster, bumping into things and knocking them over. And suddenly you stop in front of the mantel. You see the clock and the feeling of rage subside. You realize that by nine o'clock tonight, things will be all right. And Martha, conscientious Martha, will have a strange punishment, won't she, Frank? She'll always believe she sent you to your death. After a long silence, Martha throws a shawl over her shoulders and walks outside. Vivian, everything all right? Yes, I've been listening to the story of Chuck's life. 
Seems his girlfriend, Mamie, was quite a gal. Now our bartender's in the other room practicing with your liquor. Good. Now listen, Vivian. Get one of my suits out of the closet and give it to Chuck. Have him shower and shave and put the suit on. We're, uh, going to a party. I understand. Tell him you're meeting me at one of my places up at the lake. Leave my apartment by 8.30 and drive up on Skyline Drive to Mountain View Club. Now don't stop anywhere. When you get there, wait in the parking lot and back. Be there by 9 o'clock. Clear? Clear and simple. What exactly are you planning, Frank? Like I said, a party. I see. Good. Are you sure you've got it all? We'll see you at the party at 9. At 9. What are you doing out here, Martha? Listening to the crickets. It's a nice night. Yeah. I used to go riding on nights like this. You remember that? Of course. I'm surprised, Frank. Are you? Well, here's another surprise for you, Martha. I'm not going to do anything about the fact that you turned against me. Oh? Matter of fact, when I leave here, I'm going for a little ride. One we often used to take together. Along Skyline Drive. Frank. What have you got on your mind? Just you, Martha. I'll be thinking of you. I'll get my coat, Frank. Oh, no, no, Martha. Wouldn't be right for you to go anywhere with a... With a hoodlum, a criminal. Frank. Goodbye, Martha. Remember. I'll be thinking of you. The expression on her face, in her eyes, delights you, doesn't it, Frank? Martha is still in love with you after all this time. And later, when your plan goes through, she'll have something to think about, won't she? Something that will be her punishment. Yes, Martha, conscientious as she is, will feel deeply when Chuck's body is finally found in your car, wearing your clothes at the bottom of the lake. Martha will always believe you killed yourself because... She turned you into the district attorney. And above all, she'll testify that you were heading for the Skyline Drive. That part will help eliminate the identification problem. High up on Skyline Drive, you pull into the parking lot of the darkened club, where you agreed to meet Vivian. A few minutes later, the headlights of her car come into view. Right on time. What? Oh, oh, hi, Mr. Malloy. Didn't know you were here yet. Say, thanks for the suit. How do I look? Just fine, Chuck. Are we on time for the party, Frank? Oh, right on time. Oh, say, Chuck, would you give me a hand with some stuff in my car? It's right over here. Sure, sure. Vivian said we were going to a party. Is it in that place up there? No, not there. I didn't think so. Joint looks closed down. It's sure dark out here. What are we going to... Chuck, this! Yeah. But he's almost over for you, Chuck. What happened? I hit him. It'll be oh. easier to handle this way. Pull that door open so I can put him in the car. Right. What are we going to do now? We stay here about five minutes and then drive up the highway about one mile. The road makes that sharp bend around the lake. Yeah, I know where it I'll is. I'll be waiting. I'll be waiting there off the highway. Blink your lights as you approach and I'll come out and wave you down. Yeah, there. I thought you were going to bring Martha with you. No. I've taken care of Martha. Another way. You drive out of the parking lot, and in a few minutes you reach the sharp curve in the highway, pull over and stop where the edge drops off into the deep end of the lake. Then it only takes seconds to drag Chuck's body to the front seat behind the wheel. Carefully, you go through his pockets and remove everything. Then plant your belongings in his pockets. You put your ring and watch on him. Then everything is ready. You push the clutch in, put the car in gear, and as you jump back away from the car, it jerks forward and over the ledge. To disappear in the deep black water of the lake. Is 
it all over? See for yourself. By the time they pull the car out of the water, it'll look like Frank Malloy was drowned when his car skidded off the road and crashed into the lake. Let's hope so. It'll be weeks before they find the body, and the water will make positive identification pretty difficult. But they'll find enough there to think it's me. <laughs> and Martha will help, too. Yeah, all we have to do is hide out until he's found. We'll be free, Viv. Where do we go now? Well, first we have to stop at a couple of places down in the valley and pick up the money I put away. <laughs> well, that's a must. Then we'll drive on to Los Angeles where we can hide out. Then we'll see. Whatever you say, Frank. Now let's get out of here. <laughs> you know, it's funny how Martha tried to send me to jail. When she recognizes my clothes, her story, more than anything, will help to set me free. Throughout the western states, from Canada to Mexico, one gasoline is famous as the go-farther gasoline. It's Signal Gasoline. Now, naturally, we're mighty proud of Signal's good mileage, which has built that reputation. But equally important to you as a motorist is the way Signal gives you such good mileage. You see, today's Signal helps your engine run so efficiently, you save gasoline three ways. One, you save gasoline with Signal's quick starting. Two, you save gasoline with Signal's smooth, obedient pickup, free from balking and hesitation. Three, you save gasoline with Signal's lively power that gets you into high gear fast, helps you stay there with a minimum of shifting on hills or in traffic. So you see, considering the number of times a day you start your car, accelerate, and shift gears, even a little gasoline saved each time soon adds up to a big saving. So there in a nutshell, friends, is why motorists call Signal the go-farther gasoline. Why not treat your car to a tank full tomorrow and go farther with Signal? Signal, Signal, Signal gasoline. Your car will go farther, go farther gasoline. One morning, two months later, you open your eyes in a hotel just outside the city of Los Angeles, don't you, Frank? Yes, you've been here two months, waiting for someone to find the body of Chuck and identify him as you, the missing Frank Malloy. And last night's paper carried the story you've been waiting for, the story of your death. Now it'll be safe to change your name and leave the country with Vivian. Everything has gone perfectly, hasn't it, Frank? You stretch out on the bed and your hand drops down to touch the small handbag you've kept beside you. The bag containing over a hundred thousand dollars. Suddenly you sit up, realizing the bag is gone. You get up and search the room frantically, but the money isn't there. Operator. Operator! Oh. Yes, sir? Would you connect me with room 303, Miss Vivian Smith, and hurry? Uh, yes, sir. Well, I'm sorry, sir, but Miss Smith checked out of the hotel about an hour ago. What? Did she leave a message? Nothing, sir. Did anything else, sir? No. Nothing. Who's there? Vivian. Vivian. Vivian, the, the bag with the... That's what you're looking for? Who are you? He's from the police department, Doc. The police? Yes, he picked me up at the airport. After reading the story in the paper last night, I thought it was safe enough now to leave, only it wasn't. She was taking your money and running out on you, Malloy. And why not? It would only be a matter of time before I meant no more to him than Martha. Shut up, Vivian. It doesn't matter now, Frank. Sure it doesn't. You see, the newspaper story was just to get you out in the open. Some fishermen did find a body in the lake, but after all this time, it was a little hard to identify. He was wearing your clothes, Malloy, and was in your car. Your wife thought it was you. But I don't see how that I'll could... I'll tell you something, though. At the morgue, we found out different. 
You see, Malloy, it wasn't hard to figure out what you'd done when we found a tattoo on the drowned man's chest. Yeah, the tattoo of a heart with the words Chuck and Mamie. Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at this same time. Meantime, Signal Oil Company and the friendly independent dealers who help you go farther with Signal Gasoline hope you'll remember, regardless of what gasoline you use, you'll enjoy more miles of happy driving if you drive at sensible speeds, obey traffic regulations, and avoid taking chances. When you take a chance to save a moment, You take a chance on that moment's being your last. Featured in tonight's story were Bill Foreman as the Whistler, Gerald Moore, Betty Lou Gerson, Shepard Menken, and Charlotte Lawrence. The Whistler was produced and directed by George W. Allen, with story by Gus Bays, music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. The Whistler was entirely fictional, and all characters portrayed on The Whistler are also fictional. Any similarity of names or resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Remember to tune in at this same time next Sunday, when the Signal Oil Company will bring you another strange story by The Whistler. Marvin Miller speaking for the Signal Oil Company. now for Horatio Hornblower, which follows immediately over most of these stations. This is the CBS Radio Network. Tune in to nostalgia. Tune in to now. Golden Radio Hour.